Uh, well, good morning, councillors. Welcome back. Um, I declare the meeting reopened. Are there any apologies? Councillor Landers. Mr Chair, I advise that Councillor McLaughlin, Councillor Marks and Councillor Hammond will be absent today and I move that they be granted a leave of absence from the meeting. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton that Councillors McLaughlin, Marks and Hammond be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillor Cassidy. Oh, thanks, Chair. I move that Councillor Cook be granted a leave of absence for today's meeting. Second. Moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Strunk, that Councillor Cook be granted a leave of absence from today's meeting. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, we are currently in program number two, and we will continue to debate on infrastructure for Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Landers. Chair, I rise to speak about this program and what it will deliver for my ward. Uh, beginning with service 2.1.2.2, local ac access network improvements, I welcome upgrades along Lacey Road near Macaranga Crescent and Park. The eastern side of Lacey Road at Castledine has seen some significant uh, housing development over recent years and there is also a dog or fleece area on this side of the road that is very well loved. On the western side of Lacey Road is a local park and substantial housing so residents on both sides of Lacey Road require access to each side. Lacey Road is actually quite a wide road with a speed limit of 70 kilometres. So Chair, I welcome the funding to improve the local access improvements for pedestrians. Funding will, will progress detailed design investigations, community consultation and construction in the 2022-23 financial year, all aimed at pedestrian crossing improvements to improve access, connectivity and safety for local residents walking to and from local bus stops, parks, dog parks and homes. Can I say, Chair, I really appreciate Councillor Wine's efforts in making my ward safer under safer schools and better roads for Brisbane, as well as um, uh, the Norris Road upgrade that is currently taking place at Pritchard Place outside Norris Road State School. Uh, these, these works are progressing and Pritchard Place um, is not only an access to the school, but also to the Brackenridge TAFE College. So, um, during those drop-off and pick-up times, it is a very, very busy intersection. So uh, this is a much welcomed upgrade with intelligent pedestrian lights and improvements to the bus drop-off zone at the school. I also uh, would just like to mention I'm very um, excited about one of my road network resurfacing projects in particular. There is 14 of them, but I'm particularly excited about the Gympie Road at Bald Hills uh, resurfacing. This is between Anna Street uh, to, the Bald, uh, to Bald Hills, and this will include um, the roundabout at the Bonnie View Hotel and uh, the southern approaches to that roundabout. So I know my community is very much looking forward to that this year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Landers. And is there further debate? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to speak on uh, this particular program, um, which is all about making sure we deliver the infrastructure our city needs uh, as it grows. Now, we know that uh, Brisbane is the fastest growing capital city in Australia, at the heart of the fastest growing region in Australia. And it's interesting when you think about how different parts of our city, like Rochdale and Pallara and a number of other greenfield areas have been expanding. Um, and we continue to invest in those areas. And one of the things that sticks out to me about this particular program is that the vast majority, more than 80% of our investment in infrastructure is out in the suburbs of Brisbane. That's right. It's in the suburbs. Uh, and councillors would be aware that this time, um, for the first time ever, we've had a guarantee that we've made to the people of Brisbane that ensures that at least 80% of our investment across the entire council budget goes into the suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, and we see where the growth is happening, 
and that's exactly where we're targeting infrastructure and upgrades. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't hold some kind of ideological view like some others in this place that roads are evil and that cars are evil. Uh, I would simply say buses use roads too. That's right. so buses cool. use roads too. Cyclists and pedestrians use ro roads too. People with a disability use roads and have to cross roads too. And this simplistic view that you shouldn't upgrade roads or waste money on improving roads uh, is just plain wrong. It is just plain wrong. Uh, I mentioned yesterday that over this four-year term, we're investing around $2 billion in public and active transport in a four-year term, $2 billion. Uh, so that is definitely a massive priority, the number one priority for this administration. But we will not neglect, we will not overlook investment in our road and infrastructure network either, because it is critical to the people of Brisbane. Now, uh, it would be easy for some people to think that, uh, for example, in the recent federal election, we saw three federal electorates um, won by the Greens, and that suddenly three federal electorates worth of people don't want to drive cars anymore, don't use the road network, and suddenly all want to catch buses or ride bicycles. Uh, we know that is simply not the case, uh, and we will continue to invest in improving our road network. And whether it's the Mogul Road corridor, um, which will be of great benefit to the people of the western suburbs and specifically the Ryan federal electorate, uh, we will continue to pursue upgrades right across the suburbs of Brisbane. I want to pay tribute to the former federal government for allocating a lot of funding towards important infrastructure and road upgrades in our city. And whether it was contribution to the Mogul Road corridor or a number of projects right across the city, uh, such as the Newnham and Wecker Road intersection, which is currently underway, the Rochdale and Priestdale Road upgrade, which is currently underway. Uh, there are projects that have happened right across the city that have been done with the support of the federal government. Now, I certainly hope, and I've mentioned this before in the chamber, that we continue to get that support from the new federal government, because it would be a mistake of them not to realise that targeted investment in the fastest growing capital city in Australia, if they didn't realise that that was important, that would be a big mistake. And so we stand ready to work cooperatively with the new federal government, just like we have with the previous federal government, to invest in infrastructure. Uh, one thing I'm particularly excited about, though, and Councillor Huang would be also sharing my excitement, is the investment in the growing area of Rochdale. Uh, now, we know that uh, not only is there the Priestdale and Rochdale Road intersection upgrade um, underway, we know that not only is much of the traffic in that area coming from outside of Brisbane, um, from the surrounding council areas of Logan and even Redlands, uh, but that the suburb itself is one of the fastest growing parts of the city. Now, you can't get more suburban than Rochdale. It is literally on the boundary of the city of Brisbane. Uh, this is not some kind of inner city area or inner city project. This is genuine suburban investment in a suburb that is growing really rapidly. Just like we're investing in Pallara with a whole range of new infrastructure and park facilities and the local councillor has been working hard to try and get bus services against a lot of game playing and opposition from the state government, uh, we will continue to invest in Rochdale and other growing parts of the city. And one way we're doing that is uh, the new Gardner Road extension, which uh, have, we've allocated funding for in this particular budget, and we'll be gearing up over the coming years to make sure that is delivered. That fits in nicely with the investment that's being made when it comes to the uh, Metro in Rochdale and the Metro Depot, which is very nearby. It also fits in nicely with the uh, uh, major school activity that's happening in the area as well. And within a short period of uh, or within a short distance of that location, there's about four or five very busy growing schools. And so intersection upgrades, new road and infrastructure investment, the metro investment, um, we're targeting it to the suburbs of Brisbane and those rapidly growing areas. And so this, this particular program is critical as the city grows. Uh, and it is important not only when it comes to motor, private motor vehicle use, it is important for public transport. It is important for active transport. 
And we make sure that whenever we upgrade infrastructure, if it's a road upgrade, we also upgrade facilities for pedestrians, we also upgrade facilities for cyclists, uh, and we also make sure it is safer for everyone. Uh, and if you don't like cars, like some people in this room, uh, at least you can support improved safety, which is what uh, so many of these projects do as well. Uh, we upgrade the footpaths, we upgrade the pedestrian crossings, we upgrade the cycle lanes and bike facilities, and that is all part of this really important program. It's about making sure that we balance our investment across the different modes of travel and that we're not uh, punishing motorists just because uh, they choose to drive a private motor vehicle, but we're supporting all users right across the network. No one has invested more in public transport and active transport than us, but we will continue to also invest in improving infrastructure, and I commend this program order, to the Chair. Chamber. Point of order. Oh, point of order, Councillor. I was Councilor going Chair. to ask if the Mayor take a quick question. Uh, yes, please. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Through you, Chair. Uh, yes. um, Lord Mayor, I wonder if, if you agree with the general premise that the amount of revenue the city is collecting both through infrastructure charges and, I guess, rates isn't quite enough to pay for all the infrastructure that we need to deliver across the city. I'm, I, I'm assuming you would agree with that, but if, if that's the case, what do you see as the long-term strategy when the city's growing quickly, there are more and more intersections we need to upgrade, more and more footpaths and stormwater drains. What's the long-term game there? Do you think we need to increase infrastructure charges? Yeah, thank you, Councillor Shri. Look, um, you and I might disagree on some things, but on other things we are in furious agreement about, and this is one of those things. The reality is, as an area grows, as a suburb grows, particularly in a greenfield area, where often there's not much infrastructure at all, so places like Rochdale and Pallara started out with just rural standard infrastructure. Um, they were previously rural or farming areas, and you know, we're talking about strawberry farms and cow paddocks, um, and then becoming a thriving community. The infrastructure that has to be built is only partially funded by infrastructure charges, revenue or contributions from um, as, as development occurs. Now, I remember in Rochdale that when we calculated the infrastructure need for that area uh, in, in the early days of planning, the, the bill came to about $600 million. That's for one suburb, one suburb, 600 million. And if you were to have a fair and equitable um, infrastructure charging regime, which um, covers at least a significant part of that cost, uh, you would have to see infrastructure charges going up significantly compared to what they are at the moment. But we saw the state government came in and artificially cap infrastructure charges, and that has continued on now across successive governments. It's not a policy that I support, uh, I think that, at the very least, infrastructure charges need to be increased to reflect the growing cost of construction, uh, because we know, even in just recent times, building the same thing this year as last year costs significantly more. The same thing. And so, whether you're talking about investment in roads and footpaths, other community infrastructure parks, the cost of providing everything has gone up significantly yet you've seen only minor changes in infrastructure charges capping and revenue coming in. And so this is, this is really a good point that you've raised, Councillor Shri. Uh, I was at, uh, together with um, Councillor Allen just recently at a regional planning committee meeting, which was a meeting between the um, state government and the councils of South East Queensland, talking about this exact issue. And they used an example one of the examples that came up, I think, was about Caboolture West. Um, it's a newly growing greenfields area. And the problem was they needed a lot of infrastructure, just like Rochdale. And my time's running out, isn't it? It is for me. <laughs> OK, right. right. <laughs> Unfortunately, we yeah. can't grant you an extension. So. But I do agree. I do agree that infrastructure charges should be increased. Um, is there any further debate? No further debate. Councillor Wines, please close the debate. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. I just wanted to make a few comments in summation uh, and reflect upon the debate that we've just heard uh, for the last few hours. The, one of the principal points that was made was that uh, an accusation levelled that this budget was all about 
the inner suburbs and had nothing for the outer suburbs, clearly neglecting the fact that if we refer to district projects uh, on uh, page two of the schedules, uh, not only is, uh, is the suburban commitment of 86 per cent for the suburbs uh, achieved there, but 86 per cent of expenditure of that is in Pallara, Willowong or Heathwood, in that one section. Right? As I said in my introductory remarks, the ward with the beneficiary for the most new sets of lights is Forest Lake. Uh, I also spent time discussing the Rochdale Priestdale intersection upgrade, where literally the Logan City Council has to make contributions for they are, a, they are an owner of a quarter of that asset, the very um, edge of the city. Uh, sometimes in my lighter moments, uh, I call the Brisbane Infrastructure Committee the Bracken Ridge Infrastructure Committee <laughs> because of how much work we do in that particular ward, whether it be Beams Road, whether it be Norris Road, Norris and Barber, uh, Hoyland, Rogan, um, um, Dorval, it just keeps coming in that, uh, again, uh, our ward at the very edge of the city. Um, on Co uh, Cooper's Plains, look, I'm going to take a, a moment to talk about the Cooper's Plains open level crossing. Um, imagine, Mr Chair, that you were throwing a party and you were the first person to show up to the party and you brought the chips and dips. Then you waited and the last person to show up to the party is the person responsible for the event. And then they look at you and say, how come you forgot the steaks and sausages? You've ruined the party. You have ruined the party. That is effectively what the state government has done. The group of people responsible for that crossing have shown up late and accused the first group of people of being there of ruining their show. How appalling by them. How appalling by them. Um, and you just think to yourself, uh, and not just that, I refer to the, the budget book, page, page 239, and you can see that both the Beams Road and the Coopers Plains Open Level Crossing funds are in the Fords in preparation for the, the, the periodical payments we will make to the state government in support of those projects. So, that, so not only have we come to the table, we've entered it into the Fords of our budget in anticipation. There was a couple of comments, but I will uh, speak to the, the inverse point. One of the beautiful things about this city is that regardless of where you live in the Brisbane City Council local government area, you view the city as yours, right? So people in Brackenridge, people in Jamboree, people in Paddington know that the Queen Street Mall belongs to them. They know that City Hall belongs to them. Fortitude Valley, South Bank, all of it belongs to them. So when things happen at those places, for example, the Story Bridge, it is not for merely the Gabba and Central Ward, but for the whole city. And I don't think people begrudge upgrading centralised infrastructure that's shared for all residents, and they don't view it. I, I suspect that Councillor Howard would, would look at a lot of the expenditure for her ward and say, well, actually, that's city expenditure, whether that be New Farm Park or Queen Street Mall. These things belong to all of us. It's part of actually what's wonderful about this place. Other capitals don't necessarily view the inner city as the property of the whole city. And that's one of the, the great things about it. So I don't think uh, the hostility that the opposition show uh, towards the city is necessarily right or reflective of the actual attitudes of Brisbane city people. There was one other thing that a lot of time was spent on, and that is the 2024 election. The Labor opposition and opposition councillors loved talking about it. So I will share my prediction with all of you. I will channel my mind, use my mind's eye, and I will say that the Labor Lord Merrill vote will be the lowest percentage Lord Merrill vote for Labor ever. <laughs> ever. And that the demise of that organisation will continue. And I don't need any particular ability for foresight to know that because that's what's happened the last four elections. And it will only, the tracking down will only be the natural progression of things unless the Labor Party wake up to themselves and turn up. Because right now, the, the natural way of things, the Labor Party will just continue to decline. And all of this discussion about some sort of wipeout <laughs> by the majority. <laughs> It doesn't stack up to the trend line. It does not stack up to the trend line. But also, 
while the Labor opposition is hostile to important projects, it will, they will continue to decline. So I encourage them not to change. I, enc <laughs> I, I encourage them to spend millions of dollars putting out flyers saying that they won't spend money putting out flyers, yeah. which is effectively what they do. So, um, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the radical anti-flyer agenda <laughs> where they spent $2 million on flyers and TV ads saying that they won't spend money on flyers and TV ads. <laughs> I think they should try that again because I think it worked so well last time. Look, uh, in all seriousness, this... <laughs> this. Uh, now, it's funny, I heard Councillor Cumming ask me how, came, how close I came to losing. Well, I would remind him, I'm still here, I'm still here, no matter how hard you tried. And not just that, the Labor Party ran a Young Australian of the Year against me. And they spent $2 million. They doubled what we spent at the last campaign, and they still failed. And, I, and look, and Councillor Cumming can be rude to me, but my invitation to join us still stands, Peter. <laughs> still stands. We, like, we know we like you more than your, your uh, colleagues over there. So, uh, in all seriousness, um, this is an excellent program. Uh, it's about meaningful delivery right across the city for the benefit of all residents, and I encourage Point of order, uh, Chair. all councillors. Will, will Councillor yeah. Wines take a quick question? Yeah, no. Sorry, we take a question, no. Councillor. No, sorry. No. And I encourage all councillors to support it. Yeah. I'll now put the motion for the adoption of the infrastructure for Brisbane program. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division seconded. Division has been called by the Deputy Mayor and by Councillor Hutton. Councillors, ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Thank you. Um, clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and one against. Motion is carried. I will now ask Councillor Davis to present the next program, Clean, Green and Sustainable City. Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mr Chair, I move that for the Clean, Green and Sustainable City program, one, the program budgeted financial statement is set out on page 22 uh, for the years 2022-23 through to 2025-26, and two, the annual operational plan as set out on pages 80 to 89, so far as they relate to program three be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Mackay, that for the Clean, Green and Sustainable City program, one, the program budgeted financial statement as set out on page 22 for the years 2022-2023 through to 2025-2026, and two, the annual operational plan as set out on pages 80 to 89, so far as they relate to program three, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Davis. Oh, well, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, it gives me great pleasure to uh, present to the Chamber today the annual budget for Program 3 on behalf of the Lord Mayor. But before I do, can I just make uh, two special shout-outs? First to Councillor Steve Toomey, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday. <laughs> but also to my parents, 
Jim and Marjorie Palmer, who today celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary. Thank you for indulging me. Um, Mr Chair, it's been a challenging start to the year. In February, we experienced a weather event like no other in our city's recorded history. During this period, Brisbane received two thirds of its annual rainfall in less than a week. Never before had Brisbane seen more than two consecutive days of 200 millimetres of rain, but in February, there were three. This extraordinary weather event led to a combination of creek, river and overland flow flooding that affected more than 23,000 properties across 177 suburbs. The Lord Mayor revealed that the damage bill from the flood was in the order of $660 million, with almost $330 million to be funded directly from Council. In Program 3, the impact was felt right across the city, including damage to parks and playgrounds, stormwater assets, open and closed drains, sea and river walls, creeks, wharves, jetties, pontoons and fishing platforms. And in response, this budget provides more than $120 million to the rebuilding and recovery of those assets. As the Lord Mayor mentioned in his budget speech, after the floods, he wrote to both the federal and state governments for additional funding to bolster the reach of our flood resistance, uh, our flood, uh, resistance home program, program because after Brisbane City Council having done all of the heavy lifting, it was time that the scheme was funded at all levels of government. And whilst we are pleased to see that both the federal and state governments have now agreed to funding, we are focused on ensuring that Brisbane receives its fair share and current conversations are occurring with the QRA at officer level. Once those discussions are finalised under the new project line Flood Resilient Suburbs, we will develop a more tailored program that will continue to improve resilience for Brisbane and make our city safe, confident and ready for the next flood. One of the ways in which we manage flooding in our city is supporting our creek and waterways network. Mm -hmm. This year, $40 million was announced towards the Resilient Rivers Initiative as part of the South East Queensland Cities deal and we were very appreciative for that. The Resilient Rivers Initiative was established by the South East Queensland Council of Mayors to enable local governments to join forces in supporting and improving our waterways and Moreton Bay. And Council is committed to continuing to work with our South East Queensland counterparts. In addition to supporting our waterways, we're also focused on continuing to deliver drainage and stormwater projects to manage flood resilience. In this budget, we have more than doubled the drainage spend to $131 million towards improving resilience and rebuilding damage uh, drainage infrastructure. This includes investment in drainage construction and resilient pro resilience projects, stormwater infrastructure projects, enclosed drains and backflow valves. Backflow valves will be installed at Wynnum, drainage works at Ridge and Creek Street Green Slopes, and drainage works at Christensen Street Yoronga will be delivered in the 22-23 budget. Mr Chair, in addition to managing flooding in our waterways, we are also committed to ensuring Brisbane is a clean, green and sustainable city. And one way to achieve this is by expanding and improving our green space and bushland reserves. Yeah. Brisbane is Australia's most biodiverse capital city. With more than 9,500 hectares of natural areas, we are on track to reach our target of achieving 40% natural habitat cover across Brisbane by 2031. Through our Bushland Preservation Fund, we are expanding, managing, maintaining and restoring our bushland estate. The Bushland Preservation Fund will continue to support the Bushland Acquisition Program, along with conservation projects such as Wipeout Weeds, Brisbane Invasive Species Management, Community Conservation Partnerships, Community Conservation Assistance and Conservation Reserves Management. Our Community Conservation Partnerships Program supports almost 9,000 volunteers to deliver bushland and waterway improvements across more than 3,600 hectares. There are three programs that make up the Community Conservation Partnership Program, and that includes Wildlife Cons Conservation Partnership Program, which supports 820 private landowners to manage more than 2,600 hectares of land. It also includes a creek catchment program which supports 12 creek catchment groups made up of 1,500 volunteers to restore more than 370 hectares of key waterway and bushland areas across 90 sites. And finally, the Community Conservation Partnership Program supports 162 Habitat Brisbane groups who, across 5,500 volunteers, actively restore hectares of key waterway and bushland areas across the city. The Bushland Preservation Fund also supports our Conservation Reserves Management and Enhancement Program, 
which includes the restoration of natural areas across Brisbane, such as upgrading fire trails at Fitzgibbon Bushlands or managing weeds at Whites Hill Reserve and Cannon Hill Bushland Reserve. Expanding our tree cover is not limited to our bushland areas either, but also includes our streets and boulevards. And in 22-23, we will deliver our Greener Suburbs program in Ashgrove, Chermside and East Brisbane, while undertaking community planning events at Sunnybank, Carindale, Roachdale, Acacia Ridge, Castledine and Upper Kedron. Mr Chair, supporting our natural areas, improving their biodiversity is also integral to protecting our native wildlife. In addition to the work we are undertaking to enhance and restore our bushland areas, under this budget we are taking a number of measures to protect and care for our much-loved koala population. We recognise that the way to do this is by working to address the four key threats that koalas face, and that's of habitat loss and fragmentation, vehicle strikes, dog attacks and disease. We will continue to fund our koala fodder plantation with more than 8,000 stems planted over 10 hectares, and this has provided more than 16,000 meals in the last 12 months. The fodder is distributed to sick and injured koalas through the Koala Carer Network across South East Queensland in collaboration with the RSPCA from their premises at Wacol. Under our biodiversity planning service, we'll continue to install and design wildlife movement infrastructure at key locations to protect koalas from vehicle strikes, such as the recently installed log bridge at Boundary Road Camp Hill, which uh, provides a more intuitive solution to koalas crossing, making them feel like they are crossing from tree to tree. Our natural areas are not only important to our city's amenity and biodiversity, but also play a role in offsetting our city's carbon emissions. We are the largest carbon neutral local government in the nation and, Mr Chair, this achievement did not happen by accident. While other levels of government talk about climate change, we take real action. Through our Carbon Neutral Council and Emissions Reduction Project, we invest in improving internal energy efficiency, purchasing renewable energy, deliver emissions reducing projects and purchase carbon offsets. Some of our emission reducing projects in the 22-23 financial year include installing panels at our buildings with the Rochdale Metro Depot, the Morningside SES Depot and Zilmere Library. And solar panels will also feature as part of the Everton Park Library project. Uh, those opposite may be interested to know that since becoming carbon neutral, 89% of our spend has been on Australian carbon offsets and renewable energy certificates. Uh, one of the Australian offset projects that Karen, uh, Council has been supporting is in the Cape York Peninsula, where Indigenous communities use traditional land management practices to limit greenhouse gas emissions and improve the health of the environment. We will also continue this financial year to purchase 100 per cent renewable energy and from Australian renewable energy sources. In the 22-23 financial year, Brisbane Sustainability Agency will continue to deliver on projects, services and key environmental initiatives that produce sustainable and livable outcomes for Brisbane. And this includes initiatives like the Brisbane Carbon Challenge. Over the last 12 months, the Brisbane Sustainability Agency has worked with 18 champion households who through the challenge have achieved a 55% reduction on average uh, on their, their uh, individual household emissions. We will take the learnings from this program to develop the tools to encourage all residents to reduce their household emissions by half by 2031. The Brisbane Sustainability Agency will also continue to deliver on the Oxley Creek Transformation Project with the commencement of the Archerfield Wetlands District Park, the focus of the new financial year. This project will not only see the improvement of the ecological outcomes for Oxley Creek, but also provide new recreational opportunities for the area. In order to improve the sustainability and environmental outcomes for Oxley Creek, Brisbane Sustainability Agency will also be continuing water quality monitoring, installing gross pollutant traps and proactively addressing industrial land use compliance. But Oxley Creek Transformation Project is just one example of how we are balancing environmental outcomes with other recreational experiences in our parks and nature reserves. The Brisbane Off-Road Cycling Strategy, released in December 2021, identifies both potential short and long-term opportunities for this growing recreational activity. This year we'll see the completion of the Mount Cootha Mountain Bike Concept Plan and the opening of existing fire and shared use trails. Our trail care program will be ongoing and provide more opportunity for volunteers to participate in sustainable trail construction and maintenance. Our compliance and community education programs to support sustainable use of our green space areas 
will also continue. And we will commence design of a new family-friendly off-road uh, cycling facility at a location to be identified within the strategy. Mr Chair, the Schriner Council is committed to making Brisbane a better place to live and play by providing more spaces for recreation for residents to enjoy. Council manages over 2,180 parks and in 22-23 we will be investing more than $244 million in parks and playgrounds. The budget focuses on delivering more for our suburbs and this is why we are investing in our local parks. For many residents and families, a trip to their local park and playground is a great way to get the kids outside in the sunshine to enjoy healthy activity. But the reality is in Queensland, we remain the skin capital of Australia. And that's why the announcement of the new Sunsafe Suburban Playgrounds program is an important initiative for our city. Under this fast track program, we will see $10 million invested over three years to ensure all playgrounds across Brisbane are provided with shade. This year, the program will deliver at approximately 50 playground locations, and as each site is different, consideration will be given to either shade sales or mature trees, or in some cases, there'll be a combination of both. But there'll also be upgrades to more neighbourhood parks in our suburbs, with over $6 million invested in this program. These upgrades are designed to ensure that Brisbane's parks provide a diversity of recreational and leisure opportunities for the community. Works are planned in over 20 parks, including Bedgood Park, Milton, Kerry Road Park, Archfield, and O'Callaghan Park at Zilmere. This is further supported by a $4.7 million commitment to upgrading and enhancing facilities at over 30 locations throughout the parks network. This will include upgrades to picnic amenities, exercise equipment, outdoor gyms, and basketball courts. There's also $2.6 million allocated to playground replacement, including at Robinson Park Fairfield, Frank Sleeman Park in Boondall, and Wendy Turnbull Park in Bracken Ridge. We will be enhancing our metropolitan and district parks with almost $2 million of improvements being delivered in George Clayton Park in Manly, our Thrust Street Park in Inala, and Kookaburra Park at Corana Downs. Work will be undertaken to remediate the Shorncliffe escarpment, and consultation will begin to develop a plan for Brighton Foreshore. At Paul Conti Park, Hemant, Kathleen Street Park, Richlands and Watonga Park, The Gap, new scooter tracks will be constructed and they will follow in a similar design to our award-winning track at Bradbury Park. While Ninja Course is at Whites Hill Reserve, Camp Hill, Taralba Park, Everton Park and Dalton Street Park, Callum Vale will be completed. Our four-legged friends are not forgotten with $1.3 million being invested in the refurbishment of dog off-leash areas across the city. There is significant investment in our sports parks this year, with $43 million to two major sports and recreational precincts at Murray and at Nudgee. Murray Recreation Reserve has long been home to grassroots cycling events and local clubs, and this upgrade will completely transform the existing infrastructure to an international track. The $16.1 million project includes a world-class cycling track, along with, new five, with a new 500-metre speed skating track and a multi-purpose clubhouse. Nudgee Recreation Reserve also has a proud history as a local sports precinct, and that's why we are investing $26 million to upgrade it with professional level facilities to help support our next generation of sports stars. And for the locals, a BMX track, playground and dog off leash areas are incorporated in the master plan. Our iconic Victoria Park Barambin will see the, uh, will see the park further develop into a world-class destination for adventure, discovery and reconnection. This year, the planning and design of both the urban pump track and the Spring Hook Common will progress. Other enhancements to be installed in the park this year include park benches, picnic tables, shelters, drinking fountains and bike facilities. Last year, the park was named as the Games venue for the equestrian cross country, and we have been integrating the Brisbane 2032 Olympic Games into the, and its legacy into the master planning process for the park. Brisbane is renowned for being a clean, green city, as well as having a healthy outdoor lifestyle, and our incredible and diverse park networks is a part of that reason why. Mr Chair, the Program 3 budget, like other program areas, has a focus on rebuilding and recovering following the February 2022 severe weather event. But it also continues to deliver a range of programs, services and infrastructure that contribute to Brisbane being a clean, green and sustainable city. Through this program, we will preserve and protect Brisbane's diverse natural environment and rich biodiversity while integrating urban form with nature and building city resilience to the impacts, impacts of climate change. Councillor uh, Davis, your time has expired. I commend Program 3 budget to the Thank Chamber. You. Thank you. Um, further debate.
Councillor Counts Shree. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on Program 3, and it's going to be hard to summarise all the concerns I have about this budget <laughs> in 10 minutes. I, I think the administration is guilty of some quite severe and significant greenwashing, and particularly when it, when it comes to climate action, um, it's really disappointing to see the discursive framing of uh, climate action as an individual problem. Some of the programs, like the Climate Smart Homes stuff, like I've, I've done the survey, I've seen, seen the details on that, and it's just blaming individuals for a structural problem, and I think is a, a, a real distraction from the deeper systemic changes we need to be making in our city. Uh, if, if this council was serious about climate change, one of the most obvious areas to improve upon would be to reduce car dependence in this city. But as we saw in the previous programs, uh, the council's kind of doing the opposite of that. It's encouraging more car usage. So here we've got the council encouraging people to switch to energy efficient light bulbs and um, try to reduce their household energy co consumption by a, a couple of watts. But meanwhile, is designing a city that almost forces people to drive and thus burn more fossil fuels because the alternative modes of transport are so suboptimal. Um, the broader concern I have with the way this program is planned and managed is that it's highly politicised. I think a lot of residents would probably be surprised and disappointed to realise that although there are plans like the local government infrastructure plan which identify priority parks across the city, um, the council is often just making party political decisions about what projects get funded and prioritised. And even the LGIP itself, the Local Government Infrastructure Plan, it, it itself is a political document where decisions about what does and doesn't get included in that plan are ultimately driven by party political considerations. I've been, um, I think, to be honest, when I came in here, I was a little bit naive. Uh, six years ago because I didn't realise just how corrupt the administration was in terms of oh, the favouritism. Point of order. Yeah, point of order. Councillor Shree. That is Shree. absolutely not acceptable in this place. I ask him to withdraw that comment. Councillor Shree, uh, allegations of corruption are... Um, no, look, I'll, I'll define the term corruption because I, I get that reasonable people have different... No. Councillor Shree, yeah. well, no, well then, Chair, I won't withdraw because I, I don't think it's un, an unreasonable word to use and I'll, I'll explain why, but I... I don't, I don't think it's an offensive term. I think... Councillor Shree, I'd ask you if you could please withdraw the statement and, and use other language. I'd refuse that request. But thank you. I'll, I'll reflect deeply on it. The, the reason I... Mr Chair, Councilor. point of order. Yes, a refusal definitely. of a request from the Chair. I ask you to take action, please. Councillor Shree, uh, I can, this is a place of debate, and I understand that. And we have the ability to interject and, and pass comment. But there are standards under the Councillor Code of Conduct that you're well aware, and allegations or even the statement of corruption of an administration of a councillor is an offence under that particular Code of Conduct. It is an offence, so, sorry? I'm, my apology, it's unsuitable meeting conduct. Mm. And so, I'm, again, I'd ask if you would withdraw the statement and simply rephrase uh, your, your, uh, what you were saying. Look, I, I, won't, I won't withdraw the statement, but I will re add, add more context and try and rephrase. Um, Councillor Shree. So, um, point of order, Mr Chair. Uh, Councillor Toomey. Uh, Mr Chair, I understand that, that Councillor Shree is trying to make a point, but you cannot come into this place, throw the word of corruption around and then make up your own definition. I really encourage the Chair to ensure that Councillor Shree withdraws that statement. So, point of order, just for Councilor clarification, uh, I didn't quite hear... What Councillor Shree said was it the word corruption or corrupted? I actually didn't hear that. No. It no. Was... Well, 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 hang on. Uh, just one moment, uh, just, please, Councillor. Yeah. What the word was, Chair? Councillor Cassidy, the word was that the administration was corrupt. Is that what I said? Yes. You accused the administration of being corrupt. Uh, I know. I. I, I... I, I think the decision-making process is corrupt. I'm, I'm happy that's, to say that. That's not what was said. So if, if you would like... Right, I'll, re I'll rephrase then. I'll, I, I think the decision-making process around funding, how funding is allocated... Councillors... We... Councillor... Councillors... Councillor Shree you guys has... say far more offensive stuff than this. Come on. Councillors... Like, Councillors... Councillor Shree has rephrased the comment and geez. we will move on. Councillor Shree. Touchy. I, um, yeah, I've, I've, I've copped a lot worse than that in this chamber, and um, I think people have probably 
probably need to grow a thicker skin if they want to play in this space. Um, the, the reality is that the decision making around how funding for park upgrades is made in this chamber is heavily driven by party political considerations. Rather than looking at the um, collective public interest and what is best for the city as a whole, the LNP administration of this council decides to prioritise funding towards projects that they see as being beneficial to their political and electoral interests. And particularly that means favouring LNP councillors, even when there is a stronger incentive or a stronger public interest in spreading money or allocating money differently around the city. Um, when I say that the system is corrupt or that the process is corrupt, I don't mean that there are bribes changing hands or that someone's done some dirty deal under the table. I mean that the process itself has been corrupted by the interests of big stakeholders, I think particularly here of, of big developers and property speculators, um, and by certain sectional interests, I, uh, including this uh, advertising companies, some of the larger construction companies. This is not um, the, the sorts of corruption that we might see embodied in um, other jurisdictions where there's a really blatant and obvious form of, of bribery or nepotism. What we see here is more systemic and entrenched um, and and structural. And I think the, the administration needs to recognise and acknowledge that rather than um, hide, hiding, behind, um, hiding behind the chair, I think. It's it, um, I, for, I, for example, have seen quite a few projects where the local community very clearly wants something to happen, the local councillor very clearly wants something to happen, there's been extensive public consultation, there's been um, really strong democratic processes in support of a particular project. And then behind closed doors, a decision is made to ignore the will of the people and override that democratic process. That's corruption as far as I'm concerned. You guys might put a different term on it, I don't know. Um, but if the public wants something, and there's very clear evidence that the public wants something and that ratepayers want their money used in a certain way, and then uh, one or two LNP politi politicians or one or two unaccountable public servants make a decision to the contrary without being transparent or, or being accountable about that decision and without taking the time to even explain or justify the decision properly, um, then I, I do think there's a corruption there of our democracy. And I, I think, um, think councillors need to grapple with the fact that a lot of residents across this city, not, certainly not just in my ward, but across this city, are frustrated with the decision-making processes. Reasonable people can disagree on the best outcomes, but the processes themselves are flawed here and are completely um, erasing any opportunity for meaningful and, and well-informed democratic debate. Uh, in my, my ward, for example, we've got thousands of additional residents living in apartments without um, any private outdoor space. They don't have big backyards. They don't have um, lot, lots of shared outdoor green space to use and enjoy. And yet the council is continually underinvesting in public parkland. Now, what the council could do is take some of the land off the property developers and speculators and turn that into green space. If the council, the council has the legal powers to do that, but it's not doing that because it doesn't want to disadvantage Point of order. the property Point industry. Of order. Will uh, Council, Council Street, take a one. question. Council Street, will you take a question? Yeah. When you say take, what do you mean by take? I'm, I mean compulsory acquiring land that developers want to build on. That's. Uh, plenty, of planning, plenty of planning experts will say, yeah, look, that land would be better used as park. Don't allow a developer to build on a floodplain. Don't allow a developer to build on land that's 40 centimetres above sea level, as we're seeing on Kurilpa Street in West End. That's a really common sense thing. That's not controversial. We should be buying that land back and turn it into public parkland, into community facilities, into sports fields, into usable green spaces. But this council is making a decision not to do that because it doesn't want to piss off the property industry. That's all it boils down to. The council has the money, the council has the legal mechanisms. What the council doesn't have is the spine to stand up to big property developers. And I'm, I'm not afraid to say that in here. I think it's really disappointing that this administration is squandering the opportunity. Every year, land values rise higher and higher. It's getting harder and harder to buy back these inner city sites for parkland. Um, at some point, we're going to have to do it because you can't have 40,000 people living in, in tiny dog box apartments without access to sunlight, trees and green space. 
this, the city is heading in the wrong direction, and this particular program really embodies that more strongly than anything else. I think there are a lot of wasted opportunities in this program. I'm really disappointed at how centralised and authoritarian the decision-making processes have become. It's actually gotten worse in the time I've been here. Uh, chairs are harder to get hold of. Senior public servants are harder to get hold of. I don't blame the public servants for that. They're obviously overstretched. They don't have enough staff allocated to key decisions. That's causing decision-making bottlenecks, which holds up projects. Projects. Millions of dollars are being wasted on planning and design for projects that aren't delivered because of poor decision-making processes and a lack of transparency and accountability. Further debate? I'm going to stand up. Lord Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. Um, I want to thank, first of all, the uh, Chair, uh, Councillor Tracy Davis, um, for her commitment to uh, the sustainability of our city and investing in the green space. Uh, and it is a commitment that we all share and we are all passionate about. And um, I have to say it was interesting to hear the previous speaker, Councillor Shri, uh, because it is seldom that we actually hear him talk about the environment and sustainability. Right, it is very seldom that we hear that. Uh, we know he talks about a whole range of other things, uh, but uh, we know that the city's first Green Councillor very rarely actually talks about the environment. Uh, so that is a good change, and I welcome his uh, you know, interest in this particular issue. Uh, but it is clear from the contribution we saw just now uh, that Councillor Shree is now suffering from relevance deprivation syndrome. Now that there's other Greens that have been elected, uh, he's no longer he's no longer on his own. Um, and and uh, what we know here is that this is a classic Councillor Shree tactic: throw out an outrageous claim um, to get some attention, an offensive claim. Uh, make an offensive, unsubstantiated claim uh, just to get some attention and then say, oh, no, no, I'll, I'll give you my definition of it. Yes. There is a dictionary definition of the word he threw out. Uh, he doesn't get to make up a definition. Uh, and what we see here, what we see here is someone who is, through his actions and comments today, uh, is casting aspersions over not just the administration, but everyone that has been involved in this organisation in plans such as the local government infrastructure plan, in the parks planning, uh, the suggestion that somehow the LGIP is a party political document is ludicrous, is ludicrous. I can tell you, and I've said it before in this chamber, there has been zero, zero party political involvement in the LGIP. Zero. I don't remember a single thing that has ever been altered or changed by this administration after it's been put up by the officers Point based order, on Chair. the growing areas Point of, of order, the city. Councilor will the Mayor take a question about how, how the Howard Smith Wars ferry will, terminal came to be added Lord to Mayor, the LGIP? Will you take a question? No. no. And so what we see here is, as I said, someone suffering relevance deprivation, making outrageous Councillor claims. Johnston. And he will not ever admit that this council is the greenest and most sustainable in Australia. In Australia. Yep. And, and he hates it. He hates it. And so all he can do is make outrageous claims rather than focus on anything that is, is factual. The reality is no one has a better record of investing in environmental initiatives, of investing in new parkland. Uh, we are every year buying more land for parkland. Not, not taking land, not taking land, we're purchasing it. We're doing it the appropriate way. Councillor Johnston. Point of order. Uh, point of order, Deputy May. And beyond the yelling across, the, yeah. but the words being yelled across the chamber are absolutely inappropriate and defamation in this place where there is no protection for that. Yeah. Councillor, Councillor Johnston, I mentioned to Councillor Shree before the use of the word corruption and the allegation of corruption is unsuitable meeting conduct. I asked Councillor Shree to withdraw the statement. He reworded it, but I'm saying to all councillors, the use of the word is unsuitable meeting conduct and will not be tolerated there are other ways to express yourselves more appropriately in this chamber, and I ask you to do so, otherwise I will need to go through the warning process. Lord Mayor. Thank you. Speaking of relevance deprivation, <laughs> what we see is a complete ignorance about the reality 
of this council's investment and focus on the environment and sustainability and parkland and green space. And it goes back, it's not just some kind of newly found thing. It goes back to our side of politics introducing the bushland acquisition program against opposition from Labor councillors. They campaigned against it and called it simply a new tax. That was their response to the program that has now run and saved over 4,000 hectares of bushland across the city, created conservation reserves that will... Councillor, Councillor Johnson keeps talking about LMP wards. 70 per cent of the wards in Brisbane are LMP wards. Um, and so, I mean, really. And, and so... Uh, Councillor Johnston. Yep. And so the bushland acquisition program, uh, years, decades ago in fact, was established by our side of politics, and that is a legacy for the future of the city that will be there forever, forever. And I mentioned in my budget speech, when you fly into Brisbane, when you fly into Brisbane, you can see that our city is different. It is a green city. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you have been to other cities in Australia and the world. They are not like Brisbane. They are full of concrete. They are not green, tree-lined, um, green space cities like Brisbane. And that was one of the things that the IOC representatives, that's the first thing they were amazed by when they came here, just coming into this place, that the nature, that nature is everywhere. Our natural environment is everywhere, in the suburbs, all over the place in Brisbane, you see the environment, and green space and nature. And that is one of the special things about Brisbane. And our side of politics is the one who has championed that before the Greens party even existed, before they even existed. We were the first uh, large government organisation to become carbon neutral. Now, this is not something that we've claimed. This is claimed by a national certification scheme. National certification, we were the first large government organisation to become carbon neutral. And my understanding is that we are the second largest in Australia after Telstra, after Telstra. And I still am waiting to see one single government department, whether it's a federal or state government department, become carbon neutral, because they haven't. It would take literally one large government department to eclipse our size and become the largest carbon neutral organisation in the country. Yet you don't see any of them doing it. Not at the state level and not at the federal level. But then let's have a look at our investment in parkland and green space. $244 million this year across the entire city of Brisbane, the suburbs, spread out right across where people live um, and investing continually in not only upgrading and improving green space and parkland, not only repairing it after the flood, but expanding it, buying new land to create parkland in places like Pallara, in places like Rochdale, right across the city where growth is happening, we are purchasing new land to become parkland and green space. We are doing it. And we didn't need Councillor Shree to tell us to do it. We were already doing it once again. And so our record in this area puts us at the forefront of councils right across Australia. Mm -hmm. Now, I know there's a couple of green dominated councils elsewhere in the country. And these are usually tiny little inner city councils that really don't have any parkland or bushland to speak of. And whatever they might do is tokenistic at best. Yet we have 1.27 million people, the greater Brisbane area largely contained within our council. And that sets us up genuinely to have a environmental agenda and a green space agenda that makes a difference on a large scale. Now we know that um, Greens in those other councils, they focus on things like whether they should celebrate Australia Day or not, whether they should fly the Australian flag or not. This kind of rubbish that divides people, whereas we're actually getting on with the things that matter, which is building a greener Brisbane, delivering a greener Brisbane, a more sustainable Brisbane, things that make a difference and will set up our lifestyle for decades to come as the cleanest and greenest city in Australia. 
and that will only get better and will only accelerate as, as we move towards the Olympics. Because we know that one of the key things that we pitched and we wanted as part of the Olympics was to be a carbon positive Olympics. And that will have far reaching implications, positive ones, for the way our city grows and develops. And we are deadly serious about that. We are deadly serious about making sure that our sustainability grows and grows each year. And so, while others will throw around outrageous terms, while others will focus on things like whether we fly the Australian flag or not, or whether we uh, have citizenship ceremonies on Australia Day or not, uh, we focus on what matters. We focus on what matters. Because we know that the alternative in this place is a Labor Party with no ideas whatsoever, nothing, no agenda, no ideas, or we have a radical, actually, a, he's corrected me in the past. I've called him a socialist, and that was, that, he said that was wrong. Not a, not a socialist, but an anarchist. Yes. An anarchist. Not quite, but I know that. Well, well, we're, we're getting closer. We're getting, we're, we're getting warmer. Um, and look, you know, look, I, I'm not an expert on anarchy, um, Councillor Shree. I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert, but. Well, actually, yeah, sometimes it seems like anarchy at Lord home. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. <laughs> Point of order, Chair. Um, Point of order, Councillor Shree. I'm sure if any other councillor in this place was called an anarchist, you'd be interrupting very quickly and saying, look, that's not appropriate terminology and language. But you, <laughs> Councillor Shree, are you, are you offended by the statement you made yourself? No, no I, I, I don't think I've described myself as an anarchist. I mean, if, if people want to describe me with that term, then sure. But I, I think there's a big difference between my politics and what people would describe as anarchist. Anarchism. I've talked about this before. Do you want to sit down and have a discussion about political philosophy? Councillors, we, we should probably that. continue with the debate. <laughs> Could I? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I rise to enter the debate on uh, Program 3. Uh, and um, I'll talk about some local uh, things and some citywide things as well. And I, I just want to start on um, bushland and bushland yeah. acquisition. Yeah. Uh, because the Lord Mayor Lord Mayor's just got up and told this nice fairy tale about uh, the whole program, the program as a whole, and, and what, what this program uh, has done under this LNP administration. Now, uh, when, when, the, um, when the, the Liberal administration of the 80s, Sally Ann Atkinson as Mayor, initiated the bushland acquisition uh, levy, rightly, as the Lord Mayor said, they bought uh, how many blocks is the council coming? One. One block. One block of land for bushland. The Liberals bought one block. And, when, and then when the Labor administration came in, Labor increased that levy so we could make a significant, a significant dent uh, in the need to buy uh, green space and bushland and accelerated that program and bought, and bought the bulk of what we see now uh, being held uh, under that program. When you, look at, when you look at those acquisitions all throughout the 90s and early 2000s... Let's not interrupt Councillor Cassidy to speaking, please. Councillor Cassidy, please continue. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, so the Labor administration of the 90s and early 2000s bought the bulk um, of that bushland uh, that we now uh, come to value as a city uh, that we know makes a, a significant contribution to the lifestyle we enjoy. Now, what are some of the purchases just recently, actually, that the LNP administration have made? We all remember that land at those special purchases uh, just before elections, those special purchases are like that land at Mount Cravat East. Uh, on Narran Street and, and Carrara Street, I think it was, Those, that one out there, that $6 million um, tennis court, that $6 million tennis court with a couple of cocos palms that this LNP administration bought. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy, please continue. So that $6 million that Councillor Adams uh, intervened politically to save her own skin in an election, in a marginal electorate. When you talk about, when you talk about the corruption of a process, well, there is, there is a great example. Because that... Point of order. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. That is absolutely imputing motive, and I ask the here to withdraw that. There was no corruption of that process. The, the, the Auditor General said there was. Could we just stop for a moment, please? 
Councillor Cassidy, I, I understand that you're describing these matters, um, but in, in the allegation of corruption, again, I'd ask councillors if they could simply reword their way in, in a more appropriate fashion. Please continue. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. The Auditor General absolutely said that that was, that was bad, um, that process. You can't, you, can't use, you can't use public money that is earmarked for bushland to buy some blocks that a local community, rightly, the community didn't want developed, they didn't want townhouses on this block. So when, you, when some political heat is applied to an LNP councillor, they magically are able to use the bushland acquisition fund to purchase, that wasn't bushland, Lord Mayor, I'll take that interjection. He said to save koalas, there was, there was, no, there was no koalas on that land. There were two, there were two tennis courts no, sorry, there was a tennis court and two cocos palms. I mean, you know, you can't take, you can't take this, Lord Point Mayor. Of order, Mr. Point Chair. of order, Mr. Chair. Councillor Catsey, take a question. No, I'm rapidly running out of time. Oh. Chair. No. Okay, I didn't. Care. If we could, Councillor Catsey, if you could please. So continue. you can't, you can't use public money for political purposes. It's just wrong. It's absolutely wrong. So, no. Um, so when when we talk about sustainability. Uh, chair, this Lord Mayor uh, claims that um, uh, Brisbane City Council is, is carbon neutral. And sure, when you buy a whole heap of credits uh, and when you don't do the heavy lifting yourself, and um, Councillor Davis talked about that, um, to, you can basically just use money uh, to become carbon neutral. We all know that the only thing a local government can do to genuinely become, genuinely become carbon neutral uh, and produce our own carbon credits and make sure our city and the 190 suburbs that make it up is to introduce FOGO, a food organics, garden organics system. See, they, la they laugh. The LNP laugh when we talk about FOGO. Now, there's over 70 councils around Australia that have implemented this system, and experts say it is the only way you can, as a local government, address climate change in your city. So the LNP can get out there and talk about buying tennis courts and supposedly turning them into bushland, and they've ticked their box along the way. Uh, but the only genuine thing a local government can do is introduce FOGO. And we know that this LNP administration, because it is deeply conservative and is LNP to the core, really doesn't care about these issues. Now, in the program before us, as we found out uh, in the information sessions, there's some funding uh, for projects in my ward, which um, are, are two very good projects and thanks entirely to the federal government. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Davis talked about the Shawncliffe Escarpment uh, Plan, which will be rolled out this year. That's entirely funded uh, through the federal government, all that work. That's core council work. That's core council work. Um, like the Albanese uh, federal government will be... <laughs> will be tr re remember, re remember, remember the Morrison government got turfed out? Have we, we forgotten that one? Uh, there is no Morrison government. There, there, is, there is no Morrison government. There is no Morrison government. And I remember, I remember that last federal election. I remember the LNP candidate. I'm not sure if he was an LNP candidate in the end uh, out in Lilly. He made no commitments to my community, none whatsoever. In fact, he didn't even show his face uh, in the end uh, because uh, he was being hounded um, by the authorities. But um, what we know is the Albanese government will be funding the Shawncliffe Escarpment uh, plan, and the Albanese government and our federal member, Annika Wells, uh, is funding the Brighton foreshore upgrade. Now, this is a foreshore upgrade that this administration should have funded. Uh, money was in the budget in 2008, then 2009, then 2010, then 2011, they, the LNP pulled the money from it. And despite Graham Quirk promising it in 2012, a Graham Quirk promising it in 2016, Adrian Schrinner promising it in 2020, we saw no work, nothing, no money committed until a federal Labor government is able to come to the table with some money and then we see all of a sudden we're getting, I think, something like $50,000 to start the consultation process. So I'm very glad that the federal Labor government has been able to, um, uh, to come to the table on that. But we still don't see any movement on the O'Callaghan Park master plan, which would be a fantastic Olympic legacy to make sure uh, that that Northside sporting precinct is world class uh, and uh, it deserves a whole lot more investment than we are seeing. And a playground upgrade is one thing. Uh, but implementing the O'Callaghan Park master plan is absolutely essential. Uh, now, what we have in program three is a very big problem for our city, though. Uh, when you consider that uh, the last year's budget was $3.6 billion and there was $40 million allocated to the construction 
uh, and rehabilitation of drainage in the suburbs. This year it's a $4 billion budget, according to the Lord Mayor, and there's $42 million. So a $400 million increase in spending this year, apparently, according to Lord Mayor, after the floods, but only $2 million extra on new and rehabilitated drainage in the suburbs of Brisbane. Yeah. Now, a few weeks ago, the Lord yeah. Mayor said, he said, he turned around and said, oh, you Labor councillors will be very happy with the budget, and, but I bet you won't thank me. They were his words. Well, no, I'm not going to thank you for a $2 million increase when we've just seen uh, according to Councillor Davis, 23,000 properties affected by the worst flood, the, the worst suburban flood this city has ever had, and, and hundreds and thousands of people coming out in communities right around Brisbane saying, this council needs to do more. This council needs to do more in the suburbs and do more in terms of basic funding. Uh, residents know that they're not getting good value for money from this LNP administration in the suburbs, particularly, particularly when it comes to drainage. Just a few suburbs in my ward that were very badly impacted by the recent floods, who are having rates increases of 5 per cent in Bright uh, Brighton, 6.3 per cent in Deegan, 6.8 per cent in Geebung and 6 per cent in Sandgate and Shorncliffe, but we're not seeing any investment in suburban drainage. The open drain running from Kempster Street to Cabbage Tree Creek needs serious maintenance, and that's something I raise year after year after year. The open drain running through Brighton, which drains the, almost the entire suburb exiting at Moreton Bay between 15th and 16th Avenue, is in desperate, desperate need for an upgrade. Simple things, simple things like gully traps uh, in Bridge Street, Deagon or Barclay Street. Barclay Street, which floods after very, very minimal rain because the design of that drainage network is entirely flat. Um, these are just some basics. So even you know, residents out at Hemant who have seen rapid development uh, and just after very light rain are seeing their suburb being flooded now. Or out at Pallara, the Lord Mayor said before, oh, Pallara, used to, Pallara had rural infrastructure. Well, it still has rural infrastructure. That's a rapidly developing community. And you're still, no bus stops out there, and you're still investing nothing in suburban drainage out there. Uh, and you know, out of Northgate Ward, Cannery Creek and Pound Drain, like we need significant investment to um, flood-proof these communities, but we're just not seeing it under the LNP administration. There's not enough money in this budget, so therefore, Chair, I'd like to move an amendment. That I move that $5 million of expense expenditure in Program 8 for the 2022-23 financial year on page uh, 27 being new, moved to a new project in Program 3 for the 2022-23 financial year called Additional Drainage Construction to be inserted on page 22. Second. I have copies here which we'll pass around. <coughs> It has been moved by Councillor Cassidy, seconded by Councillor Strunk, that the motion be amended with the wording that $5 million of expenses expenditure in Program 8 for the 2022-2023 financial year on page 27 be moved to a new project in Program 3 for the 2022-2023 financial year called additional drainage construction to be inserted on page 22. Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. So uh, the $5 million in expenses expenditure from Program 8 covers um, Council's advertising budget, essentially. We know included in that is $1.4 million plus for living in Brisbane, plus the corporate comms budget that this Lord Mayor hijacks for his own political purposes. So this is a no-brainer. After the worst flood, the worst suburban flood this city has ever had, uh, with residents crying out for a council to do the basics right, for a council that is uh, raking in more rates than they ever have before, with a record uh, haul for rates uh, and a 10-year record for a rates increase this financial year, people out in the suburbs ask themselves, are they getting value for money? And the answer is no. Uh, when they see in suburbs, like I mentioned in some of my suburbs, seeing rates increases of up to 6.5%, but no drainage projects, no new footpaths, uh, no new upgrades to the road network or cycleways and things like that, the basics a council should do, they know they're not getting good value for money. Now, I've um, got a petition running at the moment for increased drainage funding. I uh, think that's at about 530 signatures today. They're just local residents that want this Lord Mayor to do more to do his job. 
Uh, I've got uh, 88 responses on a detailed survey um, around drainage concerns, suburban drainage concerns. Uh, and I'm going to read some of those that something that, that this $5 million um, could help um, alleviate. Some of them are extremely simple, but this should be spent right around the city, of course. Uh, but here's just a couple. Edith Street, Deegan, has always been a big problem. Carry Street, Zumia, there's an insufficient number of gully traps. Drainage pipes are old and have insufficient capacity to meet need. Uh, Beaconsfield Terrace Brighton needs more drainage. When BCC redid the guttering, it changed the flow of water, so now that street floods. Aberdeen Parade Boondle, water pools on the railway side as the drains don't work properly. The culvert in Aberdeen Parade and Air Street is too high to capture water. Cliff Street Sandgate, stormwater floods from Eagle Terrace through broken pipes down into Cliff Street, causing erosion uh, to Cliff Street habitat and extra flooding along Cliff Street towards Flinders Parade. Blackwood Road, Deegan, the size of the drains is far too small to allow stormwater to drain away efficiently. Princess Street, Bayview Road, Brighton, both drains near the rear of 60 Bayview Road and adjacent 58 are blocked and never maintained. Washington Street, Deegan, the tidal waterways often overflows, it's in poor conditions, disrepair, the wall is collapsed, we saw that uh, recently as well. Uh, with emergency works required. Poplar Place, Tagum, the whole street was devastated from floods. The creek flows from near Beams Road and crosses Rogan Road into Church Road intersection. And that's an issue, again, I raise year after year after year and nothing is done about it. 19th Avenue, Brighton, both sides from the corner of 19th and Flinders Bray drainage is unable to cope with normal water flow. Murphy Road, Zilmia, floods during heavy rain inundated with flood water and sewage. Craig Street, Brighton, the open drain has not been cleaned out for five years. In Clayton Street, no drainage between the backyards and Flinders Parade. Uh, the drainage is very poor. And now, despite new drains being installed in other locations, it's caused problems further up. And therein lies the problem. This administration doesn't put enough into the basics in the suburbs. We're not seeing enough in terms of maintenance of existing pipes and uh, drains. And we're not seeing enough investment into new infrastructure. We're a rapidly growing city that is seeing thousands and thousands of people move here. We're seeing unprecedented, unprecedented levels of development in Brisbane, but we're seeing a lack of funding. So we're seeing the highest rates in 10 years and the lowest increase in drainage funding um, that we've also seen in 10 years' time. Something doesn't add up here. Something doesn't add up here. It's like the LNP doesn't even think there was a flood and doesn't think that that's possible again. Now, sure, we mightn't have next, hopefully not next summer, uh, something that uh, dumps 1,400 millimetres of rain in three days. But for most of these concerns that people have been raising year on year on year, it doesn't take those kind of weather events. We know they're getting worse. We know we need more investment in our suburbs in terms of um, suburban drainage and the basics. But we also know, as part of this equation of what's gone wrong, is that the LNP have lost touch and the LNP simply don't care. I mean, the Lord Mayor is happy to stand up and be proud of a $1.7 billion bill for the Bendy Bus Metro project, but can only find $2 million for extra drainage projects in this budget. No. Something doesn't add up here, uh, and the problem in this equation is the LNP every single time. Point of order, Mr Chair. Sorry, point of order, Councillor. Uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor. Sorry, I'd just make to like to make a point of clarification uh, because I don't like offending anybody in this place. I just wanted for Councillor Shree on the minutes of the 8th of March 2022 in the Hansard where Councillor Shree said, I am more of an anarchist than a socialist. That's where we were getting that comments from. So we didn't mean to offend Councillor Shree. Um, further debate. Councillor Johnston. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I rise to speak on program three. Um, and I agree with elements of certainly what... Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor. Uh, we're still speaking to the amendment. Yes. Oh, all right. Well, yes, I'll, I'll speak to the... Sorry, yes, I'll, I'll speak to the amendment. Thank you so much. Um, very happy to speak to the amendment. Um, and, and it is very nice to see the Labor Party joining me in the quest for better drainage around the city. Uh, and uh, I do think this is a very good amendment and I'm very happy to support it. Um, because I think without question, I've been a lone voice uh, for the past uh, decade plus um, about drainage. And largely that was um, a, a product of what happened in 2011 in my ward. And uh, that uncovered 
um, the absolute neglect by this administration of investment in flood mitigation and drainage around this city. And every single year since then, I've moved amendments um, within uh, the budget to improve uh, drainage, within uh, the PIP, the LGIP, the city plan, um, and pretty much any other time that uh, either policy or funding initiatives come up where we can improve drainage. Um, I don't think $5 million is even close to enough. Um, when you spend, uh, it's certainly a good start, but when you're going to spend um, $17 million on a cycling track, um, but barely anything extra on investing in drainage in this city, um, there is something wrong with your priorities. And that is the fundamental issue with this LNP administration. They have lost their way. They are funding the wrong priorities and they are ignoring the overwhelming <coughs> concerns of residents in this city. Now, um, it's only uh, post this flood uh, that I've come across probably one of the worst situations I think I've ever seen with respect to a drainage program, a uh, drainage project in um, Oxley, uh, and it's at the end of Logan Avenue. Um, unfortunately, uh, the drain is completely blocked up. Uh, it's partially an enclosed drain and then it's a, an open spoon drain running out to Oxley Creek. Um, the enclosed drain is completely blocked up. The spoon drain running out to Oxley Creek is full of um, construction waste, dead vegetation, drums of unknown types. Um, and this is on a property. Uh, uh, this is in a public, sorry, this is a public easement of council that has been privately fenced off um, to prevent uh, council maintenance of this drain. Um, it's in an area where council has um, taken years to try and get action from the private property owner and council stopped taking action. Meanwhile, this is a community that floods and floods badly and their drains don't work. We will never know how much that contributed um, to the extent of the flood in Logan Avenue because it flooded into second storeys down there and they've got fully blocked drains. Now that's not uncommon in my area. In Yoronga, and I know the Lord Mayor knows this, this council uh, residents have been campaigning now for some time to try and get creeks through private property that were illegally dammed unblocked. Council in the 90s knew it was a problem and did nothing about it. In the 2000s, they knew there was a problem and didn't do anything about it. In the 2010s, I raised it because it was raised with me for the first time as a councillor, and council did nothing about it. And in the 2020s, it's being raised again, and council refused to do anything about it. Uh, it is just unacceptable that this administration refuses to invest in the necessary stormwater drainage um, to ensure that this city can function effectively. Um, we know, we know <clears throat> that they are not doing this properly, and this is back to Councillor Shree's point about how the corrupt processes within this council work. In 2001, this council did a, a big drainage study in Yoronga and looked at um, what needed to happen to improve the drainage in Yoronga in 2001. That report, which is on my website, said that there should be no further infill development in Yoronga until the drainage is improved. Now, Council have ignored that. Um, they've intensified the development in uh, Yoronga West. Um, they've taken every single drainage project off the LGIP, every single one of them. And in the PIP and the two LGIPs that have come through, we've campaigned hard to keep this drainage uh, on the uh, on council's drainage infrastructure, and it's been removed by the LNP, by the LNP, and as they like to tell you over and over again in here, they control 70% of what happens in the city. The rest of the city, you don't deserve attention or support. The lack of investment in drainage in this city runs from um, roads where the camber of the road doesn't actually fall towards the stormwater drain that might be there, so water blocks the road. That's Fairfield. 
Um, that's 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 Yeronga. That happens every time it rains. We get massive pooling. That's Graceville Avenue. These are main roads that carry thousands of vehicles a day. And the drainage that's there doesn't work because it wasn't built to drain back to the gully pits. Then you get um, areas like um, <clears throat> I'm sorry, then you get areas like Oxley Road. This is an arterial road that carries 30,000 vehicles, 33,000 vehicles a day. In heavy rain, it is cut um, at Oxley, near the golf course, every single time. And that can be multiple times a year. The drains aren't being maintained, um, the sewers collapsed. You use out there now trying to fix the big sewerage problem that's happened. This is the first time in the 14 years I've been here, and I only inherited this area in the last election, that I've seen the drains properly cleaned out and it's taken a major flood. They'll be back to being not looked after and not properly maintained by this administration with, by the end of the year. I'll, I should take a photo now for the before photo and the after photo. That's a main road in Brisbane that is cut, that is cut once or twice a year without fail because it's not built to manage flood immunity. Then, of course, um, you know, you've got the streets in my area that flood because the water backs up and it can't get away um, because of the bad planning decisions made by this administration and the failure to act um, in the drainage investment needed uh, to manage the water flows. When you build more houses, you create more hard stand. The rain falls on the hard stand. It runs off in increased velocity uh, and it runs off uh, in, in much higher volume uh, because it can't be soaked into the ground. That hits the drain that Clem built 60 years ago and it cannot cope. All over this city, this administration has failed to invest in stormwater drainage. It is absolutely the most negligent part of what this administration has done in this city, is its failure to invest in stormwater drainage. They are whacking in um, developments for their developer mates left, right and centre, and you cannot get stormwater drainage upgrade. It's taken over 18 months to get council to investigate a major problem in Yurong Pili in South Street, and I don't even think the officers have listed it yet, despite repeated requests. So this administration knows where the problems are. They refuse to invest in them. They refuse to list them for capital works. They're on never, never lists that never get done. The LGIP doesn't support development, and it's going to be exacerbated by what we're going to discuss in the program later today, and I look forward to that, Councillor Allen, by this inane suggestion by the Lord Mayor that we're just going to start building now um, residential in industrial areas. Um, there's no uh, LGIP support for this. Um, there's no planning controls on this. Uh, there's no drainage to support it. The areas flood, and you are just going to be building into um, commercial areas in some of the worst flooded parts of the city without proper planning and drainage controls. This administration has categorically failed the people of Brisbane when it comes to drainage. They are absolutely liable for the ongoing problems that happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I asked Councillor Davis whether or not Council was going to check every drain uh, after the floods, and she wasn't even sure. She was not even sure. It should be, yes, Councillor, every single enclosed drain and open drain is going to be checked to make sure it's not broken, it's functional and it's clear. Stand up and give that, uh, stand up and give that commitment today so we can hold you to it, because I can see them all over my ward where they are not. Further debate? Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for morning tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councils have left the meeting. Seconded. Moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that Council now adjourn for morning tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting and the doors are closed. All in favour say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it.
Yes, boy. Councillors, further debate on the amendment. Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Uh, yeah, I'd like to speak in support of this amendment. Um, just picking up on a couple of Councillor Johnson's comments, I'm, I made, made this comment to her in the break, but I, I do think there are different ways of advocating, and I, I think it's probably fair to say that the Labor and Greens councillors have also been advocating quite strongly for more spending on drainage infrastructure across the city, but perhaps through different channels. Or um, I did want to acknowledge and, and thank the administration for finally putting the, a bit of funding into that Ordenshaw Street um, drainage project. I don't actually know whether that was Councillor Davies or the, or the Lord Mayor or perhaps Councillor Marks who made that decision, but um, it was a, a real relief to see that, um, to see that funded in, in, in the budget this time round. Um, that's, yeah. I, I don't actually know what QRRF stands for. If anyone wants to let me know. Um, it's there in brackets next to the name of the drainage project. But um, it is, it, yeah, I think you might be right. Anyway, it's, um, it is good to see that there, and I want to acknowledge that um, the administration is putting, putting funding towards that project, and similarly that uh, they're putting funding towards the Colchester Street drainage project down in South Brisbane, which is almost half a million dollars. Uh, so I, I, I don't want to be too critical on this front, because, but the, the deeper problem remains, which is just simply that there's not enough money to go around for all the infrastructure projects that we need, and, and drainage in general across the city, I think, is being underinvested in. It's, it's very easy politically to put a lot of money into road expansions because they're very visible. You can get a positive media story about it. Um, drainage infrastructure, on the other hand, is, is not very sensational or sexy, and so like, there's there's not mu not as much political capital to be won from investing big in drainage infrastructure, and as as a result, I think um, the city misses out on a lot of drainage projects, which really ought to have happened many years ago. Um, so I do support this motion of putting an extra five mil towards additional drainage construction, and I think. Program 8 uh, is, a, is a good place to take that money from because there's a lot of waste in that program, and I won't talk about that now, but um, there's a lot of stuff that's, a lot of money spent in Program 8 that I think could be spent more efficiently and is probably a little bit superfluous or wasteful. Um, yeah, that's, it, it actually probably seems like one of the programs that is most worthwhile to redirect funding away from. Um, I have my own views about what that extra five million of drainage construction work should go towards. I'm sure there's all the councillors on this side of the chamber would have a long list of projects that need funding. Um, but yeah, happy to support this motion and I, I, I would genuinely encourage the administration to think about how you can put more money into drainage infrastructure in, in future years. The, um, I think the, I've heard some people, in, including the mayor, say, oh look, you can invest in more in drainage won't stop flooding. We get that. We, we, we understand that. We're not saying that investing in drainage infrastructure is going to magically relocate all the low-lying homes from out of the floodplain. We know that, I think probably, I, I know more than most people how we can't control um, the natural rhythms of the river just through more expensive engineering solutions, where a bit of flooding is inevitable in this city. But uh, at the very least, we should be minimising the impacts by investing in, in infrastructure. And my view is that localised targeted investments are a better use of that money than some of the larger mega projects that we tend to fritter away a lot of cash on. The um, Council Cassidy's points about the, the little stuff like uh, bioretention basins and, um, uh, and the, the different kind of natural filtration systems that can divert uh, waste and, and pollutants from waterways I think is really important. That's something that this administration has really overlooked for many years. Um, and I would, I would offer the suggestion, particularly to Councillor Murphy and to Councillor Wines, that when you're evaluating some of the larger transport projects you're working on, just ask whether the, instead of the standard stormwater drainage grates, they can put in a little bioretention grate instead. There's, um, it was pretty disappointing when the Lytton Road project happened. We just shot through a few requests saying, look, can you just have some recess recessed garden beds here so that the stormwater will filter through the garden bed before it washes down into the, into the waterway? Um, 
and it, even that was considered too radical at the time, um, even though developers were already doing that down on King Street uh, in Councillor Howard's ward. There are some really, really good examples of um, low cost but high, high return drainage solutions where you can use natural processes to clean the water before it enters creek and, and river systems, and you can also slow down floodwaters so that even if the same volume of water is falling on a catchment, it's not flowing as fast, it's not rising as quickly, and it um, does less damage to the surrounding infrastructure and surrounding private homes. So I, I think it's partly a question of how much money we invest in uh, drainage infrastructure, and I don't think we're putting enough into it, but it's also a question of how we use that money most efficiently. And there's been a big shift in kind of hydrological and, and, and engineering circles over the last few years where people have recognised that the old school approaches of just building big, giant concrete circles and um, slamming them through as tunnels under, underground isn't always the best way to manage floodwaters and stormwater. Um, and the council's taken some really positive steps in this direction. We see an example of that with Han Hanlon Park, which is <laughs> often described as a park upgrade project, but really it's a very good drainage project and, and deserves to be celebrated. And it would be great to see more of that kind of thinking where we do, don't just rely on hard infrastructure and more concrete culverts and drains, but we also look at how we can use the natural contours of the land to slow down flood water, to hold it in place in certain areas where it's safe to do so, um, and, and to allow and to encourage designs that allow more water to, to seep into the ground rather than flowing across it. Uh, and and I think there's yeah there's a lot of potential there, and I'm I'm excited to to see the city take a, a step in that direction down the track. But for now, I'm yeah, happy to support this motion because I think it's a common sense move to put a bit more m money into additional drainage construction across the city. Thanks. Further debate? Uh, Councillor Davis. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chair. We will not be supporting the motion. This administration has increased our drainage and stormwater budget by double. There will be double the spend that there was last year. And we take our guidance from a few things. Uh, one, the LGIP, but of course we rely on our engineers and our officers to identify locations where drainage is uh, best uh, placed uh, in terms of new drainage. Uh, and so we will continue to look for that professional advice uh, and experience when we move forward with our, with our program. Mr Chair, this is very exciting to know that we've got this additional funding going into uh, suburbs around um, our city, and it was great to hear some of those uh, projects that, were, that we've talked about in the budget, uh, and I announced uh, in the information sessions. What is disappointing to hear, though, is Councillor Johnston being a bit tricky with her words. Uh, a response was given to Councillor Johnston, uh, and that is that we are, uh, we are investigating those, um, those flood-damaged uh, drainage sites. Uh, we have we have several thousand kilometres of drains running across this city. It's a big exercise. Around 320 kilometres of drainage was damaged during the recent event. So the work is being undertaken at the moment. Uh, there is, whilst I was not able to provide a figure on Friday to Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, I can advise you that there's around 34 per cent of the drains have been inspected to date, and that work uh, will go uh, will be ongoing. Uh, the officers are working very hard under enormous um, pressure from the event, and uh, it's very disappointing to always uh, have to stand and. Um, defend our officers to the allegations and the assertions that come uh, from across from the and I'd like to place on records my thank for the work thanks to the work that the officers are doing um, in this uh, in this regard mr. chair it's easy to come in here and just chuck a figure on the table and say we want this amount of money to go into a particular program councillor Cassidy is very good at coming in and just uh, chucking stuff out there for debate without any backing. $5 million um, as an amount. We've just heard from Councillor Shree, who said, I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree with, with where that $5 million, I should say, would go. Well, let me tell you, $131 million is being invested uh, this year 
in drainage works. We live on a floodplain in the city. Drainage is one of the a suite of tools we do to manage uh, as a flood mitigation um, response. We will continue to look at uh, those priority areas as identified um, by our council officers and deliver for the, for the residents of Brisbane uh, in this regard. Further debate? No further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I'll uh, sum up. And it is, is disappointing um, to hear the administration won't support um, this amendment because what this would do, what this would do for this year, this year only, and we're saying this is an extraordinary year, although we would like to see a lot more money spent on drains, and I know Councillor Johnson and Tree and Labor councillors would in an ongoing way, and it's something we do advocate for. But there's an opportunity here today to say, uh, let's make suburban drainage a priority instead of advertising. Let's make you know, the installation of some new gully traps or some bioretention basins, as Councillor Shree says, or, or, or doing some basic maintenance on our open and enclosed drains, uh, not ones that have been flood damaged, and I'll come to that figure that Councillor Davis talked about. Um, instead of advertising the Lord Mayor, maybe this year we should put that money into suburban drainage. But we just heard from the LNP that their priorities are their political advertising instead of suburban drainage. Now, Councillor Davis um, said, oh, we just go and chuck a figure and it's not backed up by anything. Well, that figure, that figure is the advertising budget. That figure is living in Brisbane in corporate comms. So it's not just chucked a figure. And, and we know, and Council, I'll take Councillor Davis's sort of interjection then, uh, council officers know where those maintenance jobs and where those new drainage jobs are. They have lists of them, Councillor Davis. So I trust the council officers um, to identify where that extra $5 million should be spent across our city. Across our city. And our Councillor Davis just said, no, nope, shook her head. Uh, I presume she doesn't trust uh, council officers then. Uh, because I do. Because I do. I do. Uh, Councillor Davis. Now, and, and, on, and on, this, on this spurious point, on this spurious point about, um, about um, uh, you know, apparently we attack council officers because there's not enough of them, because there's not enough of them. The, real, the reality is we support council officers so much, we don't want to see their jobs contracted out. We don't want to see our workforce split up between some temporary labour hire workers working alongside some council officers working in temporary roles and then alongside some full-time officers as well doing ongoing work. And this is a perfect example. We wouldn't be only 34 per cent of the way through inspecting these flood damaged sites after four months if we had a properly resourced council workforce. If we didn't see the, continue, the continual casualisation and the continued contracting out of our basic council workforce, we would see this work being done more efficiently and being done in-house by hard-working council officers. Uh, so that, that doubling, that doubling so-called doubling of the budget uh, is absolute rubbish. Uh, at what we heard during the information sessions uh, is that there is flood repair work happening this year. When you drill down into the numbers, and again, you know, we can only take them for what's written down in the, in the um, information purposes document. They're not, part of the They're not part of the budget, of course, Councillor Johnston, but there's only a $2 million increase for the construction and rehabilitation of drainage and stormwater. So the figures that Councillor Davis has got are based on a guess. That $131 million, according to Councillor Cunningham, the finance chair, is a guess. And we've just had that confirmed again today because only 34 per cent of our drainage assets have been inspected. Yep. So how did she land at that $131 million figure? And how did they land at a $660 million figure? Well, as we know over debate, we've discovered over the last two days, a day and a half, is that this administration is at best guessing their way through this budget. They're guessing which projects might need funding. They're guessing they're guessing, they're guessing, yeah, the Chief Financial Officer said it, at best it's an educated guess on what things might need to be repaired or what things might not need to be repaired. Uh, so this would be real money. This is not a guess money. This would be allocating money from the Lord Mayor's political advertising budget into constructing drainage. Uh, so uh, I don't understand why LNP councils really don't want to see that. And we've talked about, you know, there's a desperate need for drainage in LNP wards right around the city, and I don't know how they can go out to their communities now after having 
voted on this amendment and say, LNP councillors say, their priority is advertising over drainage in this budget, because that's what you'll be committing to if you vote against this amendment. A budget is fundamentally a statement of a leader's priorities and values, and it is very clear that the LNP and their leader, LNP Mayor Adrian Schrinner. Point of order, Mr Chair. <coughs> Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Will um, Councillor um, Cassidy take a question? I've got five seconds left, so I don't think I'll have time. OK. So th this budget is a statement of this LNP Mayor's priorities. His priorities are himself over the people of Brisbane. I will now put the amendment. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. A division has been called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Strunk. Councillors, eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clarks, could you please read the results? Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being five in favour and 16 against. The motion is lost. We will now return to the debate on program three. Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I, ri uh, I rise to speak on Program 3 of Srinagar Council's 2022-2023 budget, Clean, Green and Sustainable City. Uh, Mr Acting Chair, after hearing the, uh, the, from the opposite, opposite side, from the real opposition leader and the, the nominal opposition leader and the self-proclaimed opposition leader's uh, words, they are just trying to find their way back to political relevance, as the Lord Mayor said. And uh, yeah, but I think I think more importantly is this is the budget debate, and I think we need to go back to uh, getting on with the job and talk on the substance of this budget and what we can deliver for the people of Brisbane. So, uh, Mr. Acting Chair, I'd like to start by using this opportunity to thank our Lord Mayor, Councillor Adrian Shrina, and the Civic Civic Cabinet Chair for the program, Councillor Davis, for their great work in delivering for our suburbs in the area of environment and parks. Mr. Acting Chair, despite uh, relevant constraints caused by the pa pandemic and the stone event earlier this year, the Lord Mayor and Council Davis have continued to support our suburbs with the funding and delivery of important environmental and park assets for our city. This budget contains lots of good news for the residents of McGregor Ward that I just can't wait to share with the Chamber. Mr. Acting Chair, normally when people ask how many suburbs are uh, in McGregor Ward, the colloquial answer from me was it, it was from Robertson to Rochdale. But the fact is, McGregor Ward actually goes all the way to Burbank and borders with Redland City. Burbank is a hidden gem in our city. It is part of Brisbane's Green Belt with great natural reserves. In this year's budget, $313,000 is allocated to Alperton Road Park, Burbank, for the replacement of the culvert across Priest Gully. Due to damage in stone events from 2019 to 2021, this is the only all-weather access to the western side of Alperton Road Park 
and if completely lost in another storm event, it will remove emergency and fire access to parts of the reserve. The design has completed in uh, 2021 to 20, uh, sorry, 2020 to 2021 financial year, and uh, this will go towards meeting council's obligation under the Fire and Emergency Services Act, um, Queensland 1990. Mr. Acting Chair, funding is also allocated for the community street tree planting events in Rochdale. The community street pla tree planting program supports local residents to help cool their neighborhood, improving community pride, and help beautif beautify their streets. It was a great success in 2021 to 22, with over 2,500 stems planted with the assistance of the community. And $80,000 has been allocated to Rochdale uh, in this budget, with a total of $480,000 across all community street tree planting sites. And Mr. Acting Chair, the Srina Council continues to create more to see and do in a clean and green city by creating new local park in Besser Street, Magrega. To support residential growth in Magrega and in response to finding findings in the Mangravet Corridor Neighborhood Plan, a new park has been planned in Besa Street. The new park will provide the growing residential community with a much needed green space with shady spots to have lunch and enjoy the outdoors, as well as areas for re recreational and community activities. $253,000 is allocated in this budget for detailed design, documentation, and procurement for this new local recreation park with construction proposed in 2023-24. Last Friday, I had the pleasure of joining the Lord Mayor in meeting the Fisher family at the newly built Fisher family park in Rochdale. Mm -hmm. It was part of Lord Mayor's commitment for the Rochdale residents and a way to honor one of the original landowners. This budget contained the funding to manage the maintenance and defects period post-construction for previous year completed projects. Mr. Acting Chair, before I go into the most exciting part of, of the um, part project for McGregor Award in this year's budget, I would like to once again thank the Lord Mayor and Council Davis for the funding for, water, for waterway projects in McGregor Award. Since witnessing overland flow from both Bulimba Creek and Mimosa Creek back, back in 2013, I have put in budget requests for waterway treatments, either desilt, remove weeds, or clear the debris in the waterways. And I'm proud to say because of the continuous effort in the past years, McGregor Award was immune from the overland flow in this year's storm event. This year, we continue to invest in works in Bulimba Creek uh, along Pedestal Road, Amal Plains, and Mimosa Creek along Thermal, Thermal Street, McGregor. The proposed works involve vegetation management within major waterways to restore flood conveyance capacity and enhance the environmental values of the waterways with the introduction of native vegetation instead of weeds. Mr. Acting Chair, in 2019, I've delivered a bike, bike pump track in DM Henderson, Henderson Park in Magrega. And it is so well used and loved by the kids, parents, bike riders, and scooters. The only complaint I've received from the community was that it gets so popular during the weekends and, and holidays, they had to queue to play it. Mr. Acting Chair, I'd like to share a great news with the Chamber. DM Henderson is currently const constructing an off-road skills track for riders of varying abilities to complement the existing BMX track at DM Henderson Park. Construction has begun in May, and we are expecting completion in July, weather and site conditions permitting. The project is part of the uh, Brisbane off-road cycling strategy that will create more to see and do in a clean and green Brisbane. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Councillor Cunningham. I remember she, uh, it was what she was the chair who, initi who initiated that uh, off-road uh, cycling strategy. And of course, I'd like to thank Councillor Davis for the continuing delivery of this program. The track will offer an off-road experience for riders of all ages and get more people into nature having fun and getting fit and healthy. The DM Henderson Off-Road Skill Track is part of the, uh, the Brisbane Off-Road Cycling Strategy that was released late in 2021. The strategy is part of Council's commitment to keep our city clear and green to ensure Brisbane remains a livable and sustainable city for our children, families, and future generations. 
The strategy identified short-term and long-term opportunities for developing off-road cycling facility across Brisbane, including in existing parks and fire, fire trails. The strategy was developed following consultation with key stakeholder groups and the wider Brisbane community for their ideas for future off-road cycling opportunities. The final strategy was released in late 2021 following extensive consultation. The strategy provides an overview of how Council will deliver off-road cycling opportunities moving forward. And uh, in addition, um, the DM Henderson Park off-road skill track will deliver a new off-road cycling track for riders of varying abilities. And uh, the track will locate near the existing BMX pump track to complement um, this facility. And the off-road track will use natural elements like sandstone blocks and hardwood to create an off-road experience. And the new off-road skill track will deliver a facility that caters to all different rider abilities, from easy to difficult to provide balance and agility challenges for riders. And the facility will also incorporate three individual tracks, showcasing a wide range of obstacles. Tracks will be marked by the colors white, which is, means for the easy entrance level, blue, which is moderate, and, uh, and black hard, I suppose that's for professional riders. The white or easy runs will cater uh, to beginner riders and uh, use black stone, black stone paving, sandstone blocks, and a hardwood balance, balance beam. <coughs> the blue or moderate run will cater to intermediate riders and include raised rocks or boulder path, sandstone blocks, and raised hardwood balance beam. And the black or hard run will cater for advanced riders and include a raised rock and or boulder path raised sandstone blocks and a raised hardwood balance beam. The project will also include a new third track connecting the existing BMX pump track to the new off-road skill track to create seamless transition to off-road cycling. And the council committed to keep the local community informed of construction in the area and will provide advance notification to the community ahead of any works commencing. Council is proactively engaged directly with the neighboring residents and key stakeholders to inform them about the project. Council is also committed to minimize any impact on environment during construction and does not expect there will be any significant environmental impacts associated with this project. All work will be carried out in accordance with the relevant environmental guidelines and Council will make every effort to minimize environmental impacts during construction. And, uh, I see it, my time's up, so I would like to thank Council Davis and Lord Mayor, and I commend the program to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor. Further debate? Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chair. I rise to speak on, uh, of course, Program 3, Clean, Green, and Sustainable City. And, um, you know, when I read those sort of words, I, I think we're really here to try to create a living environment, uh, a living environment for, our, of course, our residents, our uh, fauna and flora. Um, some of that's introduced, of course, uh, from other parts of the world, but uh, we're here to, uh, to achieve that goal, I believe, um, and it's a goal that's uh, very important, uh, as, especially with the, uh, with the issue of climate change. Now, since I've been here, uh, since I came to this uh, chamber uh, in 2016, uh, there have been a number of programs in, in, this, uh, in this program and in other programs as well that are uh, trying to uh, deal with, uh, with, that, uh, with climate change, basically. Um, but nothing has really been added since 2016, except, of course, for the, uh, the what I call FOGO light um, trial uh, that's uh, been undertaken over the last 12 months. And I say light simply because it's not a full FOGO like uh, 70 other um, um, councils around Australia. Uh, have been uh, have been working on and uh, have been delivering, um, especially if, if you have a look at the um, city of Penrith uh, for the last 12 years, and that's a full full fogo. And as 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 my uh, as the leader of the opposition said, uh, if if you want to reduce carbon emissions right uh, into the atmosphere, fogo is the way to go. You won't achieve it any other way um, as quickly as a fogo. Now, the Lord Mayor said uh, there's no other carbon neutral city in Australia, uh, especially our scale. 
Uh, and he would love to see, a, you know, a state, um, a, a, a state department or a federal department. Well, how about a whole state? How about the state of Tasmania? They're carbon negative. Now, he didn't bother to mention that. I wonder why. I wonder why he didn't mention that. And how did they achieve that? Well, you can Google it and have a look. It's there in an article that was printed a couple of weeks ago. And I was quite interested in that. And of course, uh, um, uh, it's, it's something that is achievable. Uh, it's achievable for any city uh, or any state uh, in this country if you have the passion to actually try to achieve that goal. And, and if we don't achieve carbon negative, right, climate change will, be even it will come even quicker. And carbon negative is, is what our goal should be now, not just carbon neutral, all right? So um, with that, I'll, I'll move on to uh, some of the other uh, events or programs, I should say, when it comes to uh, uh, trying to reduce our uh, carbon footprint. Uh, of course, we have the Green Heart Sustainability Events. Now, they, there's those events, I think there's only a couple events a year in targeted wards. If you were really serious about this issue, right, in trying to educate the, the greater population of Brisbane, you would have multiple events every year uh, on this issue. Um, we do a little bit in my ward office uh, when we go out to uh, out to some events because we've been able to uh, uh, attract some of that uh, some of that material, and uh, most people are very willing to take it. Actually, um, even I mean probably the kids more than the adults. Um, so listen, our schools are doing a terrific job educating kids in regards to the environmental issues that we are. Uh, having to deal with in the city and, and around the world. Um, so we just have to reinforce that and, and educate them even more, especially the adults, um, especially when it comes to um, uh, recycling those, uh, those uh, food scraps uh, from, from our kitchens uh, into a worm farm or a compost bin, uh, or even to, how about a photo right across Brisbane? That would be phenomenal. It's something that we can make money out of as well. So it's sustainable, it's very sustainable, uh, and we should really, uh, instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars on green bridges, which are fine, but it should, that should not be the priority. The priority should be a system like FOGA. That's where you should be spending hundreds of millions of dollars to develop that because we are the biggest city uh, you know, what, 450,000 uh, units of accommodation, uh, residential, uh, that's a lot of, uh, that's a lot of FOGO. And uh, I think, uh, I think, and we could probably sell that right throughout Southeast Queens of the, uh, the that, um, and, and of course, as the leader of the opposition, uh, Councillor Cassie said, uh, it's really a, a system that's uh, um, something that we could actually sell carbon credits uh, to other, other, entities uh, around Australia and probably even around the world. Now, I, I mentioned carbon credits and of course we're spending $10 million again this year on carbon credits. Um, and um, I, I came across that probably in the 2016. I thought, what's this carbon credit stuff? And, and, I, and I still think it's something that we shouldn't really be spending um, ratepayers' money on buying carbon credits for other people that are doing the work. Um, for, uh, for the environment. We should really do it ourselves, right? Um, yes, and if we have to actually buy carbon credits to achieve that uh, neutrality for a short period of time, fine, so long as it's uh, credits that are, that are, um, that are manufactured here in, in Australia. Um, because if we buy the carbon credits from overseas, and I think we're still, uh, a lot of our carbon credits is, money is still going overseas, um, it, it, we have no real, re no real capacity to verify if that work is actually being done, if those trees are actually being planted uh, somewhere in uh, Southeast Asia or China, which is, from memory, is uh, where, uh, when I asked that question some years ago, is where uh, those carbon credits are uh, being generated. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, inter it's really important that we, I think, I, I, I just encourage uh, the chair to really look at that Green Heart events, sustainability events, and try to get some more money to roll those right across. I'd love to see one event in every ward. I think that would be a good 
achievement if we could do that. Um, now, what else? The, uh, I'm just going to come to uh, that um, uh, in regards to drainage, um, because uh, I know we, we just had a debate uh, in regards to uh, some funding that uh, we would like to see put into, uh, into drainage, but I, I just wanted to focus on a drainage uh, issue uh, that I'm having in my ward and basically is most of the development in my ward when it comes to um, stormwater drainage, the creek systems are used. Uh, and I've mentioned this before, um, the creek systems are an opportunity to actually uh, get rid of stormwater, but I don't think it really should be uh, from, uh, from developments, right? Um, because they only have a certain capacity uh, and we just allow these developers um, uh, and, you know, the developers uh, are following all the rules um, uh, when it comes to uh, their drainage uh, designs and all the rest of it, being able to use the creek, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, they're trying to minimize their costs, uh, which I understand, uh, but really um, it's, it's, a sh it's short term thinking because uh, with the developments that are happening, at, at least in my ward anyways, in the Greenfield areas, uh, using those creeks, uh, and we've just had a flood uh, this year uh, that covered all three aspects of, uh, of, of the type of flooding you could have. And those creek floods um, are uh, really a worry for me. Um, I know the Foresight Development, they uh, adopted some of that creek uh, uh, drainage. Um, the, the master plan was incorporated with that, uh, those creeks. But the problem with the creeks now uh, is that they're not keeping them clean, right? Clean, green, sustainable city, right? They're not keeping them clean. And I know Councillor Marks would probably, um, uh, you know, probably not vocally agree with me here, but we had a conversation about these creeks uh, out of Duandella when uh, she first became uh, chair uh, on a visit out there. And uh, we were standing on a bridge and we were looking at this creek system and, uh, and we said, and I said, just have a look at the, the, the buildup of, uh, of uh, stuff that in this creek. I, I don't know how the water gets through. She says, I have the same problem in my ward too, she said. and uh, and and. But the problem is that the council officers say, well, you know, we can't be cleaning all these creeks uh, every time a tree falls in. Um, but, and, and, and sometimes the tree falling into the creek bed is not a bad thing because it's a habitat tree, it becomes a habitat tree. But if it's going to impede the flow of water through that creek, you've got to clean it out, right? Because guess what's going to happen? Thank goodness we don't have beavers in this city, in this city or in this country. But because I'll tell you what, Right? They're really good at damming things up with the, the leaf matter that falls into the creeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank goodness we don't have beavers. Anyways, um, so I, I, just, I just want to uh, reinforce the need that we need to keep the creeks flowing. Councillor Strunk, uh, your time has expired. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Further debate. Councillor Landers. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I rise to speak about the great ways that this program will deliver for my community this year. Uh, following the recent floods and the impact it had on waterways in my area, I am pleased to see under 3.4.2.1, wharves, jetties and pontoons, that work will be done on the Tinchy Tamba boat ramp <coughs> access pontoon in Bald Hills. There will also be under 3.3.3.2, maintain lake systems and parks project, allocation for desilting, removal of litter and debris and weed management at Canterbury Park and Harold Keeley Park in Bald Hills in both those waterways and also in the Fred Francis Park in Bracken Ridge. Under major waterways vegetation management, work will also be carried out to restore flood conveyance capacity and enhance the environmental values of the waterways with the introduction of native vegetation instead of, weed, of weeds of Cabbage Tree Creek at Gympie Road, Castledine, Harvard Court Fitzgibbon and Monash Place Fitzgibbon. Works will also be carried out at Bill Brown Reserve Fitzgibbon under 3.2.3.1 land management and remediation on sites impacted by the 2022 flood event. Fitzgibbon bushland um, is the heart of my ward chair and it, it is kind of like the lungs of our community. So <clears throat> it is a well-loved area by locals 
And so I'm very pleased to see again in this year's budget the continuation under the Conservation Reserves Management Program, the upgrade of existing fire trails to ensure all weather access and extension of the weed control program. And in keeping my community and Brisbane suburbs greener, there will be community tree planting events in Castledine. The community street tree planting program supports local residents to help cool their neighbourhood, improve community pride and help beautify their streets. And it was a great success in 2021-22 with over 2,500 stems planted with the assistance of the community. Several parks in the Brackenridge ward will also benefit from this program. Uh, there will be, uh, first of all, the first park is Macaranga Crescent Park in Castle Dine, and there will be planting, planning and design for delivery of local recreation and local sport infrastructure and a boardwalk across conservation area. There will also be lighting over the pathway that connects the bus stop uh, to, the, um, to the back streets and also in the picnic shelter. Gus Davies Park, Bald Hills, another well-loved local park for us, um, is also going to, uh, well, last year it actually um, had its Learn to Ride track installed. That was all completed and it's fast becoming uh, a very, very popular park. Within that park, uh, there is a um, dog off leash area and this budget will see the, the uh, supply and installation of dog agility equipment in this area. Um, the uh, Lacey Road Park in Castledine will also see improvements with the construction of a new path from High Bridge Circuit uh, to Rogan Road, including a culvert. Um, and with the improvements from Councillor Wine's program um, in that Lacey Road area to improve connectivity, this path also and the Lacey um, and the Karan uh, sorry Macaranga Park uh, walkways are all going to increase connectivity for all types of active travellers. Wendy Turnbull Park in Brackenridge will also receive some upgrades to non-compliant playground equipment. Um, it is a, a park that has 20-year-old uh, equipment there, so new playground um, will see will meet will mean that it will meet the current Australian standards and include Takura Softfall. And finally, Chair Aspley Rest Park in Castle Dine will also receive an upgrade of picnic facilities. And um, this will all be done in consultation with the Rotary Club of Aspley. Deputy Chair, I am so proud to be part of the Shrina Council and the work and focus on improving our parks to meet the diverse recreational and cultural needs of the community and ensuring we deliver enjoyable and safe park experiences for our residents. And I commend this program to the Chamber. Councillor, further debate? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on uh, Program 3, Clean, Green and Sustainable Brisbane. Uh, and there are a number of uh, matters that I'd like to speak to in uh, in this. I just want to make sure the the clock's not running. Uh, you're at 14 seconds at the moment, Councillor. Okay. Have you? Like, I'll restart it. Right, it's running now. Oh no, yep, it's running now. Thank you so much. Uh, look, um, there are a number of things. Uh, well, Pretty, pretty much everything this administration's doing, I think, has the wrong focus and the wrong priorities. Um, and this portfolio is one of those areas where it does uh, stick out pretty clearly. Um, uh, every year um, there are the odd bits and pieces in um, the budget for most councillors. Some years we've actually had none in Tennyson Ward. Uh, but this year there is a little bit for uh, Robinson Park, which Robinson Park would be I don't even know, 30 plus years old. It's a district level park. Um, and I've got others like this that would have play equipment that are easily that old as well. So it is good that uh, Robinson Park's being um, uh, upgraded. Uh, I suspect the barbecues and the seating at Princess Street Park where there's $54,000 are even older again. Uh, and this is a riverfront uh, district park as well. So, um, I mean, councils basically neglected parks in my area for a very long time. 
uh, and uh, you know it's it's good that there's the odd um, project because often there's just nothing for parks in my area other than the trust funds. Um, but I do want to um, speak very briefly about a number of issues. Firstly, sustainability. And this is one of those areas where council is, is I don't think, getting it right. Uh, and uh, fundamentally, this administration thinks buying carbon credits and holding a marketing fair at Chermside is how to address sustainability in um, Brisbane. Uh, this council has sort of had a little dabble in putting maybe some solar panels on top of the bus depot roofs, um, but that's about it. So there are so many things that I think this council should be focusing on, and, and I might mention some of them now, um, but the Lord Mayor is very good at stealing my ideas. Uh, you know, the, the rates rebate for uninhabitable houses, I mean, uh, something I raised here and, and they all voted to stop me making that amendment, saying I couldn't do it. The Lord Mayor said, oh, we can already do it, but no, it's in the budget this year, so good to see. But let's, let's, let me run through some of the things that I think this council should be doing when it comes to sustainability. Solar-powered lights. Um, this council refuses to put them in in our parks. If we want to do a lighting project, council refuses to put them in. No, councillor, we can't put them in. Now, um, sometimes there are trees, and I understand you can't put solar-powered lights in under trees. Um, but in most of my wards, when I request solar-powered lights, the officers say, no, we can't do solar-powered lights. I have no idea why. Um, it should not even be a question about whether there's an option. It should be that council puts in solar-powered lights for any public uh, lighting projects that we do. Um, instead, what we do do is we have to dig holes through parks and do tunnelling and we push up the cost of the projects when we could be popping in solar lights. And when I've asked, uh, it's, oh, oh, we can't, councillor, it's too expensive. Um, it's not because solar-powered uh, solar lighting would be a, a, a good improvement. Um, we should have uh, solar uh, power uh, subsidies for residents. Uh, we should have mandatory um, solar panel installation in city plan. Should be in the state government Queensland Development Plan. Uh, sorry, Queensland Development Code. Um, that every new house or block of unit should have solar panels on the roof. Um, developers we know uh, want to avoid their public space obligations by putting rooftop terraces out there, um, when what should be happening is solar panels uh, should be going on roofs to power these buildings. There should be design standards in city plan and the QDC to capture, harvest stormwater on these buildings and reuse stormwater in these large buildings. Um, and this is what should be going on in all new housing estates and development, and it does not happen. And it is both a council and a state government responsibility. Um, we should be having grants for houses to retrofit uh, stormwater, and all levels of government have a role to play uh, here, uh, not just the federal and the state government. Um, I think we should be looking at community batteries. Um, this council uh, should be looking at what it can do to support um, the objective of uh, uh, reducing our carbon footprint and uh, getting to our emissions uh, targets. Um, clearly, that's where we need to go because uh, we have to be able to power buildings and community facilities uh, when the sun is not shining, and batteries are the way to go. We, it, I mean, it should be a no-brainer. We should have a trial project, for example, at uh, the powerhouse, uh, or we should have it at one of the bus depots, and we should see what's involved and what we would do. And, and, and I suspect the Lord Mayor might try and steal this idea, um, as he's done with other ideas that I've raised, but I am on the public record. Um, we should be purchasing more green space. We should have a, a FOGO uh, scheme right across the city, and we should be looking at uh, more when it comes to converting waste to energy. When I was the deputy chair of the, um, I think it was called Field Services uh, Committee back in the day, was one of the areas that the former former Lord Mayor wanted to look into, and David McLaughlin never progressed it. Um, and it is something that this council should be looking at: um, conversion of waste into energy. And there, we do it in a small way, but we have never. Um, focused on this. So when we talk about sustainability, um, this council is not doing any of these things in an organised way, in a systemic way, in a policy way or with proper funding, and that is not good enough. Uh, 
floods. Um, <laughs> Um, I know Councillor Davis hopped up and, and, and uh, just to, in the previous debate indicated uh, that, that uh, they're getting there with the, um, the investigation of uh, what's happened uh, with the floods. Um, we are four months post the dev most biggest flood in Brisbane, four months, and this council still does not have damage assessment reports for public assets in this city. It does not have them for roads. It does not have them for parks. And as we've heard from Councillor Davis, only a third of drains, and that's just the flood damage drains, have been inspected. That is not good enough. And the problem, let, let me just put on the record what I think the problem is, this council has gutted absolutely gutted the part of council that delivers on drainage works for our city. It's done this at a time of the biggest crisis in the city's history. There's somebody sitting in Green Square in charge of drainage and they wouldn't know where a drain in Tennyson Ward is if they fell over it. And actually they fell into the Brisbane River so they'd find it hard to find them as well. It is not good enough. And it is not okay that this administration has gutted local um, service delivery parts of this council. It refuses to fund the necessary officers to do the work, and they are overwhelmed. They are overwhelmed, and it is not good enough. Um, there's uh, there's five and a half million dollars in here for flood resilient homes. We don't know what it's for. Um, these these are. I mean, it's not. It doesn't form part of the budget to start with. Um, and Councillor Davis can't tell us what it's for. Four months on, and this council cannot, cannot account for the money that it says it wants to spend fixing our city. That is not good enough. And finally, uh, drainage. Um, I, I just want to put on the record um, my concern about uh, what Councillor Davis has said here about drainage. Council's actually rolling over the one and only drainage project it funded in my ward last year. Um, and I remember, I think it was Councillor Cunningham got up, and when I said they're not doing any drainage projects in my ward, I remember this, she made a big deal about saying how there was one, which was Christensen Street. Well, guess what, Councillor Cunningham? You cut it. In your budget review, you didn't deliver the one and only project in a part of the ward that floods really badly and would have flooded um, with localised flooding in that heavy rain. You cut it. Your administration, you, when you moved the third budget review just a few weeks ago. And guess what? Now you're trying to fund it again. So these rollovers and carryovers that allegedly form part of the record level expenditure that Councillor Davis is talking about is because you cannot manage the drainage budget for this city. The volume of rollovers and carryovers, you cut $13 million out of a $30 million budget just a few weeks ago, and you're not even refunding all of that. There's a guess in here about how much stormwater drainage um, flood recovery is going to be, because you haven't done the work to tell us what it's, uh, the extent of it, and you haven't even funded the amount that you cut last year in this year's budget to keep up, to keep up with what you cut last year. That is not good enough. I've got projects in every single ward in my city that need funding in uh, Sherwood, Yoronga, Yoronga-Pilly, Fairfield, Oxley, Councilor Corinda. Councillor Johnston, your time has expired. Further debate? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, I also to rise to speak on uh, program three. And uh, may I start off by uh, thanking Councillor Davis for the birthday wishes. Uh, I have been able to keep this cat in the bag for the past seven years, but unfortunately, as Acting Chair of City Standards, I'm afraid our uh, pest management team won't be able to get that cat back in the bag. So I do want to I do want to thank Councillor Davis for letting that cat out of the bag. Uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, can I start off um, just by saying thank you to all the officers during. February's recent flood event. I did do an acknowledgement to them during the info sessions, uh, and I would like to get on the record uh, my thanks, the thanks of Councillor Wines, and with your indulgence, your thanks 
as well, uh, because we do know that our little part of the world was uh, pretty heavily impacted during February's event. And uh, to say that that has not been recognised in this year's budget uh, would be an understatement, Mr Deputy Chair. I, I do want to uh, thank Councillor Davis and the Lord Mayor uh, for some telemetry gauges which are going into Anoga Creek. And Mr Deputy Chair, those telemetry gauges which will monitor the ebb and flow of Anogra Creek uh, would be benefiting suburbs such as Ashgrove, Newmarket, Kelvin Grove, Hurston and Wilston. Uh, and we do know, uh, as you would Deputy Chair, and Councillor Wines also knows, uh, that in most of those cases, this part of Anogra Creek went above the 1970 floor flood marker. So the, the new telemetry gauges are very much warranted and uh, on behalf of a grateful community I want to pass on, on our thanks uh, because we do know that that will add very, very important information to the creek network uh, data capture. Uh, the only gauge that I know of in that part of the creek at the moment is currently uh, at Bancroft Park, Mr Deputy Chair, and that sits above the weir. So that's uh, somewhat protected by the weir on Nogra Creek, and we do know that you sort of you don't get a very accurate meterage uh, above the creek level at that one. So the new ones are very, very much appreciated. Uh, Mr. Deputy Chair, also in my ward, there are a number of parks uh, and recreation spaces that were impacted by the floods, and those in particular are the Ashgrove Sports Grounds. Uh, Sunset Park Ashgrove, um, Capera Picnic Ground and the Upper Kedron Recreation Reserve. Now the one thing that these four parks have in common are that they are former landfill sites. Uh, three of those used to be quarries. So we do know that when you dig a hole in the ground, water flows into it. So I do appreciate uh, the work that's going to be done to remediate those, those sites there. And if I may point out, the one that I am especially looking forward to is the Capera Picnic Ground. Now, the Capera Picnic Ground is probably, well, it's not probably, it is. It's the most successful sports precinct that I know of. In that one precinct, we have the Fernie Grove Fireballs, which is a cricket club. Uh, we have the Phoenix Netball. We have a bridge club. We have an AFL club. We have a bowling green. We have the Fernie Grove Flyers, which is a, a drone slash remote aircraft club are flying in that space and they all get along. So the work that's going into this, this area is going to benefit so many clubs uh, and community groups in that area and I'm very, very grateful to Councillor Davies and the Lord Mayor for that. Um, despite what the opposition says, Mr Deputy Chair, um, we do put a lot of work into our bushland acquisition. And I'm happy to say that uh, since I've been councillor uh, for the Gap Ward, uh, which is now seven years, um, we've acquired 64 hectares of bushland in that space. Now that bushland sits in between Capera, uh, the Gap and Upper Kedron. And a lot of work is going into getting rid of and eradicating weed species in that area that all that land used to be privately owned. And I know when Bettina came and saw me to dispose of that land, it was getting too much for her. She was, you know, approaching her 70s. She couldn't do it. So she's very grateful that that land is now in the custodianship of the city and that it's being looked after by the outstanding officers uh, in our organisation and that the weeds are being reduced uh, and that the bush life that is there is being looked after. And I really want to pass on my thanks uh, to Stephen Schumacher and his team for looking after that. That is a wonderful space. I do know there's uh, a lot of community groups that go through there, including my group. As president of Men of the Trees, we continually walk through there quite often and look and monitor the species of trees and the regrowth that's happening in that space. And I know Stephen does a great job at looking after that area. Uh, Mr Deputy Chair, one of the most exciting suburban projects uh, 
I'm looking forward to delivering is uh, the Greening Ashgrove project, which is aimed at preserving 175-year-old historic bunya pines in Glen Lyon Drive. Now, we've lost two of the bunya pines recently um, to disease. One was replaced, uh, and it was trucked in on the back of a truck. And uh, for those councillors who are, who are, sorry? As you do, yeah. As you do, big 16-wheeler comes in, drops it in the ground, and then strolls off again. Um, but it, it's a great project, and the residents of Glen Lyon Drive are very appreciative that we are going to uh, look after this particular historic drive, and we're going to rejuvenate the soil, because one of the problems that the bunyas are facing in that particular part of Ashgrove is the nutrients within the soil and the water is not getting down to the root ball, and we are going to address that and keep these historic trees alive. For those who want to come out to, to Ashgrove, and I know Councillor Cunningham has, uh, to have a look, those bunya trees can be seen from just about everywhere in Ashgrove. Uh, they are a significant landmark, they are a, a significant marker on the horizon line, uh, and they are worth preserving, and I'm very, very grateful uh, that we are going to address that and make sure that these bunya pines are actually living ancient trees in our suburb for a long, long time to come. Mr Deputy Chair, uh, we heard a few of previous speakers before me um, speak on tree planting. And I would have to say that uh, in this budget, we're going back to Upper Kedron uh, to install some more trees as a community tree planting. Now, the tree plantings that I have done in this part of the, the ward before have been extremely successful. Fernie Grove State High has gotten involved, the community has gotten involved, um, the Lions Club of Ashgrove, the Gap, have gotten involved. It has been an outstanding success, and I'm really pleased that we're going back and revisiting that project again. Uh, for my young mate, Lyndon, uh, who's a, a young student at the Gap State High, who's been, uh, I want to say pestering, but that's a wrong word. I'd say <laughs> lobbying, persistently lobbying, persistently lobbying for some basketball uh, equipment going uh, for his part of the world, which is Payne Road. Mate, you're getting a mooger, so it's coming. So I really want to thank the Lord Mayor for the multi-user -use, games arena, that's going to be fantastic for him. Uh, for, for Healy Street in Capera, we're going to see some lighting go in. And this lighting network along in this park is going to connect the Capera and Groveley stations uh, out my way, and I'm really appreciative of that. That's been a project that we've been wanting to do for some time. Um, Mr Chair, according to my clock, I've got less than a minute to go, and I do want to finish by saying um, I reject the Council for Tennyson's comments about the drainage officers in Green Square not knowing where drains are in the Tennyson ward. I want to get on the record that these officers have been busting their button since the flood event and during the flood event. And I would like to hear a shout out from the Chamber for the hard work that these guys have done. Thank you. This is, they're doing outstanding work. They are continuing to do outstanding work. And as acting chair of city standards, I've seen the hard work that they've been doing and it should be commended. And I thank the chamber for acknowledging their support. Thank you. Further debate, Councillor Cumming. Mr. Chair, I move for the purposes of discussion that this council allocate $10 million in capital from the proposed 2022-23 Program 3 budget on page 22 to design and build all Southside backflow prevention devices identified in the ACOM report undertaken by council following the January 2011 floods and reconfirmed as a priority by the 2022 De Jersey Flood Review. Seconded. We moved by Councillor Cumming, seconded by Councillor Johnston, that 
the motion be amended to read that this council allocates $10 million in capital from the proposed 2022-23 program, uh, sorry, 2022-2023 program three budget on page 22 to design and build all Southside backflow prevention devices identified in the ACOM report undertaken by council following the January 2011 floods and reconfirmed as a priority by the 2022 De Jersey flood review. Councillor Cummins. Yes, just I think given that the council has gone to considerable expense to uh, obtain this report, and uh, experts have looked at the situation and made recommendations. I believe it's incumbent upon council to uh, implement those recommendations and uh, do so as soon as possible, which means this budget. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh Yes, thank you, and I, I thank Councillor Cumming for moving the motion. I, I gather something was said yesterday that would prevent me from doing it. Yes, um, Councillor, there was. I sought further legal advice uh, from our chief legal counsel in regards to moving motions after you finish speaking in a program area, and so he referred me to section 41.5, confirming that that could not occur. All right. Well, thank you for clarifying that. I just want to thank Councillor Cumming uh, for moving the motion. He is a South Side councillor, and uh, there are a number of uh, uh, areas in the South Side uh, where uh, the backflow valves are going to be particularly useful. Um, now, we know that this LNP administration has repeatedly voted against uh, funding backflow valves, including as recently as uh, after the floods in March this year. In fact, the deputy mayor who's left the chamber now um, stood up and was highly critical of me uh, for bringing forward an amendment to fund all of the De Jersey uh, recommendations. Um, she claimed that I was not a hydrologist. Well, no, I'm not. Um, but the people who are hydrologists uh, and engineers uh, did the AECOM report and they recommended backflow valves be funded for uh, the city. Um, and in 2012, um, that report came out. And this council has funded just 15 of the 51 locations uh, that were recommended in that report. And there are many in my ward in Graceville, Chelmer, Tennyson, Yoronga, and Fairfield that have not yet been funded. And that is unacceptable. And there are many others, uh, many others around the city uh, as well. So, um, it is a good thing that it was part of the terms of reference for the De Jersey Review. And uh, uh, the report, the De Jersey Review, is actually quite interesting on this. Uh, it reconfirms um, the importance of backflow valves as part of Council's flood mitigation strategy. Um, uh, the former Governor and Chief Justice says very clearly that backflow, backflow to valve vices uh, do work. Um, and he's made a specific recommendation. It is recommendation 3.1, backflow prevention devices, that council continues to assess and prioritise the installation of backflow prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy. Uh, now, we've been debating this program for several hours and we've not heard a peep from the chairperson about this. Uh, so I would like certainly Councillor Davis to stand up and tell us where the backflow prevention devices or backflow valves are that are being funded in the budget this year, how much money is being put towards them, um, and I can guarantee it won't be enough. I know there's nothing for my ward uh, in here, and uh, it is critically important that Council funds the backflow devices that will help manage uh, flood in our area. Now, before we hear the allegations that they, you know, they don't stop flooding, we all know this. Um, out my way, we understand what they do. We do have several, and they did work. Um, and the anecdotal feedback from residents was that they helped as well. Um, it's very clear Council needs to improve its management of the backflow devices because the telemetry failed on some uh, and there were maintenance problems with others, and the De Jersey Review certainly identified that as well. Um, so there is a lot of work to be done here uh, in this space on backflow uh, devices. Um, but this Council failed after 2011 to do the important work that it should have done 
and 11 years on, we're still debating the same issues. Um, it is essential that uh, more money in this budget, well, some money in this budget is allocated to backflow uh, prevention devices. Um, just like the Leader of the Opposition's motion earlier today to put $5 million more to drainage, I'm asking that $10 million is allocated towards the delivery of backflow um, prevention devices on the south side. Um, once we fund all the south side ones, then I'll start moving motions to fund all the north side ones that haven't been done. But many of those have already been done in Councillor Howard's ward, in Paddington ward. Um, so it is the south side that is the priority. Uh, but I, I certainly welcome Councillor Davis's contribution to the debate on this amendment because we've heard zero from her about this. It's a critical part of the flood report from uh, Councillor, uh, for, sorry, from the former governor, uh, and we should know exactly how much money in this budget is going to go to backflow devices and where they're going to be. Further debate. Well, thank Davis. you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, I thank Councillor Cumming for moving Councillor Johnston's amendment. Um, we've spoken at length about the ACOM report, Chair, and about what was um, presented in that report. And there were a number of backflow um, locations that were uh, put up for consideration where it was feasible to put a backflow valve. It didn't say in the report that a backflow valve should go at every one of those locations. It talked about them being feasible. And so what happened, um, and I'll uh, repeat it again for the benefit of Councillor Johnston, um, who purports to understand the ACOM report, um, but the ACOM report was about identifying potential locations where it was feasible, and then there was uh, uh, there was work undertaken to identify those that were priority locations. Uh, those priority, location, priority locations uh, had backflow devices installed in them. Uh, and then the others that were left that were not uh, installed were to be considered um, uh, in future budgets across all types of stormwater and drainage solutions or mitigation processes, which they still do. Uh, it's interesting too, though, that um, uh, how Councillor Johnston um, likes to, to sort of peddle what um, she perceives uh, Councillor, uh, rather Governor Paul DeGuzzi said in his report, and he did not say go ahead and put backflow devices in those locations that, um, uh, that, that appeared in the ACOM report. What he was saying was they could, should point still be... Um, point of order, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Well, Mr Chair, what Governor, former Governor de Jersey said in his back, I'm satisfied that the assessment of measures and possible expansion remain within the Council's responsible, uh, responsible radar. Well, our responsible radar is to look at all uh, drainage and stormwater mitigation solutions across the city, not just about putting backflow valves where they may be feasible, as mentioned in the ACOM report. So we will not be supporting, um, supporting this. Uh, had um, Councillor Johnson been listening to my presentation, she would have um, heard that there are a number of backflow devices being delivered in this budget. Uh, and one I mentioned on the south side, and Councillor Cumming, is, uh, his ward is a recipient of one, and that's um, a new tidal backflow valve device will be installed at the Waterloo uh, Esplanade in Wynnum. Um, um, another is um, to replace three of the damaged backflow valves in Flinders Parade at Sandgate, in, uh, in the Sandgate Ward. So we are doing work in backflow, but backflow devices uh, are one measure to be considered in a suite of measures that, that officers consider when we are looking uh, to improve drainage and stormwater outcomes for the city uh, each budget. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, further speakers? Uh, Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak in support of this motion, and I do take um, Councillor Davies' oh, point. I'm sorry, Councillor Shreve, my apology. Councillor Johnston had a, a claim to be misrepresented. Oh, you're right. Yeah, apologies. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Davis said uh, that somehow I'd misrepresented what uh, the former governor had said. Uh, I quoted from the recommendation in his report verbatim um, that council continues to assess and prioritise the installation of backflow uh, prevention devices as part of its flood mitigation strategy. They're his words, not mine. Uh, Councillor Shree, we'll start your time again. 
Thanks, Chair. Yeah, uh, rise to speak in support of this motion, and um, I do take Councillor Davies' point that the administration thinks they're doing enough on this front. Um, I had paid quite close attention to the decision-making process around the backflow prevention devices and um, also looked into the evaluations the Council undertook in deciding which projects to actually proceed with. Uh, and I was disappointed to see that the uh, level of detail and scrutiny that was given to the flood mapping and um, where water actually flowed and, and pooled was pretty sparse. The, I, I can't speak about all the devices across the city, but sp speaking specifically about my own area, one example was Forbes Street, West End, where the council con conducted a, a fairly rough desktop analysis and concluded based on some rough flood maps that even if a, a BPD had been installed, the flood in uh, that, that neighbourhood would still have been flooded because the water overtopped the river bank and so even if the device had been installed, the water still came over and, and would have flooded that area anyway. Um, that wasn't correct. The engineers, whether they were working in council or, they, or were contractors, got it wrong. Um, they didn't actually ground truth the maps. They didn't actually go out and talk to residents on the ground. They didn't look at photos from the 2011 floods that clearly showed where the water got up to. And so as a result, they concluded that a backflow prevention device in that location would not have made a significant positive difference to the risk of flooding, um, and that conclusion was incorrect. So the council ended up saying, oh, look, we're not going to spend money installing a BPD in this area because we don't think the cost of installing it justifies the, um, the amount of damage it would prevent. Um, and it was all based on that incorrect assessment undertaken by council engineers or by the contractors that they hired. Um, and so the fact that they got that wrong with Forbes Street West End calls into question decisions for a number of other BPDs across the city. I, I raised this with the mayor in a meeting and he um, undertook to look at it more closely. I still haven't heard back from him about uh, whether, whether they've changed their assessment on that front. Um, but it was interesting that this time around in 2022, that same area did experience flooding again. Um, and once again, that flooding came up, the floodwaters rose up through the stormwater drain network, even though the, the river banks had not been breached in that area. So the water, what, the flooding was caused um, because the water was rising up through the drain and uh, a, a big new apartment complex was inundated. That apartment complex wasn't there in 2011. Um, but it was inundated this time, and that apartment complex also had an Energex substation installed in the basement. So, because that one site had flooded, the entire southern half of West End lost power because Energex had to cut power to the whole area um, because of that particular area getting flooded. And I think, I, I know Councillor Adams has um, been a bit vocal on this in the past, and I hope she's paying attention now because one of the conversations, and I, I was sympathetic to this argument, was that if, if installing a BPD is only going to prevent flooding to six or seven properties and it's going to cost millions of dollars to install that device, I see why the council might say, oh, look, it's just not worth the cost. But that really rough analysis ignores the fact that because those couple of properties are getting flooded, the whole suburb loses power. And so, Councillor Davies, Councillor Adams, I hope you're reflecting on the fact that simply counting the number of registered blocks of land that are affected by flooding is not a sophisticated enough way to decide whether or not such devices need to be installed. In fact, on Forbes Street, a couple of those uh, properties, which the council counts as individual dwellings, are actually multi-dwelling apartment blocks with hundreds of apartments. So the council says, well, there are eight blocks of land that would be protected from flooding if we installed this device. Therefore, it's not in worth installing the device because it's only eight blocks of land. But if some of those blocks of land are apartments, that's a lot of people who are affected by flooding. Um, as I've said in the past, though, it, even if residential homes or apartments aren't directly affected by flooding, uh, if floodwaters that are rising up through a stormwater drain uh, cut off a road access, that's still a significant material impact to both safety and convenience. And the floodwaters are also still causing damage to council infrastructure, such as roadways, such as footpaths, such as, um, in some cases, sewerage infrastructure controlled by QUU, etc. Um, and, of course, power infrastructure controlled by Energex. 
So the council back in 2011 made, I think, a very unsophisticated and simplistic um, cost-benefit analysis and said, oh, these devices don't need to be installed here. But the, the data they were relying on was incorrect, as in the maps they were relying on were incorrect. Um, and the factors they were considering as part of that analysis were also omitting key relevant information, such as the actual um, number of people who lived on those sites and the impacts to other forms of infrastructure. So I, I, I think the council has made a mistake here. I don't actually think it was necessarily the LNP's mistake. I think it might have been a mistake by the public servants. The LNP's mistake was that they didn't put enough resource in, into that assessment process and the public servants didn't have the time or the resources to actually go out and ground truth assessments on the ground. Um, and when I read through the documentation, it's quite striking because the council report is saying, oh, this was overland flooding by, by the river overtopping its bank. But the insurers that paid out on those properties, they said and concluded based on their assessments that it was, it was backflow flooding, correct? And so you've got properties there that they are insured for backflow flooding, they're not insured for river flooding where the river overtops its bank. But the insurer is still paying out because the insurer has accepted the evidence from the residents and the photographs and they've done their own mapping and ground truth. And the insurer has concluded that these properties were only flooded by backflow flow, um, flooding. They weren't flooded from the river overtopping its bank. So the insurers have reached that conclusion, but council has rushed the process and, and reached a different conclusion. And uh, as I'm saying, an incorrect conclusion. So this has happened on a couple of locations within the Gabba Ward. I think it's quite likely that many of the other devices across the city that should have been installed were also um, subject to a similarly flawed decision-making process. The, um, the system has failed at multiple points along that decision-making trail. The, I think, I guess the only weakness of this motion is that um, the $10 million might not actually be enough to cover the full cost of all the devices that need to be installed. And I'm sure Councillor Cumming and Councillor Johnson would acknowledge that too. This is a start, but we actually need to put a lot more money towards this program in order to um, fully <laughs> rectify the issue. And once again, I would say to the administration councillors and, and perhaps to the councillors who, who will still be in this chamber in a few years, um, think about how much damage it's going to do to roads and footpaths and other forms of infrastructure every time these neighbourhoods flood. Um, these small residential streets, it's costing hundreds of thousands of dollars to resurface them, to fix potholes, etc. And all that expense could be avoided if you just coughed up the money to put in these devices to stop the neighbourhood flooding in the first place. So you're um, being, I guess, penny wise and pound foolish in the sense that you're trying to save a little bit of money by not installing these devices. And as a result, in the long term, it's costing council a lot more money to clean up after the floods and to repair the damage from flooding in these areas. So, Councillor Davies, I hope you'll make a note of this and at least look again at sites like Forbes Street. Um, the decision-making process last time was deeply flawed. Um, I, I'm not asserting that any who, exactly who made that mistake, but I can see very clearly from the evidence that I've um, been presented with that a big mistake was made, um, and the council. It, it, the council's cost-benefit analysis was not rigorous enough and led to incorrect conclusions. So even if 10 years ago the council said, oh, look, some of these devices aren't worth installing, you need to go back again and look very closely at those decisions um, and I think start afresh in terms of your analysis because we really do need these devices installed in those areas, particularly on sites where you've now gone and approved apartment blocks of, of 300 plus units. Um, that site I mentioned in, on Forbes Street, there were 700 people living in that one apartment block who lost power because the basement flooded and all the power infrastructure was flooded because you'd made a choice not to install that backflow prevention device. There were like elect, uh, uh, power <coughs> extension cords snaking across roads and being passed over back fences so that people could have power for the days after the floods. There were people going up and down fire escapes in the dark and slipping on stairwells and all that sort of stuff. Um, People, people lost cars because the electric gates um, that control for the underground car park accesses, they couldn't be open because the power was out. So even though people wanted to get their cars out, they couldn't because the gates were stuck closed. Um, all this happened because your administration failed to install those backflow prevention devices and cost residents tens of thousands of dollars in damaged property. So I hope we'll learn from this and I hope we'll make some different decisions going forward. 
Further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. And, um, we've heard um, uh, from Councillor Shree about those devices in his ward and Councillor Johnson, and there's certainly um, devices in the Morningside ward and Councillor Cook's ward, and she's been very vocal about the need um, in, a similar, in a similar vein to what Sh uh, Councillor Shree said, that, that some assessment was made to say that it was a limited number of properties um, that were affected. Therefore, this administration didn't think it was value for money uh, for those people um, to get those devices. But what Councillor Davis has let slip, uh, among many other things today and over the last few days, uh, one being the fact that um, uh, this entire budget is a guess uh, and based on, uh, based on incomplete assessments of, of damage and, and guessing uh, most of the way through, um, what she has admitted today and what LNP councillors and chairs have admitted throughout this entire budget process is there's not enough money allocated for basic maintenance. Um, she said that today. She said that you know, the, reason, uh, the reason that these devices haven't been installed as per the recommendation 10 years ago uh, and subsequently is that not enough money has been put into drainage by the LNP administration. Um, and we see that all over the city. You know, um, the, the so-called backflow devices, they're not called that, uh, down on the foreshore areas, and, and three of the ones that Councillor Davis talked about have been broken for three years. Now, they're very basic. They're very basic um, tidal valves. I'm not talking about the, the powered backflow devices along the river. These are just completely different, completely different, and um, it is disturbing that Councillor Davis doesn't know the difference. But those three on Flinders Parade were identified three years ago as being damaged and they were listed for repair, but council officers have said they cannot repair them because this administration doesn't allocate enough money for maintenance. And it was the same story in Brighton Road, Sandgate. Point of order. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Uh, could I just ask the relevance? We're talking about £10 million, pounds, just south side only backflow devices. If we could bring it back to the motion. I just just referring to what Councillor Davis talked about in her contribution. Um, um, yeah, and Councillor Davis contributed to the amendment. You might not have been paying attention, Deputy Mayor, but Councillor Davis did please. speak. And she mentioned those three. Because she said in her contribution to the debate around um, installing backflow devices on the south side, she said there is one on the south side. It's a tidal valve uh, down on the Wynnum foreshore. And, and this administration, after three years of knowing that tidal valves at Sandgate were faulty, are finally funding maintenance upgrades after residents have had to take it upon themselves to badger the Lord Mayor week after week after week uh, after they're being ignored for years. So what this administration is admitting today is that they have been habitually underfunding drainage maintenance and construction in this city, and they have still done it in this budget because they are unable to support the installation of backflow devices on the South Side River. And that's, again, another example of where residents are paying more and more but getting less and less in their communities. Residents of Brisbane are not getting good value for money from this LNP administration. Further debate? Deputy Mayor. Point. Thank you, Mr Chair. And I um, rise to speak against uh, the amendment that we have here today, the amendment that we've had here every day for the last, every budget debate for the last 10 years and say exactly the same as we've been saying for the last 10 years. Before I go there, I would also like to say I bless the stars every day that those people on the opposite side of the chambers do not manage the budget in Brisbane City Council. We have spent the money over and over and over again, and it doesn't matter whether it is a priority for the city. It's just all about them. All about them. If we were to spend in 2011 dollars $3.9 million on 10 projects, to no benefit of any properties, we would be the first ones to be screamed at across the chambers on irresponsible financial management. But the reality is feasible does not mean it has to be done. The ACOM report undertook a comprehensive study Councillor Johnson, please. Of the 39 areas identified in the first report. Point of order, Chair. 
Uh, Deputy Mayor, one moment. Point, point of order, Will Councillor Shree. Will take a quick question? Deputy Mayor. No, Councillor Shree. Please continue, Deputy Mayor. And I will make some comments on Councillor Shree's speech too. But the, the main concept here, and it always comes from uh, this motion that we've had every year for the last 10 years, um, from the ACOM report that was in 2011, and they did do a comprehensive study of the 39 areas identified in the first report and 51 stormwater systems that would be feasible for a backflow device. A report where they are feasible. The next step was then to prioritise them through many things, including cost-benefit ratio. Yes, we look at whether it uh, affects properties, whether it, how many uh, people it affects, how many properties it affects, what type of properties is industrial, commercial, residential. And then we prioritise those and identify the priorities. But just because they're feasible doesn't mean they have to be. And what did we do out of those? We got to work making sure Brisbane was more flood resilient last time, and we've spoken about that. And we installed all of the 12 priority devices, plus an additional four that were not deemed a priority because we felt that they were affecting residents even enough to be, uh, to be an issue for them. Suburbs, including Belimba, New Farm, CBD, Milton, Rosalie, Orkinflower, Fig Tree Pocket, Tawong, West End, and five locations in the Tennyson Ward at Fairfield and Tennyson and Chelmer. Sixteen devices were installed, five of those in Tennyson. How's that work on the percentages? There's only one Tennyson Ward and they got nearly 30 per cent of the backflow devices. Outrage! But those 16 devices protected 80 per cent of the homes that were impacted in 2011. We will not spend ratepayers' money on backflow devices that will have no benefit. That is completely irresponsible. However, I do take Council Shree's comments, and it is something that we're looking at, as we have areas that do see increased density, and the West End area is getting increased density, we do need to look at it. But I can tell you right now, Fairfield, Tennis and Chelmer are not getting increased density, as much as we hear that from their local councillor. They are not growing at a proportion compared to at least another 15 suburbs across the city, as I've spoken about in this place. I'll take the interjection from Councillor uh, Johnson as she screams across the chamber. There's no development in Tennyson. Um, I didn't point say there was no chair. development just in Tennyson. Just for a moment, please, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Shree, point Look, of order. Just for the sake of the written record, I want to highlight that Councillor Johnson was not screaming. And I think the Deputy Mayor should be cautious about Berlin. I know sometimes there is shouting across the chamber, but in that, in that occasion there wasn't. And I think you have a responsibility I'll to take no. that interjection avoid hyperbole. I'll take that interjection. I'll take that. Thank you, Councillor Shree. I will withdraw that because I know Councillor Johnson's the first one that doesn't know the difference between screaming and talking across the chamber. But. The interjection from Councillor Johnson is that there was no development in the Tennyson Ward, sarcastically. I didn't say there was no development in the Tennyson Ward. I said there has been far less development in the Tennyson Ward than many other areas across Brisbane. As I said, the 10 projects that we've heard Councillor Johnson repeatedly bleed about for the last 10 years in 2011 and 12 would have cost 3.9 million. I don't even want to think what they would cost today. And we would be heavily criticised if we were to install that under any cost-benefit ratio like 10 years ago and now. We follow the LGIP. The officers make educated decisions. I don't um, totally agree with Councillor Shree that they got it wrong in any way, shape or form, but we do need to make it a moving feast. That is why the LGIP is a moving and living document that changes as the development changes. We use the urban growth model to make sure it's the most scientific information we have to hand. But we will not be verbal by those officers to get the priorities right to suit them. And we've heard many times today that this administration partakes in corrupt behaviour because they don't like our decisions. Well, it's an outrageous lie. The officers make the decision based on the models that we have and it's prioritised across the entire city. The entire city. And sometimes it doesn't fall your way, Councillor Johnson, and sometimes it doesn't fall my way. But that's how it is. I lost a lot of projects that never got developed after 2011-12 because the money was put where it needed to be recovered, and that was in the Tennyson Ward. 
but that's how it is. Rebuild and recover. And we'll do it again this time. And we'll do it on the council officers' priorities, on the comprehensive audits that they have done across the city and are continuing to do after this flood recovery. And we'll not be lectured by those opposite who could not organise their lunch money. Further debate? No further debate? Councillor Cumming? Councillor Cumming, further debate? Uh, Councillor Cumming, you'll have to turn your microphone on. Okay, would you like to repeat that as it wasn't on the record? Has anyone who listened to that debate, all the merit was on this side of the chamber and I'd urge everyone to support the resolution. Thank you. All right, I will now put the amendment. All those in favour, say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. The division has been called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor Cumming. Councillors, eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Thank you. Uh, clerks, uh, please um, close the bars. Thank you. And uh, clerks, please read the results. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being five in favour and 15 against. The motion is lost. While you're taking your seats, I'd just thought I'd make an ob observation that every time I see the councillor for Brackenridge stand up, I start to get a little bit, of hun bit hungry, because I'm like, oh, this, this means we're about to have a meal break. I've, it's Pavlovian conditioning. It's getting... <laughs> we are about to. Councillor. <laughs> councillor Landers. I'm, I'm always listening. I'm very good at that. Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for lunch for one hour, which commences only when all councillors have left the meeting. Second. <laughs> Moved by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Strunk, that Council now adjourn for lunch for one hour when all councillors uh, have left the meeting. Uh, all in favour? Oh, yes. Aye. Aye. All opposed? Carried. Thank you. Councillors, we will now continue the debate on Program 3, Clean, Green and Sustainable City. Uh, further speakers, Councillor Atwood. Thank you, Deputy Chair. I too rise to speak about Program 3, a clean, green and sustainable city. Now, Chair, I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes talking about the Murray Recreation Reserve because I'm that excited. No, I'm joking. But I am honestly so excited. The new name is going to actually be called the International Cycle Park. The new International Cycle Park is going to be the best cycling facility. And I'll wait for Councillor Adams to fight with me over this one, but I believe it will be. Um, this is just going to be another example of how new and exciting infrastructure is built to our city from the Olympics. The Olympics hold four cycling events. It holds road cycling, track cycling, mountain biking and BMXing. And the Olympics also holds speed skating. This facility will cater to every one of these five sports and help our youngest athletes train for the Olympics in, 30, in Brisbane in 32. 
To think back when we did our first community consultation in 2019, to see how far this design has come. At our first community consultation, we had roughly 50 residents turn up. The Balmoral Cycling Club, Queensland Cycling, and Wynne Hughes from Speed Skating. Just to jog everyone's memory, Wynne came into the chamber last year. He was a 65, sorry, he was about 80 years old, and he came in and spoke about how he started speed skating when he was 65 and would come into the city and valley at, uh, during the night to practice his speed skating. He was honestly an incredible gentleman and an inspiration. But through his great advocacy uh, and his technical knowledge, he has secured Brisbane's only public speed skating facility, which will be included in this upgrade. This upgrade will also see a new two-storey clubhouse, a new car park to cater for the masses, I, because I know that people will travel from other cities near and far to visit this incredible facility, and construction will start later this year. Stage two, which hasn't been funded, but it will, also t but it will certainly help this facility in turning it into a world-class facility. Um, one of the big upgrades in stage two that I'm really excited about will be lighting. For me, this is a must. It will be the biggest happy dance I ever do as a councillor because currently, if you're a cyclist and you want to train, unfortunately, you can only do it during the daylight hours. So for me, this lighting will be an incredible addition to the new cycle park. Um, stage two will also include a pump track, a learn to ride, a BMX, playground, and traffic lights to help people get in and out of Wynnum Road safely. After visiting Brackenridge and Dara's pump BMX tracks, I know how popular these facilities are, and I warmly welcome one on the southeast side of Brisbane. Another very exciting upgrade in the Doughboy Ward is Combsley Beach Reserve, which is also located in Murray. They are some very, very lucky suburb. Uh, but this one is a no-brainer, Chair. Combsley Beach was one of Brisbane's busiest parks in its heyday. This bespoke park, was, but it's creeping up to 25 years old and is in need of some love. I remember when we heard, held our first community consultation in this park too. Um, it was not very busy, very quiet actually. It was about the middle of December, 35 degree day, and we concluded that everyone was at a Westfield shopping centre and not at our community consultation. But we had one very lovely lady, the former councillor for Morningside, Shane Sutton, attend. She told me what her vision for the park and things that she would like to see. And it was really great to, um, to meet her, actually. So I'm so excited that we're not only delivering for Councillor Sutton and her vision for the park, but for what our residents wanted. Um, I also wanted to make a special mention of who's involved in this park. So we have Daryl from Council, who originally designed the park 25 years ago. He's back on board and he's designing the upgrades once again. We also have another coincidence, the original sculptor who did the fish and the octopus, um, he's also back again, and that was through sheer luck. We did a community consultation of four artists, and he was chosen. Stage two will also include, which is coming up later this year, um, mobility improvements all across the park, um, uh, disabled parking, more green space around the playgrounds for picnic shelters, restoration to the bushlands, and Belimba Creek catchment are getting involved, and I'm grateful for their assistance. Um, new art sculptures, which include a submarine, crab, fish, and all of these are gonna be play elements and very interactive. I would also like to sincerely, sincerely thank uh, Tabitha, Helena, and Andrew from our news branch for their incredible vision and bringing this to life. Without them, this would not have um, been possible or achieved to date. So really, really grateful for their assistance. And I'd like to commend Program 3 to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor. Further debate? Councillor Mackay. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Um, excuse me while I prepare. I thought the other side was speaking next, but <laughs> Councillor Cummings. No, it's all right. I'm, I'm up now. <laughs> Thanks, Councillor Strunk. Hey, listen, um, I gave a speech yesterday, Chair. I, I'm speaking on Program 3, obviously. And I gave a speech yesterday, uh, and I said that I was going to make it very positive, and I got some good feedback about that. So I'm, I'm actually thrilled to hear that people want to hear positivity rather than whinging all the time, and it's great. And um, I'm going to do the same sort of thing again, and I'm not going to yell at you, Chair, and I probably won't throw any defamation around the chamber. So, you know, just for something, something different from, from the other side of the uh, chamber. And in the spirit of positivity, um, I want to pay tribute to Councillor Strunk. Well done. Um, you 
do a great job sticking up for your constituency and for Liberal governments, so thank you for that. I just want to put on the record that Councillor Strunk mentioned that the, the, Tasmania, the state of Tasmania is carbon negative, and that is run by a Liberal government. So well done, Councillor Strunk. I really appreciate you highlighting that. But I do need to just clarify. I just checked it, and the population of Tasmania is 541,000 uh, people versus Brisbane, 1 million 131,000. So that's nearly twice as many. And we are carbon neutral. So that is pretty exciting. Now, um, as for Councillor Shree, the self declared anarchist more than socialist, um, look, I respect him for living what he believes. I definitely don't agree with what he says. And the more I listen, the less I agree. But I do respect him for living it. Um, but, Chair, I have to put on the record that I am deeply offended that Councillor Shree said that uh, I'm corrupt or implied that I'm corrupt because he said the administration is corrupt as part of the administration. I take that as a personal slight. So, for those watching at home, Councillor Shree also yelled out, Why don't you read out the definition? So, I got the definition and it says corruption is a form of dishonesty or a criminal offence which is undertaken by a person or an organisation which is entrusted in a position of authority in order to acquire illicit benefits or abuse of power for one's personal gain. He can choose whatever definition he wants, doesn't make it correct. The definition is the definition, so he's implied that I'm a criminal. So I, I take great offence at that. I'm just going to put that on the record. And I guess this is the problem with the Greens, because you just can't trust them. Um, as I've spoken about many times before, Chair, as you know, there's a state MP who claims credit for delivering two green bridges for the west side, despite the fact I don't think he actually wrote a letter of support for one of them. Um, the same state MP circulated a flyer in 2019 stating that 12,000 square metres of vegetation would be cleared on Mount Cutha um, for the zip line, and the actual area was only going to be a house block. But look, I'm really glad that Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner has, oh, there's Councillor Shree in the back there. He's probably texting the Politburo about what I'm saying. Um, but thank you to the Lord Mayor for stopping that. I, I think that's a good outcome. Um, and remember that the Greens also voted against a carbon pollution reduction scheme. And this morning, Chair, this is a cracker. This morning, I read in the paper that the Greens want to put a, ga a cap on some gambling which is a huge twist of irony, considering they received a massive donation to the tune of $500,000 from, drumroll, a professional gambler named Duncan Turpy. Just doesn't stack up. They say one thing and do another. So you don't be fooled, Chair. The Greens are not about the environment or supporting Program 3, Clean, Green and Sustainable. The Greens are really about social change, and I'll show you why. I spent some time this morning putting together a list um, of all the councils in Australia that I could find with a Greens Mayor or Deputy Mayor. I'm just going to quickly read them out. City of Shoalhaven, Yarra City Council, Moreland City Council, Golden Plains Shire Council, Darabin City Council, Nilambuk Council, Port Phillip City Council, Boron Boroondara City Council, Leichhardt City Council and Byron City Council. Now, of all of those where there's a mayor or a deputy mayor who's a green, only two of them, two of them are carbon neutral. What a shame that is. Moreland City Council, 181,000 population. Darabin City Council, 161,000 population. So they can say one thing, but they don't follow through and they do something else. What a shame that is. And we know from Program 3 that Brisbane City Council achieved carbon neutral certification against the climate active carbon neutral standard for organisations. And it's critical to note too that uh, Brisbane City Council is the only certified organisation in the entire country with an operating landfill and a large public transport service. We are getting it done. We're not waving banners. We're not gluing ourselves to the street. We are getting it done. And I am thrilled to see so many little yellow signs around the place that says climate action now, because that means there are all these residents out there supporting what we do for climate action. Oh, yeah. no, it's thrilled about that. And just for the record, 
um, those watching at home might hear some droning going on in the background. That's the councillor for Tennyson interjecting despite calling for respect in the chamber. Um, Chair, this council does so much to reduce emissions and for what we do not reduce, we offset. That is why the Srinagar Council, council purchases only renewable energy and accredited carbon offsets to negate direct and indirect greenhouse emissions. Through, through the Australian Government's Climate Active Initiative, Brisbane City Council has offset more than 1.8 million tonnes of carbon emissions. 1.8 million tonnes. If we only offset carbon emission by planting trees, we would need to plant 10 million 800,000 trees, and clearly that is not realistic. Carbon offsetting is a way for organisations to cancel out carbon emissions that they are not able to completely eliminate by investing in projects that reduce or remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. It is an internationally recognised way for organisations to manage carbon emissions that cannot be entirely eliminated and become carbon neutral. And there are numerous different projects generating offsets in Australia and around the world. Under our certification, Council is required to use offsets that result in genuine carbon emissions reduction. And when we purchase Australian carbon credit units, also known as ACCUs, the benefits go directly to the Australian communities and our environment. Council purchases independently verified carbon offsets. And to that, uh, to Councillor Strunk's point, who said, if we buy them from Southeast Asia, how do we know? Well, it's not our job to know, it's the um, independent verification's job to know. And after, well, we sign up, it was, someone just yelled across the chamber, it should be our job to know. Well, there's a body whose job it is, and it's the Australian standards, so that's how it's done, Australian carbon credit units. Um, and uh, Chair, on that point, we need to also remind ourselves that not one single department in the Queensland Government run by the Labor Party is carbon neutral or even close to it. Um, the, the one problem is that our program is literally so big that we're oversized for the Australian market, and that is why the Shrina Council purchases offsets from a range of projects, including early season savannah burning in far north Queensland and the Northern Territory, and reforestation on marginal farmlands in northern New South Wales. Other projects have included wind, solar and biomass generation. The Shrina Council always gives preference to projects that also support wider social, economic and environmental benefits. Finally, it is critical to note that Council is the only certified organisation in the entire country with an operating landfill. I commend Program 3 to the Chamber. Thank you. Thank you. Further debate? <coughs> Council Griffiths. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. And I, I rise also to speak about the clean, green and sustainable um, program. It is interesting that Council Mackay said he would get up and he would speak positively. And I think three quarters of his speech was negative. Um, so it's it's the liberal idea of positivity, but let's. Uh, what I well, what I find ironical is to be lectured to be lectured by liberals, LMP members who talk about carbon neutrality. What an irony! What a joke! They just got thrown point out of, order, of federal Mr. government. Chair. Oh, just one moment, Councillor Griffiths. Point of order, Deputy Mayor. Does Councillor Griffiths take a question? No, I won't take a question. No, I just want to know no. how many people he'd heard talk about it today because he only just arrived. No, thank you, Ca Councillor Griffiths. Please. No, let's just give Councillor Griffiths. Of order. Let's just give Councillor Griffiths a moment to. to oh, point of order. No, point of order, Councillor Johnston. Just for those at home who might have heard um, that interjection, that was Councillor Mackay droning along in the background. That was not a point of order, Councillor Griffiths. <laughs> and and I, I thought it was interesting that the Deputy Mayor was uh, having a go at me for attending the session when she wasn't here yesterday. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> that uh, Deputy Mayor, no, you were outside the chamber. Every time I spoke, you're outside the chamber. You and the Lord Mayor. It was, you're invisible. Invisible, the invisible pair. Can, can, <laughs> Councillor Griffiths, if, if we could please, woman. if we could just come back to program three, please. Oh, happy to, happy to. And it, you always know you've got the Liberals hooked in when they're up there making uh, interjections. 
You always know you've got them when they're, they're, they're up there making interjections, particularly the Deputy Mayor. But let's talk about carbon neutrality. Yes. What's our council record on that? We buy carbon credits from the biggest polluter in the world. And we think we're doing a remarkable job. We buy our carbon credits cheaply, according to these guys certified, from China. What a joke. What a joke. Are we supporting? Are we supporting the local carbon industry? Are we supporting what they're doing? Are we supporting reduction in Australia? Minimally. Minimally. We're out there supporting the work that's going on in China, even though China's increasing its pollution. That's just fascinating. And this is the council, this is the administration that says, hey, this is the administration that says, we buy locally. We buy 80% locally. We don't with our carbon credits. But let's have a look at this program, because I, I always find it, um, I think it's the most fascinating program for the Liberal Party. And it's obviously the one that they use to green coat themselves um, to varying degrees of success. But for those who are actually in the community, you'll know that it is just that, green coating. It's not about really delivering, it's about the appearance of delivering. And you have to look no further than what we do with our koala strategy to see green coating. We do a lot in Liberal wards, LNP areas, we do a lot. We, we paint roads, we put up little signs. We've more recently put up a, a couple of metres of fencing along the road, um, put a pole over a road that leads to suburbia. That leads to suburbia. So we've got those little koalas, if they ever do, climbing up this post to cross the road to go into a little piece of bushland that takes them off into suburbia. And are we doing any tree planting in that area? Have we got anything to back that program up? Not that I'm aware of, and certainly not what the environmentalists are telling me. But it's a good PR thing. It's on a very prominent piece of road. Uh, we've had a lot of deaths of koalas on that piece of road, and finally we're doing some action. But it's questionable, the action that's going on there. So I really, I really wonder about what we're actually doing, whether it's strategic or whether it's to make us look like we're doing a lot of work. And certainly in my area where there is a group doing a lot of work with koalas, in fact we have a very healthy, successful koala population that is growing, that is Tui Forest, and where they are leaving the forest and following the corridors that we have renewed, there is very little support from this administration for that. And I know that uh, um, within the last couple of years, I've certainly um, met with LNP councillors on site at Griffith Uni at the environmental hub there, and certainly had a very positive reception because the university want to work with council. They're really keen. They actually came to me and said, hey, councillor, we have a facility here. They're set up for community education, fully built, fully outfitted. They educate uh, between 10 and 20,000 kids, students a year, but we're not using it on weekends. Would council be interested in using that facility? All the walks are established. All the education equipment is there. Would council be interested in using this facility? And what was the response? I say from the councillor I was dealing with, um, it was very positive, but what was the response from the Lord Mayor and the administration? Silence. And it is such a missed opportunity for our community. It is such a missed opportunity in terms of tourism for Brisbane. It is such a missed opportunity in terms of the Olympics. Seven kilometres from where we sit now is a healthy koala population in the wild, with an environmental centre there, with a university who's dying to work with us, but we have an LNP Lord Mayor and an LNP Council who can't take off the shackles of we can't do anything in a Labor ward. So it's a missed opportunity for our city. It is so short-sighted 
It is so negative. It is so wrong. But these are the people, you are the people we have in administration. And I want residents out there, they certainly know it in my ward, and I'm certainly pushing that out further, to know what a group of Luddites we have in terms of taking opportunity for our city, going forward with a brilliant opportunity because it's in the Labor area. So I'm pleased to say I'll be actually sponsoring, um, giving this uh, group $5,000 and they'll be running free walks in Tui Forest. Free walks that residents, when I go to Acacia Ridge State School and tell those kids about it, they go, how can we see these koalas? We'll be running free walks with the university in the forest and we'll be paying students to take those, um, those people who want to go on those walks um, through. And I've had nothing but a positive response when I've spoken about this. And the most disappointing thing for me is the Mayor, Councillor Adams, those opportunities have been lost. But I will take it forward on behalf of the city because it needs to be taken forward because it's a brilliant opportunity. And there's other events we're working on and we're going to be doing too, in conjunction with the university. But unfortunately, the LNP aren't on board and even worse, our sustainability corporation, which I heard were neutral, also won't touch it because they, they've got to respond to the politics of council. How sad for our city that we have a sustainability organisation set up, a business set up that is beholden to these people. They are missing opportunities they are missing opportunities in our community because of the short-sighted, narrow thinking of this administration. And while we're on short-sighted and narrow, let's talk about Habitat Brisbane. Because in my area, we actually, in my ward, we actually brought those four groups together with council officers and we did pre a dozen projects that pulled on the knowledge of those groups brought in residents, brought in expertise of our officers, and now I'm told, no, can't do that anymore, councillor. In fact, the officer had to get permission to even meet with me. Can you believe that? A council officer under this administration had to get permission to meet with me. We back to old Campbell Newman days, because I understand under the City of Brisbane Act, officers, we are allowed to have contact with officers. And it's not up to you guys to stop that or block that or control that. So I was shocked when I heard that, that we're missing opportunities to do really good things in the local community. I, I know I've been working with a local resident, Brad, who's actually renewed this whole area of land that was road reserve. And I've been working with him and the officers and I've been paying for the uh, vouchers to buy the native vegetation he's putting on site. Councillor Griffiths, your time has expired. Thank you. Further debate, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, uh, Mr Chair, and I stand to support Program 3 in the budget we have today. And I just have to say, the one thing we do know is that the angrier Councillor Griffiths gets, the more worried he is that we are absolutely nailing it in this portfolio. Because he should know and understand that we are the cleanest and greenest city council across Australia, that we do more for our environment and have bought more, back more bushland and regenerated that bushland and looked after our natural fauna and flora than any other council right across the city. I do just have to make an interjection on his claims that I wasn't here at all yesterday, considering he was here for a total of three hours, came in, told us this was a bloody waste of time, um, was here for three hours and claims because I was out, of the, out for an hour order. I wasn't here. Uh, just one moment, please, Deputy Mayor. Councillor Griffiths. Claim uh, to be misrepresented. Order. Claim to be misrepresented. Deputy Mayor. Well, Councillor Griffiths definitely said that these two days were a waste of time when he finally got here yesterday. And now he's joined us at 1.30, um, saying he hears nothing from us on this side about how uh, carbon neutral are and what we've been talking about. I don't know how he heard it, because he has not been here, because he does not respect the chamber and he does not respect the political it's, uh, process. It's televised. <laughs> Please continue. 
Okay, so what I just heard is he's at home watching it on TV. Good on you, Councillor Griffiths. What I wanted to talk about was actually... Well, for those of you watching at home, apparently it's televised, and Councillor Griffiths was on his couch watching it. Instead of being here, doing the job that he's paid to do, which is be in council chambers. Uh, point of order. Is uh, the job, but there's not many people. Mayor, just for a moment, please. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, point of order. Yeah, in Greece, having a party, but no claim to be misrepresented. Claim to be misrepresented. Deputy Mayor. If I know it also goes in that I have to represent the city for the Olympics, uh, but that is how it is. I'm what I wanted to talk about... What I wanted to talk about was actually the fantastic opportunities that Councillor Davis and the Lord Mayor have had in my ward to make sure that as one of the wards in the Triangle of Death, as the uh, Quest newspaper used to call it, with, Count with Cooparoo and Holland Park that are doing everything they can to make sure that our natural areas stay clean and green and that our fauna are looked after. I found it extremely excruciatingly hypocritical of Councillor Griffiths to say, we do nothing to support corridors in our city. And they stand up here day in and day out uh, and complain. Deputy Mayor, just for a moment, please. Councillor Griffiths claim to be misrepresented. misrepresented again. Yeah. Councillor Griffiths clearly said we did nothing about wildlife corridors. And then his leader of the opposition continually talks about, and because they hate it, they hate that we did what the people of Mount Gravatt East wanted, was to protect a major koala corridor in Carrara Street. So... They don't like it. They're screaming because they don't like it. Corinne McMillan MP, Joe Kelly MP, the failed Labor candidate for Bonner were all there screaming, buy this land. Well, they didn't think we were going to and they're not happy that we did, but the residents are. And the koalas are. The koalas that were there before, Carter Rest in Peace, that is why it's called Carter's Rest. And now, with the very strong corridor that it develops between Mount Cravat from Tui Forest through to White's Hill, and down through Glinderman Park, it is a fantastic corridor for the fauna to move through. But that's not all we've done. We've also got the works that we've done along Boundary Road. We have seen that the uh, evidence of wildlife um, crossings there and strikes on koalas were increasing. So we knew they were becoming trapped in the very steep um, batters that they have along Boundary Road. So Council installed wildlife awareness monitors along Boundary Road and along Pine Mountain Road and also made specific ladders that were made particularly for koalas to be able to climb out of the steep batters if they got caught crossing the road there. And of course, just recently, we have constructed the first koala crossing, a custom design made overhead log bridge associated with fencing to direct the koalas to where they need to go if they wanted to cross that road. And it acts as a log bridge, enabling them to get over to the trees that they can see on the other side, the trees that are on the other side in Cooper Ward that I know Councillor Cunning has personally planted some of those koala fodder trees uh, in her ward as well. And this design will inform wildlife crossing designs across Brisbane. It's very bespoke for this area, but it will inform designs across Brisbane. And I have to thank the Morrison government for the LCRI um, funding for the program to deliver this, one of a kind, but the start of designs, the start of the designs that will lead to other custom designs for where it's needed across the city as well. Uh, also, obviously, I have got a very green ward, and I think they say Tarragindi is the greenest suburb in Brisbane, but Malcravat Outlook Reserve... Point of order. Point of order. Point of order. Uh, it's Forest Lakes, the greenest suburb. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take mayor. the interjection. I was talking about the number of trees in the area of the suburb per square metre. Uh, they're a very, very green suburb. Uh, and it is bounded by Turi Forest, which is part of that is in my ward as well. It's not all Councillor uh, Griffiths, but also Malkavad Outlook, which is kind of part of the Turi Forest area as well. But it's a very, very important conservation reserve. And I need to thank Councillor Davis again and the team in Council. The officers up there absolutely love Mount Cravat. And they look after that outlook so, so well. The uh, weed management, which I know is boring and it's very unsexy, but weed management is an extremely important part of controlling um, 
um, those noxious weeds that we see uh, in Mount Cravat Outlook. And also in Whites Hill, they're continuing that program this week, this year, particularly in Babina Street, Mount Cravat, where we're seeing a lot of weeds coming over from the, um, the backdoor neighbours. There's a new walking track coming to Mount Cravat. It's a walking track that's been there for a while, but it's not a formal one. It's one the residents use. Um, it kind of edges their property, so it's kind of been formed naturally in what we'd call the destiny path. Uh, but they are going to, we're going to turn that into an official walking track so we can get rid of the hazards, the steepness of the slope, and make sure we realign it with some drainage and reprofiling. And of course, install some of the fantastic stone steps that the officers have been doing over the last few years to formalise it, make it safer, and have more opportunities for people to get in there and enjoy that beautiful natural area as well. They're also doing um, similar in Whites Hill Reserve, where they will be continuing, again, the works that they do in weed control, hopefully working through cars to keep those bikes out of that area as well. And uh, what we've seen with the ring road around there and the stairs and the access right through that area has been a fantastic way for more people to park more safely, get in there, enjoy the Whites Hill Reserve, and of course, all the sports and rec facility there that is maintained uh, through news and through uh, program, uh, through lifestyle uh, program as well. I would just like to finish uh, by mentioning the Murray Rec Reserve. I know it's not in my ward. Uh, however, I have been closely involved with the Belmoral Cycling Club over many, many years. Uh, my son cycled there for many years. His best mate from primary school, who now is a professional cyclist on the tour in Europe, came from the Belmoral Bi Cycling Club. And I want to show my respects and thanks. I knew I was going to get upset about this. About a very important man. Jim Cockrell, who was a life member of Balmoral Cycling Club. He started it. He did an amazing job. He's not well now. But I just want to say to Jim, thank you for all the work that you did with Balmoral Cycling Club and the $16 million we are so proud to put into a club that you made the heart of cycling in Brisbane. You helped us run the World Cycling Championships a couple of years ago, basically from Balmoral Cycling Club. They did an amazing job. It could not have happened without Jim. And even though he hasn't been there on the ground with Councillor Atwood in this work, he is there in spirit. I know he's very happy to see uh, what we are doing there and what it means for the future of cycling in Brisbane. And so far as the Olympics that are coming in 10 years' time, it will be the way that we win the gold, silver and bronze in all of the cycling, particularly in the Criterion uh, in the Olympics in 2032. So thank you, Lord Mayor and Tracy Davis. Fantastic uh, program, and I look forward to all of those embellishments in my ward as well. Thank you. Thank you. For, oh, sorry, my apology, Councillor Griffiths. There were three uh, claims of misrepresentation. Uh, yes, three. So the first one was uh, that I said it was a bloody waste of time. I might believe it, but I didn't say bloody. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, so anyway. Um, the second one was do nothing along the corridors. Uh, I actually said it's LMP centred with what we do along the corridors and with our bushland program. And the third point, Councillor Adams, uh, I think it was missing in action. I just would say Councillor Adams needs to be in the chamber as well. Thank you. Uh, now, further debate. Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mr Acting Chair, and I rise to speak in support of Program 3. And, Mr Acting Chair, can I say to Councillor Davison, all of the officers that work within this program area, a very big thank you for the work that they do, and particularly for a lot of the um, attributes that are coming to my ward through this program. It would be remiss of me, um, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Adams, to not advocate um, for Karawatha as being the greenest place in the city. So um, pretty much it is the, uh, the, the entire forest in that uh, suburb. And I know my colleague Councillor Adam is saying to me, go west, go west. But I think that this is a true demonstration that we have many of our councillors here today advocating the green credentials of the suburbs within their particular wards. And that is a really positive sign. And it follows um, on from what Councillor Mackay was saying that, you know, we have got a lot to be proud of in our clean, green and sustainable city of Brisbane. And 
On that note, I would just like to say, in reference to Program 3.3.1.1, the Conservation Reserves Management, um, my community is very appreciative of the continued work that our officers do in regards to those conservation corridors. They are very important and they form part of the Karawatha Greenbank Flinders Peak Corridor. And I know that the the very hard-working volunteers out at the Karawatha Forest Protection Society, they do a lot of good work on the ground volunteering and they are very committed to positive outcomes in that area. I just want to um, go through 3.3.3.2, which is in relation to um, parks. And thank you, um, through you, Mr Chair, to Councillor Davis, um, for the funding that is coming through for Billabong Place Park in Parkinson, and also the fact that we will be able to uh, relocate the multi-use games arena from Heathwood Park to Dunvegan Street Park. and bring in a new half basketball court into Heathwood Park as a result of all of the improvements that are coming in in that location. Um, it's very important that we continue those existing capacities for people to have recreational pursuits and exercise opportunities and, and building it all together, making sure it all happens. And I, I do thank you and the officers, Councillor Davis, through you, Mr Chair, for the support that you have given my community in this regard. Now, um, Mr Acting Chair, I do want to really focus on something that is very important um, in this program, and it is in regards to not only the stormwater, the park infrastructure, the environmental corridor, and how it all comes together through our shared bikeways and pathways because we are embarking, and I, I referenced it yesterday, that there are a lot of areas of council who are working collaboratively to address a lot of the funding that we have in the LGIP, which is the Local Government Infrastructure Program, to bring together so many of these factors to create a fantastic outcome. So I refer particularly to service 3.4.3.1, and this is flood resilience planning, but it also incorporates a lot of drainage, and this is the Polara Open Spaced Integrated Network. So this will actually create, in stage one, a new wetland area, and then as it progresses through the various stages, it will provide capacity for multiple locations of stormwater drainage that can operate more effectively for the whole suburb, and particularly as this suburb is low-lying, but it is also very close to Oxley Creek and Blunder Creek. It lies between the two. So it is important that we address this, and given the high volume of new houses that have been built in that precinct and those, that suburb, we need to be doing this now, and that is why I am greatly appreciative of the fast-tracking of a lot of these funds. But the Polara Stormwater and Park Infrastructure Project will deliver not only stormwater drainage outcomes needed to support the rapid upstream residential development, but also it will allow us to create shared bikeways and pathways that will go essentially from one end of the residential area of Polara right up to our future district sports fields and the Polara State School. So this will allow a lot of these young people to ride their bikes to school without having to go onto the main roadway. So this is another way where we're looking to keep our younger members of our community safer but also active and healthy, utilising our absolutely fantastic park and environmental recreational corridors. So there is a multifaceted solution to a number of factors that we need to deliver to make our suburbs a better place to live, work, relax and travel around. So the majority of the land parcels have now been secured to enable delivery of stormwater drainage outcomes, which will benefit the entire catchment and reduce flooding risk. Acquired and still, be, still to be acquired parcels of land will also support those 
multiple outcomes, not only for drainage, but also park provision, improving water quality into Oxley Creek and also pro protecting biodiversity. So we are looking at all of these aspects and I think the fact that we have had such collaboration across divisions of council is an exemplar. It is something that we should aim to do in all that we do because the more we have this collaboration, we, the more we bring people together with the expertise, the better the outcomes we get for the residents of our city. And this is a long-term planning perspective that we have been working um, on to make sure that the residents benefit in the long term. So in 2022-23, site preparation and infrastructure delivery will commence for the first phase of the planned drainage network. This will see the delivery of an approximately 400 metres long vegetated channel, a one hectare wetland and installations of culverts under Veed Road Polara. So anyone who has happened to be in Veed Road would know that there are partial areas of it that uh, regularly flood over. Also in 2022-23 financial year, we will see the finalisation of design, site preparation and infrastructure delivery commencing for the second phase of the planned drainage network, which will include the provision of culverts under Sweets Road, Polara, the provision of stormwater pipes along Sweets Road and also recently acquired land parcels will be progressively cleared of any embellishments to commence the creation of the open space network that will be used in the future to provide not only the stormwater drainage but also to support those many multiple open space outcomes. So planning and design on future stages of delivery of this network will also progress. Now, Mr Acting Chair, I think it's really important to note that Polara is just one component of my ward and I've seen through Sheep Station Gully which traverses through Parkinson and Callum Vale and Algester and comes down to Paradise Road that that has benefited so many people. It is a corridor where most of the students from Algester State School and St Stephen's School can travel safely riding their bikes to school but also it's a great recreational corridor for people walking their dogs or just generally exercising and it also links to Callum Vale District Park which is very very important. <laughs> so this is going to be similarly replicated on the other side of my ward through Polara and I can say that funding in this suburb, particularly through what we have with the LGIP, has increased by $30 million. And that is so important because there is $20 million of stormwater infrastructure which has been brought forward through the LGIP. So this is a very positive and important way that since March 2020, this has all been advocated for and has been delivered by the Sharina Council for the people in this rapidly growing area. And so, Mr Acting Chair, I do say to all of the officers who have been working hard, who have got these great outcomes in mind as they're progressing through their daily tasks, thank you for the effort and energy that you have put in because it is greatly appreciated by my residents. Thank you. Uh, further debate? No further debate. Councillor Davis, please close the debate. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Chair, and I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, my colleagues uh, and councillors for their participation in the debate today. Uh, as we've heard, the Clean, Green and Sustainable program covers a range of initiatives from flood management um, right across to the improvement of our urban parks. And what's been demonstrated is that we are absolutely committed to maintaining a sustainable and resilient city, which is key to Brisbane's livability now and, of course, for future generations. And by delivering accessible uh, and well-designed parks and gardens, this program supports a connected and engaged community that embraces our environment. Uh, we've heard a lot of commentary, uh, Mr Chair, uh, in the Chamber uh, regarding our clean and green credentials. Uh, the opposition seems to have a very narrow view on what council does 
um, both in the carbon and sustainability space. Uh, we have maintained a carbon neutral status, um, has been meant at, which has been mentioned by a number of uh, contributors today, uh, since 2017. And it's something that we should all be proud of. Whatever side we sit in this chamber, we should be enormously proud that our city is carbon neutral. Um, and that is despite having a footprint that is 10 times, I have to say that again, 10 times greater than that of Sydney and Melbourne combined. So it's an outstanding result. Uh, Councillor Strunk mentioned Tasmania earlier, and um, you know I congratulate Tasmania on being um, carbon negative. Uh, but their achievement um, is is not really directly comp comparable to to Brisbane City Council, given the difference of scale, uh, which was mentioned by Councillor Mackay, um, but also the differences in geography, um, resources, and our energy systems. So while Brisbane is carbon neutral, this commitment. Um, does not directly include carbon stored in our uh, substantial urban forests, including bushland areas, uh, which is more than 400,000 street trees and trees in our extensive network of parks. So this year, uh, we're actually uh, partic participating in an international pilot to measure carbon storage uh, within our operations uh, and of actively working with the Australian Government's Climate Active Program to recognise this in our carbon neutral commitment in the future. So 400,000 street trees here in, um, in Brisbane are not included in that, um, in that calculation of our carbon neutral status. So it's even better than that. Uh, we actively work to reduce our carbon emissions across our operations. I think it's really important to restate this and they include switching to low emission vehicles in our public transport fleet. Um, we've delivered four new electric buses, um, which are currently being trialled along the City Loop services. Of course, the Brisbane Metro, which will be the largest solar installation. Uh, that's the building converting landfill gas at Rochdale into electricity uh, is enough uh, power to power to more than 3,000 houses uh, two hours and seven days a week for an entire year. So that's incredible. Carbon neutrality is a legitimate target and one that uh, cities and organisations around the world are setting to contribute to the global greenhouse gas emission reduction challenge. And once we have reduced our emissions, carbon offsetting is the only way to achieve carbon neutrality and it's an internationally recognised way uh, to take responsibility for unavoidable emissions. Um, I mentioned earlier that 89% of Council's investment in carbon offsets since becoming carbon neutral is in domestic offsets and renewable energy projects. Uh, and some examples of the projects that we've supported domestically inc include revegetation projects in South West Queensland uh, and, central, and Central and Northern New South Wales. I also mentioned one uh, today where we're working with Indigenous or, or a project with Indigenous communities. Um, however, purchasing carbon offsets, regardless of where they are produced, helps reduce the effects of climate change. In regards to comments, we have no way of legitimising the carbon credits we purchase. Well, that's just false, and uh, Councillor Mackay spoke to that. But all offsets um, that are purchased by Council must be eligible uh, for use under the Australian Government's Climate Active Carbon Neutral Standard for organisations, uh, which is a federal government organisation. Uh, Councillor Stree, uh, in his uh, contribution, um, you know, made a, an unfortunate, I think, comment that we are greenwashing. Uh, it's simply not true. We are actively working to reduce our carbon footprint here in Brisbane. Um, we are supporting the community to take action in their own homes, and whilst Councillor Shree feels that uh, it should go beyond uh, local households. We are doing our bit in Brisbane. But I can tell you that uh, talking to uh, some of the uh, participants in the Carbon Challenge, they are absolutely enthusiastic and are of the very strong belief that climate action begins at home and they are doing what they need to do and encouraging their friends and family members to, um, to strive to reduce their carbon emissions by half. Since 2017, we have actively reduced 172,748 tonnes of carbon dioxide from our operations, which is equivalent to taking more than 55,000 cars off the road. So these are real results, Mr Chair. We're not just talking about climate action, we are taking action. Uh, as mentioned, some projects we've invested in to reduce our operating emissions include the Metro, which I might point out uh, to Councillor Shree, will help reduce reliance on cars. 
Uh, we also are capturing landfill gases and turning it into energy at Rochdale Landfill. So the electricity that's generated from our landfills is enough to power more than, uh, as I said, 3,000 houses uh, for two hours and seven days a week. Uh, now to Councillor Cassidy. Um, in reference to your comments about Sean Cliff Escarpment, it was a Liberal administration that um, submitted the grant application to the federal government, and it was a federal Liberal government that approved that application. Um, uh, as for the Brighton Foreshore, um, as I uh, informed you last Friday, uh, the Shrina Council is committed to consulting with the community and developing a plan for the foreshore uh, this term, and that's exactly what we will be doing. Um, uh, I acknowledged the commitment from the uh, federal member uh, in terms of the uh, Brighton foreshore, uh, and I look forward to working with her once plans have been developed. Uh, at O'Callaghan Park, Zilmere, uh, just in case you're unaware, Councillor Cassidy, there are there's $400,000 allocated for upgrades there, and it will make a difference uh, to the park. So it includes upgrading the facilities at the youth space um, and uh, replacing, as you did mention, some uh, play equipment. Uh, Councillor Shrunk, you mentioned the Green Heart Fair, uh, which is an event we are very proud of, and uh, many councillors came to Victoria Park not so long ago at the uh, new site. There was a fantastic day. Uh, over 120 uh, participant, um, uh, participants were there. About 15,000 residents came along to enjoy a day. It was just an amazing opportunity to learn more about how to be more sustainable in your home, uh, but also provide them with a range of opportunities to speak to people, whether it was about resilience of their homes or whether it was how to compost at home or a range of other things. It was wonderful to see so many people getting engaged in this. And it goes to my point that uh, working to reduce our carbon footprint begins at home and having 15,000 people turn up to learn more about that, I think really speaks very strongly to, to that ambition. Uh, Councillor Johnston. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you weren't in the chamber uh, to hear my opening uh, remarks uh, where I discussed the Flood Resilient uh, Suburbs Project. Uh, we're still awaiting further information from uh, both the state and federal governments to their funding arrangement. Uh, however, we are having conversations with the QRA at the moment at officer level, and once those, decision, uh, once those discussions are finalised, we'll be able to develop a more tailored plan under that project line. Um, I appreciate your suggestion regarding uh, solar panels, uh, solar panels uh, lights in parks, but uh, my understanding is that these types of devices are more expensive to install and to maintain, uh, and we need to balance the benefits um, that they can provide. Um, I would like to direct uh, Councillor Johnson through you, Mr Chair, to some projects listed in the Suburban Works Program for drainage, construction and resilience under 3.4.3.1. Uh, Christensen Street, Yoronga has been included in the budget to continue drainage works to minimise flooding to residential properties. Councillor Johnson, you indicated that it was not in the budget at all. I'm simply telling you that it is there. Point of order. Uh, point of order, Councillor Johnson. Claim to be carried over. Uh, cl sorry, um, cl <laughs> claim to be claim to be misrepresented. Claim to be misrepresented, Councillor Davis. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Christensen, uh, Christensen Street, Yoronga is listed uh, uh, in this in the 22-23 budget. Uh, there's also 492,000 allocated to Brisbane Corso in Fairfield to reconstruct deeper gully box outside 76 Brisbane Corso and run the stormwater line from this gully box to the stormwater manhole chamber. Uh, this, and $240,000 allocated to Hart Street, Chelmer, to undertake some relief uh, drainage works. Councillor Davis, your time has expired. Thank you. I will now put the... Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Johnston, your point of misrepresentation. Ah, uh, yes. Um, Councillor uh, Davis uh, said that I had said that the money for Christensen Street was not in the budget. In fact, I made the point in my speech uh, that it had been cut in the third budget review by the LNP um, and it was being refunded again in 2022-2023. Uh, 
Uh, now, I will put the motion for the adoption of the Clean, Green and Sustainable City Program. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division seconded. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Hutton. Councillors, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Portally, would you please um, close, uh, sorry, lock the bars? And Clark, would you please read the results? Mr. Chair, as the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and one against. The motion is carried. I will now ask Councillor Allen to present the next program, Future Brisbane. Councillor Allen. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Chair. I move that the uh, Future Brisbane program, item one, the program budgeted financial statement as set out on page 23 for the years 2022-23 through to 2025-26 and two, the annual operational plan as set out on pages 90 to 40, so far as they relate to program four, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Allen and seconded by the Deputy Mayor that for the Future Brisbane Program 1, the program budgeted financial statement as set out on page 23 for the years 2022 to 2023 through to 2025, 2026 and two, the annual operational plan as set out on pages 90 to 94, so far as they relate to program four, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair, and I rise to introduce program four, Future Brisbane to the Chamber. Deputy Chair, the only reason Brisbane is one of the best functioning cities in this country is because we take the time to plan for the future. As Australia's fastest growing capital city, Brisbane is a destination with unstoppable momentum, rich in opportunity and by far one of the most desirable places to live, work and play. All eyes are on us as we continue to carefully plan for our future and make sure our city continues to thrive as an inclusive, prosperous and livable place for generations to come. In just over a decade, we will join the club of iconic Olympic cities, placing Brisbane firmly on the global stage. Hosting the Olympic and Paralympic Games is a once in a generation, or more likely a once in a lifetime opportunity. The next decade will sneak up on us quickly, so the preparation starts now. 
Mr Deputy Chair, we have a great responsibility to harness this growth and strategically leverage the opportunity presented to us. It's a pivotal moment in Brisbane's history. With that said, the Chamber is currently focused on the next 12 months and I'm pleased to outline today what we have on the agenda. It's not lost on us that our city has faced great challenges over the past couple of years. The COVID pandemic and recent severe weather event have caused significant hurt and pain to our residents and businesses. Our efforts are squarely focused on the rebuild and recovery of our communities to ensure these impacts do not sustain any longer than need be. Through this program, we will ensure that our planning systems remain responsive and agile to drive a strong recovery and guide the future development of our city and suburbs to build a better Brisbane. For all the good that this growth will bring, we are acutely aware of the pressures and the growing pains that may be experienced along the way. It's not surprising that more people want to live, work and invest in Brisbane. We've experienced unprecedented domestic population growth and with international borders reopening, this will only add to the influx. The supply of all types of housing, including affordable and life stage appropriate housing, is by far the biggest focus for this program. But as the Lord Mayor said, we are not alone in this challenge. All levels of government have a responsibility to pull their wake, take charge of their acknowledged responsibilities and use the specific levers available to them. For Council, this means ensuring we continue to unlock new opportunities for housing supply through land use and planning approvals. But it's not just about hitting the dwelling targets set upon us by the State Government's South East Queensland Regional Plan, specifically 188,000 new dwellings by 2041. Because, Mr Deputy Chair, we are well and truly meeting these targets and in many cases beating them. It is also about providing the right mix of housing in the right locations to ensure that Brisbane residents at every stage of life and in every situation have a place to call home. It's about creating livable and vibrant neighbourhoods that are attractive and diverse, that foster a strong local economy that is both resilient and competitive. We are a city with limited greenfield development sites, so it's not simply a factor of releasing more land. 94% of our city's growth will occur through infill development, and most of this will occur in just 7% of the city along key transport corridors and centre networks. That means we have to be smart about where and how we plan for new housing and supporting the infrastructure to cater for this growth. While the state government continue to let our most vulnerable residents down and fail dismally on their fundamental responsibilities to build more government housing, Council will continue to do what we can within our remit. With over 50,000 Queenslanders on the housing wait list and growing, what is the state government's response? They cut expenditure on social housing construction in their recent budget. It beggars belief. And the opposition leader's only response is to take $50 million in funding away from public transport to do the job the state government are clearly unable or unwilling to do. Mr Deputy Chair, Council are already doing the heavy lifting for the state across public transport and infrastructure, and we are not in a position to assume more of their responsibilities. Mr Deputy Chair, I fear to think what would happen if this city were in Labor's hands realistically Every chance they've had to support housing in this city has tended to be uh, reluctant. You know, there is a, a rhetoric that they uh, pursue that is very inconsistent with their records, and their voting record on neighbourhood plans is absolutely abysmal. Well, the community need not fear. The Shrina Council has a plan that will provide an agile and responsive approach to the supply and affordability of housing, support for improved employment opportunities and enhanced economic activity. The Lord Mayor announced in his budget a new and exciting initiative that leverages the levers the Council has available. A program of suburban renewal precincts to transform and revitalise underutilised parts of the city without compromising the things that residents love most about where they live. It's a proven model, having previously seen inner city areas like Newstead and Tenerife, South Brisbane and Woolloongabba reap the benefits of renewal to create some of the most sought after places to live in Brisbane. Right. 
We're now looking further afield to replicate this successful model and create opportunities for renewal in other suburb suburbs of the city. This is a program driven by pragmatism, not politics. Over the past year, we have undertaken a comprehensive review of the industrial strategy and our centre networks to map out how and where this model could be applied. Our industrial landscape is changing. If Brisbane is to remain regionally, nationally and globally competitive, our response to planning also needs to change. The integration of knowledge and technology in industrial activities will see Brisbane's industrial economy evolve towards more knowledge intensive, lower impact operations. It's an industry that will employ 13% of our workforce and contribute more than $22 billion of our economy by 2041. Mr Deputy Chair, when planning for new housing, we also need to consider planning for the jobs of the future. These two initiatives will work hand in hand to lead our city into the future. Later this year, a revised industrial strategy will be released and will outline how best to optimise the industrial land in Brisbane to ensure that our precincts continue to evolve to create modern, productive and sustainable economies. This leaves room for some of our underutilised industrial and retail precincts across the city to transform into new mixed use areas potentially encompassing residential, commercial, retail and low, pack, low impact industries. We will work in collaboration with the community and businesses to maximise the strategic opportunities that will help meet the demand for new homes and new local jobs. Through the Suburban Renewal Precincts Program, we will deliver a quicker and more responsive framework to unlock the unrealised potential in our suburbs to further enhance our suburbs as great places to live, work and relax. Mr Deputy Chair, this is one of the most exciting opportunities that we have before us and one that will shape the future of our growing city and particularly our suburbs for generations to come. Those opposite us in the Chamber may continue to fight these opportunities and oppose the construction of new homes and creation of new jobs in their local areas, but the residents of Brisbane can be assured that we have a plan to lead our city into the future in a way that will better, that will better determine the, the, uh, the future of this city and the things that we love most. Underpinning and enhancing this plan for renewal is the design and sustainability principles embedded in Program 4. We are a city built around nature and live our lives in the outdoors. With around 300 days of sunshine a year, it is necessary that our built environment reflects our open air lifestyle and subtropical climate. Green building design and quality architecture continue to be the leading focus when it comes to urban and suburban renewal. From new single homes to apartment complexes and office towers, we hold high standards and expect the building and construction industry to put their best foot forward to deliver for our residents. We have a comprehensive suite of design strategies and guides that will continue to shape the look and feel of our city and produce exemplary architecture and design that rivals the best in the world. Our de de um, development services team of planners, engineers and architects have the city's best interests at heart when assessing buildings for approval and we know they work hard to get the best outcome for our local communities. They undertake thousands of DAs a year and are constantly looking to achieve the best outcomes available. The beauty of performance-based planning schemes is that we can be flexible and responsive to site-specific scenarios and negotiate better solutions to the proposals at hand. But it's not just about the buildings themselves, it's also about the places and spaces in between, the transient spaces, the places to stop and gather, the routes to get you from A to B. Around every corner, in every nook and cranny, we want residents to be able to appreciate and enjoy the spaces that bring life to our city and create a def defining sense of belonging. The Future Brisbane program will continue to produce visionary documents and strategies to guide development, signature projects and programs that shape our city's future. Mr Chair, Brisbane oozes personality and charm. We have a unique and special history that needs to be celebrated and showcased. It provides a link to our past. It tells the story of change and evolution that has occurred in our city over time. It provides opportunities to write new histories that will shape the future character and identity of our city and suburbs. 
The Schroener Council has an outstanding track record when it comes to protecting and preserving our city's unique heritage and character, and this will only continue as we bring Brisbane on the journey of growth and renewal. Our local heritage register is stronger than ever, with over 2,200 local heritage places on the register and new listings and updated citations being added all the time. The continued protection of these iconic places and spaces will cement Brisbane's history forever. New heritage trails are being developed across the city to bring our history to the streets of Brisbane for everyone to explore and enjoy. And new artwork is being commissioned with a view to showcase and celebrate our cultural identity and heritage. Programs like Brisbane's Outdoor Gallery, Art Force and the ever popular Botanica Contemporary Art Outside are what make our city interesting and creative. This year's budget will continue to invest in our creative economy to support our local artists, makers, creators and inventors. While additional village precinct projects will be paused to prioritise rebuilding and recovery, we continue to deliver on our commitments and roll out these revitalised projects across the city with six projects underway this year. It's all part of our plan to build a better Brisbane, a city of vibrant and attractive neighbourhoods with more to see and do for everyone. Finally, Mr Chair, I'd like to touch on our program of infrastructure planning and coordination delivered primarily via the LGIP and LTIP, the glue that binds our city's growth together in a sequenced and supporting manner. Infrastructure charging and allocation is in everyone's interests. We continue to lobby the state government to increase or remove the infrastructure cap to ensure that the charging, and, uh, the charging framework better aligns to the cost of delivering infrastructure, which has risen significantly over recent years. The building and construction industry understand that when we build new homes for the city's residents, there is a natural demand on Council's broader infrastructure network and contribute based on the current caps. Council collects charges diligently, spends it strategically based on priorities and often determining these priorities is challenging. To make sure residents have the best quality of life, Council makes sure we invest in new parks, roads and drainage infrastructure within the realms of responsible financial management. It is critical that infrastructure is planned, coordinated and delivered in a way that supports the growth of our communities in a timely and orderly fashion. While infrastructure planning may not be as notable as other activities reflected in the Council budget, the outcomes pay dividends for the livability of Brisbane. In conclusion, Mr Chair, I mentioned at the beginning of this speech, planning is so important when it comes to managing the growth of the city. And in the case of Brisbane, we are a rapidly growing city. We need to put the policies and frameworks in place to support the needs of our growing city when it comes to housing, employment and infrastructure, while also protecting the things that residents love most about where they live. We are on the cusp of an exciting decade of transformation. Suburban renewal will breathe new life into the suburbs of our city and unlock exciting housing and economic opportunities for residents and businesses. We are committed to working hand in hand with the state government and the building and construction industry to shape the future of our city and ensure that it remains a great place to live, work and relax. And only this administration has the experience, expertise and leadership to deliver the best outcome for our residents. I want to thank all council officers who worked hard um, to make sure that the program for deliverables are achieved each year. Uh, it is a complex and extensive range of responsibilities that um, officers undertake to deliver future Brisbane, so I thank them for their efforts. In terms of the officers who assisted in the preparation of Program 4 in this year's budget, I'd like to acknowledge Division, uh, Divisional Manager David Chick, plus uh, Dr John Cowie, Peter Harwood, David Gard, Kath Shepherd, Dragon Mlad Onovich, and other officers who um, contributed to the process. I commend Program 4 to the Chamber. Thank you, Councillor. Further debate? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, Chair. And I don't believe Councillor Allen when he says, when he says that planning is important for this administration. Uh, because what we discovered in this budget <clears throat> before us today, well, the one page of expenses and, and expenditure, a capital expenditure uh, as much, much of the budget 
um, as that is, um, that this administration has abandoned neighbourhood planning. And we've been very critical of the process that this administration carries out when they develop a neighbourhood plan, but the importance of planning at a neighbourhood level uh, can't be un understated. But what we find out now uh, from Councillor Allen is that neighbourhood planning is done. Uh, it's finished. Once um, these existing um, neighbourhood plans that are currently under consideration um, are finished, two of them are currently at the final stage with the state government and another two are, are still working their th way through um, uh, that terrible process the LNP has put in place in local communities. But it's done. That's it. Councillor Allen said during the information sessions that any future budget, any future money for neighbourhood planning and any of the staff that work in that area are switching to the suburban renewal program. Yeah. And that's it. There's no more neighbourhood, no more, no more neighbourhood plans. That's what Councillor Allen said in the information sessions. So, you know, neighbourhood planning is really important. When you look. So the importance of, of good neighbourhood planning can't be understated, as I said. When you look at, when you look at the Sandgate neighbourhood plan uh, that was developed in the 1990s, uh, the, um, which was adopted into City Plan 2000, it was called a local area plan back then, and there were six volumes, uh, six formal council volumes, very thick books, that included um, planning for an entire community's growth. It talked about transport, about active transport, about public transport, about car transport. It talked about the social fabric of a community, the kinds of facilities that we need at a community level uh, and plan for the delivery of them at a local level. It talked about zoning as well and density and heights and things like that. And there were six volumes that there was an extensive community consultation process that brought people along with it and people accepted that. And, and that was a good planning process. But the one that we've just gone through in Sandgate, like so many others, is a bad planning process. Now, the LNP administration used to say it was an award-winning award neighbourhood plan process in their own heads. Their own heads. Um, that's right, Councillor Strunk. But when you look at how many of those plans won awards, it's a big fat zero. Now, they won no awards with their local communities and they won no awards with the planning industry. So um, the idea of neighbourhood planning is good, but when you execute it as badly as this LNP administration has done, uh, it turns out to be very bad. Um, thanks very much, Councillor Murphy. That's um, wonderfully insightful uh, interjections there. Um, I think he's finished his mumbling. Um, so not that's one right. neighbourhood plan, not one neighbourhood plan that's come through this place. They talk, uh, you know, they talk a lot about that affordable housing at the moment because they're being put under a lot of pressure. The LNP, but not one neighbourhood plan has any provisions for affordable housing in it. You know, we, we may have been able to support neighbourhood plans uh, if uh, re more recently, particularly, they had specific provisions for supporting affordable housing developments. You know, when, when we have seen, when we have seen that, um, uh, you know, specific plans around delivering affordable housing. We have LNP councillors and LNP state members campaigning against that. You just have to um, think of the Castledine urban village, uh, where a current LNP councillor campaigned against that and lost her state seat around that. So the LNP, the LNP have a pretty bad track record at all levels when it comes to affordable housing. Now I ask Councillor Allen how many, um, how many developer discounts in terms of infrastructure charges were given in the last financial year and he said that was $6 million. But can anyone guess how many discounts and the level of discounts that were given to ha affordable housing providers, say for instance MICA Housing or the Brisbane Housing Company to provide um, affordable rental properties? Any guesses? Anyone? Zero. 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 So this LNP administration, one of the first easiest and best things they can do to support the provision of affordable rentals is to work with ha housing providers, non-government housing providers, and make sure that those um, developments stack up economically. They are very marginal. We know that, and I'm sure if any LNP council actually took the time, go and sit down with Micah Housing or Brisbane Housing Company, they would welcome you to their offices to explain how difficult it is in Brisbane to deliver a affordable housing project, a rental project, um, that is financially, financially, financially viable for their institutional investors. So we've got a huge superannuation um, fund collectively in Australia that is looking for long-term investments. 
but they do need to get a return for their members. A very simple thing that this administration could do uh, in supporting the provision of affordable housing is working with them to offer discounts on affordable rental projects. That would get so many more across the line. Uh, we could partner around zoning in specific areas, um, around providing affordable housing, um, and in neighbourhood plans engage affordable housing providers to identify specific sites, talk to the community about the importance of that, and have them included in neighbourhood plans. But we're not going to be doing that anymore uh, because we no longer have neighbourhood planning, of course. Uh, Councillor Allen talked about green building design standards here in Brisbane, and they've been an absolute abject failure. Uh, and he said here just now, and I think this has been the approach that the LNP have taken in terms of designing green buildings, um, they, he said the LNP simply hope that the development industry does the right thing. So a, a council, one of the most fundamental things a council can do, apart from you know, taking rates and providing basic services in the suburbs uh, and giving people good value for money, uh, is um, being the control around development in our city. And, and it takes good leadership, that's right, Councillor Strunk. It takes clear leadership from our Lord Mayor and uh, the Civic Cabinet that's there supporting him every step of the way. But we just see, on simple examples like that, around green building designs or around the provision of affordable housing, there is no leadership there. Uh, for affordable housing, those providers are left to their own. They have to jump through so many hoops. A council makes it very difficult for them to get a project approved. And when it comes to green building standards, uh, the LNP just say that they hope the development industry does the right thing. Now, talking about development, um, we, we will be seeing uh, in the future a whole lot of new residential development on former uh, commercial and industrial sites, soon to be former. And Councillor Allen said, and he sort of alluded then that there's been 12 months worth of work going into this, he said at the information sessions that there are several sites that Council has already identified, but he's been very cagey about where they are, wants to leave it to the end of the year um, to announce them. So who, who has been involved in that process? I get that Council officers have obviously been looking at that uh, through the industrial strategy, but you know, has there been other, have there been other influences? Have there been other influences? No Councils on this side. Uh, I wonder if there are other, there are other influences um, who are behind the scenes uh, trying to push council in a particular direction and have a, have, a, have a direct line to the Lord Mayor and to the LNP chairs to, to identify sites secretly. Like, I don't understand what the secrecy is about this. If Councillor Allen says for the last 12 months the LNP have been working on a list of sites that they want to rezone uh, from industrial or commercial to mixed use or residential, tell, tell us where they are. He couldn't produce the list in the information session. Uh, I don't understand what their secrecy is all about. I presume one of those is the Toomble Shopping Centre. Uh, Councillor Allen has said he's been working very closely with Mervac, the owner. Um, uh, you know, he said that publicly. He's been working very closely, and we know they have some future plans for that site. And, and you know, the, the word that gets out in the community is residential increased density on that site. If you're going to have that conversation behind closed doors, Councillor Allen, through you, Chair, have it with the community as well. I mean, this is where this administration falls down when it comes to planning. Planning is important. Community-based neighbourhood planning is important. But when you shut the community out, but call it community planning, that's where you fall down. And that's where, that's where communities are left wanting. Uh, that's where they know that this LNP administration is getting further and further and further out of touch with the values and the priorities of, of local communities. So, you know, we will engage in this process, but you've got to be up front. You can't just keep a secret list behind closed doors. You know, walk it in as an amendment to city plan with three days' notice for councillors to have a debate and vote on that. Why don't you actually show some leadership and engage both at a community level and at a citywide level and try and take people along with you and be a bit more inclusive when it comes to planning? You failed on neighbourhood planning and you've abandoned that. And now you're going headlong into uh, this suburban renewal planning process, but you're already starting on a very, very, very bad foot. Further debate? Councillor Huang. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Chair. I rise to speak. Oh, Councillor Huang, your microphone's not on. Yep. Oops. Okay. We'll just start you again. Okay. 
Thank you. Okay, yeah, uh, Mr. Acting Chair, I rise to speak on program for of low mass 2022 to 2023 budget um, future Bris on future Brisbane. Uh, I would like to uh, first start by thank the, uh, the nominal opposition leader for his recycled political rhetoric that I've been hearing in years, I think since he became the, oppos the nominal opposition leader. And uh, yeah, it's just sort of spinning and without substances. But the uh, future of Brisbane is so important that we should you know, take it seriously and, uh, and debate the substance of the uh, program. Mr. Acting Chair, the Future Brisbane program provides planning and growth management to ensure our city continues to be prosperous and well designed. Through proper planning to ensure Brisbane continues to be a great place to work, live and relax. Brisbane is at, the, at, at the one of the fastest growing urban regions in, in Australia with strong population and employment growth while enhancing lifestyle opportunities and environmental outcomes for the city. This program is aiming at ensuring Brisbane continue to be Australia's most livable city and is well designed and e efficiently serviced. Mr. Acting Chair, I would like to take this opportunity to share with the Chamber the importance of uh, our award-winning neighbourhood plan in ML Plains. Uh, the ML Plains Gateway Neighbourhood Plan and why it is so critical to the future development of our city. Mr. Acting Chair, in 2017, Council released Brisbane Global Precincts, a shared vision for Australia's new world city. In this vision, in this document, both Upper Mangrovet and ML Plains were identified as a priority precinct. The neighbourhood planning process commenced in May 2019 with a draft strategy released for community consultation in November 2019 and the draft neighbourhood plan released for public consultation in November 2022. The ML Plains Gateway neighbourhood plan includes part of ML Plains and Rochdale, key economic growth area for our city. The new neighbourhood plan will focus on the proposed Brisbane Metro Station and nearby residential and commercial areas. The ML Plains Busway Station is a key transport station and is also proposed as the last interchange for the future Brisbane Metro. The busway station is already supported by extensive park and ride facilities on both sides of Mount Plating Road. The Brisbane Metro Depot is to be located within the ML Plains Gateway Neighbourhood Plan area on School Road in Rochdale. Construction works have commenced on, on the site and are expecting to be completed in mid-2023. The Brisbane Technology Park is located to the west of the existing ML Plains busway station between the Pacific Motorway and Logan Road. This is a significant employment cluster that contains more than 150 offices across 45 commercial buildings, which makes ma make a significant contribution to, our, to the city's economy. Two smaller business parks are located along Logan Road, including Garden City Office Park and Free Freeway Office Park. The neighborhood plan aims to update the land use planning framework for this strategic location in the city to facilitate its continued employment and residential growth and support the infrastructure investment already occurring in the area, such as the future Brisbane Metro. Mr. Acting Chair, the draft ML Plains Gateway Neighbourhood Plan provides housing choices in locations near schools, services, employment and public transport infrastructure and retains the existing low density residential housing in the balance of the neighbourhood plan area. It also supports the growth of uh, the Brisbane Technology Park by providing for increased building heights to six storeys in the balance of the precinct transitioning to eight storeys in the mixed industry and business core sub-precinct, whilst encouraging high quality urban design. And it continues to support the ongoing development and activation of Brisbane Technology Park by changing the zones from specialized center, which is major education and research zone precinct, to specialized center, um, include, uh, which is mixed industry and business zone precinct, which will support offers, research and technology, light, light industry and service industry users that currently make a significant contribution to a local economy and employment. It allows for other non-sensitive uses that support the nighttime economy, including bar, function facility and theater. Provide, it also provides community users as educational establishments, including technical institute and university, and, but not accommodation. 
function facilities, healthcare services, indoor sports and recreation, and food and drink outlet users that meets the need of workers and the businesses. It also encourages the, uh, development to improve local streetscape by providing landscaping, shade trees, and wider footpath in key locations. So there's more comfortable, comfortable pedestrian environment, particularly between the Brisbane Technology Park and the, the existing ML Plains bus, busway station. It, it also supports the consolidation of employment users who are strategically located close to major arterial roads and public transport so that businesses can access the Brisbane CBD, Port of Brisbane and Brisbane Airport. It continues to support the operation of the existing ML Plains busway station and surround, surrounding users and the future Brisbane Metro Depot on School Road by changing from the open space to special purpose zone. It also provides housing choices close to the future Rochdale busway station and existing employment through various residential zones in Levington Road, Underwood Road, Millers Road, and Logan Road. And it also supports, which is something I don't see the people really want, but it also supports the satellite hospital at 59 and 65 Levington Road by rezoning the site from emerging community to community facilities. The property to the south is also proposed to be rezoned to low median residential to reflect both existing development and provide for housing choices in close proximity to the proposed hospital. Supports, it also supports the ongoing operation of established places of worship, worship situated on Logan Road, Millers Road, and Underwood Road. It Point of order. Point of order, Jim. Point of order, order, order Councillor Cummings. Chair, I find this a very interesting speech on the neighbourhood plan that uh, Councillor Hun's talking about, but, uh, but uh, uh, as uh, for anything to do with the, the budget, uh, I find it lacking in any detail at all. So I would suggest he return to budget. Talk about the fact, the figures in the budget. Uh, well, Councillor Huang, you're speaking to the budget, uh, Councillor Cummings. Councillor Huang, please continue. Well, I thought I, I've been trying to give as much detail as I can and now I've been told it is, there's no detail in this. Yeah. So look, uh, the, uh, the, the Hemo Plain Gateway neighbourhood neighborhood plan supports the ongoing operation of established places worship situated on Logan Road, Millers Road and Underwood Road. And it also protects additional trees for their landscape value under the significant land, landscape tree overlay. It also provides for the future Brisbane Metro by strengthening as well as re reinvigorating the role and function of the neighbourhood plan area as the city's southern anchor. It provides opportunity to attract and retain advanced technology and manufacturing industries at key locations to support employment growth within the study area. It was also informed by the neighbourhood planning process and uh, involved a number of community engagement exercises, including community uh, planning team meetings, information kiosks, newsletters, e bursts interactive mapping and online survey. The draft strategy was released for community consultation from 18th November to 16th December 2019. Council received 65 comments in response which addressed a range of matters. The draft neighbourhood plan was released for public consultation from 8th November to 6th December 2021. And Council received 22 submissions with 20 properties properly made and once adopted, the plan will be part of city plan and will be used to guide and uh, assess um, de development. Mr. Acting Chair, as a local councillor, I understand the importance of this neighbourhood plan and took great personal interest in ensuring we can do it right from the beginning, which is why I have attended almost every public consultation opportunities, whether it's a committee forum or an information kiosk in the shopping centre. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all the officers involved in the delivery of this neighbourhood plan who have put in countless efforts in making sure we deliver the best outcome for the residents and this, and this city's future. And I was briefed recently by the, on the amendment package proposed for adoption. During the briefing, the following key issues were raised. The process undertaken to date regarding the preparation of draft ML plans, gateway neighbourhood plan, including timing consultation findings are and key changes arising from the committee feedback. Proposed outcomes for the Brisbane Technology Park, in, including proposed change to zones, precincts, heights, setbacks, and co accessible land use to encourage nighttime activation. Uh, Mr. Acting Chair, look, I still got plenty of uh, 
detailed information I would like to share with the chamber. However, I think my time is about to finish. So uh, I would like to once again congratulate Lord Mayor and also the uh, chair for uh, ne ch the chair responsible, uh, Councillor Adam Allen, for the good work uh, you have uh, delivered for my area, and I commend the program to the chamber. Further debate, Councillor Shri. Thanks, Chair. Rise to speak on program four. I um, thought I'd reflect briefly on one of the crucial questions our city is grappling with, which is where, where do we house people? Um, and then I want to just talk more specifically about um, one of the administration's biggest failures um, and, uh, and I think a pretty glaring broken promise that um, in terms of deep planting commitments and changes in the neighbourhood plan that should have happened several years ago but still haven't happened. Um, I've obviously been quite critical in this chamber of the style of developments which the administration has approved, but also the um, different parts around the city where densification has tended to occur. And I, sometimes my critique is part, primarily based on the fact that there's no public housing and affordable housing in, involved in specific developments, but sometimes it is purely a critique that we're housing people in the wrong types of housing in the wrong parts of the city. Uh, and the mayor obviously takes great exception to the um, suggestion that we shouldn't be allowing more high density development on flood prone areas. Um, I think that's a bit silly of him and I think that's a bit silly of the LNP, silly of the LNP administration. Uh, it's quite obvious to anyone who cares to check the historical record and the hydrological maps and who talks to people who have a bit of critical distance from the question but still some expertise in the area and I'm talking particularly about urban planners, architects, etc. It's quite obvious to all those people that we shouldn't be building more high density residential development on sites that are extremely prone to flooding. Um, and so it, when we talk about future planning and this budget program, it's, I can't help but roll my eyes a little bit because the LNP is in denial about the realities um, of the challenge in future our city is facing. We know that climate change is gonna mean sea level rises, we know it increases the likelihood of severe flooding and more frequent flooding. So for the LNP to continue to approve developments in some of these areas, I think is very short-sighted and deeply concerning. The happy news, though, is that um, not all of Brisbane is flood-prone. And um, one of the areas that the city, unfortunately, has failed to densify sufficiently uh, over the last decade or two are around um, what might be described as the, the suburban shopping nodes. And, and there's been a little bit of densification around um, Garden City and, and, and Mount, Mount Cravat Shopping Centre and a little bit of densification around the Chermside Shopping Centre. But um, there's almost a gap there where the council ha and the property industry have, have encouraged development just beyond the periphery of the um, shopping centre site. And so you still then end up with these large sprawling open air car parks immediately next to the high density, uh, immediately next to the, the shopping centre and, and the public transport hubs. And when you look at an aerial map of these precincts, it's quite stark because um, you often have a situation where there'll be some low density housing and some parks and then some newer medium density to high density apartments. And then this uh, uh, essentially car-centric wasteland, which is very hostile to pedestrians, where pedestrians uh, who uh, are having to walk across a um, big bitumen-heavy open-air car park to get to both the shops and to the public transport um, that they're trying to catch to wherever they want to go. Instead, what the council can and should be doing is recognising that it is the open-air car parks of these shopping malls themselves that pre presents one of the best opportunities to house more people without displacing existing residents, without destroying green space and without concentrating development on low-lying flood-prone areas. And obviously, I should be very clear that I'm not counting Toomble in this and I don't think we should be developing um, on the Toomble shopping centre car park because that's very flood-prone. Um, but when you look just at, the, at Chermside alone, there's thousands and thousands of square metres of, of land there, which is just bitumen car parking, where you could very easily build medium-density apartments above the car parks, that would mean that people are within close walking distance to um, public transport hubs, to work opportunities, to services, to shops, to community facilities, etc. Uh, the reason that that had, hasn't happened is that, be, is that the council hasn't been proactive enough about working with some of those large shopping, shopping centre landholders. 
but it's also um, because the economics of the property industry is such that developers just want to build wherever it's cheapest and most profitable, profitable to do so. And so while the LNP pretends that they're agnostic about where development occurs and they don't want to interfere with the market, et cetera, et cetera. The LNP is interfering with the market every day. The council administration imposes very strict regulations on um, what kinds of development can occur where, um, sometimes to the point of ridiculousness, um, uh, where, for example, a, a music recording studio isn't allowed in an industrial area, even though that's probably the best location for a noisy land use. Um, but the council is, is simply allowing developers to build where it's most profitable to do so, and that tends to be on flood-prone land that um, is, to be honest, quite marginal, and, and, and the land is cheap because it's flood-prone, and so that's the, where the developers want to build, but it doesn't ma make the most sense to build there in terms of the well-being and um, welfare of those future residents. So there are other opportunities across the city. Uh, obviously, I think we should also be taking stronger measures to. Uh, make better use of empty homes and the census data is due out in a couple of weeks and it'll be very interesting to see how many empty homes are identified in the most recent census because that census was conducted during uh, lockdown um, and when a lot of travel restrictions were still in place. So homes that were empty on census night are more likely to be homes that are long-term empty and we'll be looking very closely at that data. Uh, we do know that there are thousands of homes empty across Brisbane and that if we're trying to deal with the housing crisis the lowest hanging fruit is to um, fill up some of those empty homes and force investors to rent them out. But in addition to concentrating new development um, on suburban, uh, on some of those large sprawling suburban shopping centre car parks around key suburban hubs, we also need to be talking about how we can retrofit and um, adaptively reuse existing buildings. And I think this is where the devil's in the detail in terms of this announcement about uh, more residential housing in industrial areas. It's it, particularly concerning, obviously, if we're planning to build on, on fl floodplains, and I would object to that strongly. But furthermore, it's, it's quite environmentally unsustainable to be knocking down existing buildings that aren't necessarily very old and, and replacing them with new apartment blocks. It is better, where possible, to renovate and retrofit those buildings to turn them into housing. Right. And, and there are a few good examples, there are a few good examples of this around the city. Um, a few older warehouses, or in, including a few heritage warehouses, I think at Newstead, where um, developers have been creative enough to be able to turn those old buildings into new apartments. And I think, generally speaking, that's better for the environment, but it's also better for the surrounding community because the construction impacts of simply retrofitting or redesigning an existing building tend to be a, a lot lower than completely demolishing a structure then digging out new foundations and bringing in heaps of new materials. Um, that has a big impact on the surrounding neighbourhood in terms of dust, noise and traffic impacts. So there, I think, does need to be more space in, in the Council's planning for future development to think about how we can encourage reuse of existing buildings rather than the very unsustainable approach of demolishing and then building something completely new, particularly when materials, etc., are so expensive. But as flagged, I want to use the last two minutes to highlight um, the broken promise and the lie that the LNP administration has um, perpetrated upon this city. Uh, and I want to direct people back to the, the Brisbane Future Blueprint document um, or from, I think it's page 12, uh, if the page num the document doesn't even have page numbers, but anyway, I'll just read it out. Um, Proposed to amend Brisbane City Plan 2014 to increase the requirement for deep planting areas from 10% of the site to 15%. That would, that would require new developers of high-density apartments to set aside 15 per cent of their site area for deep-planted trees. That's only a slight change. Currently, it's 10 per cent. The LNP commitment, after a lot of public pressure from various environmental groups and residents associations, was to say, we're going to increase that deep-planting requirement by 5 per cent, uh, a small but a, 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 plaud, like a, a laudable target. Um, Graham Quirk signs his name to it, says, look, I'm listening to the people of Brisbane, I'm going to do this. Um, it says there in that document that the LNP would start this change within six months. It's been a little more than six months since 2018. So I, I, I guess I'd like an ex explanation from Councillor Allen um, or anyone else who cares to stand up and discuss this topic. Why did the LNP lie to the people of Brisbane? Why have you broken this promise? Why did you tell people that you would require developers to include more trees in new developments and then fail to do it? This is, a, um, I think, a really egregious betrayal by the LNP. 
where they, they made a clear promise in writing, Quirky put his signature to it, it's there and it's not black and white, it's white text on a blue background, it's there in white and blue, and you haven't done it. You lied to the people of Brisbane, and I think the people of Brisbane deserve an explanation as to when that change will happen and why you can't go higher than 15%. I obviously think the target should be 20% deep planting at a bare minimum. Thanks. Um, I note the time now at 3.17. Councillor Landers, uh, could you please move an adjournment for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, please? Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councils have left the meeting. Seconded. We move by Councillor Landers, seconded by Councillor Hutton, that this meeting of Council be adjourned uh, for uh, 15 minutes, and which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Councillors, we'll continue the debate on Program 4, Future Brisbane. Further speakers? Councillor Toomey. Thank you, Deputy Chair. And uh, I rise to speak on uh, Program 4 and specifically uh, the VPP component of this program. Mr Deputy Chair. To your right, Councillor Mackay. It's all about Ashgrove. Um, uh, Mr Deputy it's Chair, um, the VPPs... Oh, Councillor, uh, sorry, Councillor, your microphone is flashing. We may have to just reset. Thank you. Now, please begin again. Uh, I, I will take Councillor Mackay's interjection. Yes, this is, uh, this is about Ashgrove and the VPP Ashgrove, which Mr Deputy Chair started uh, approximately two years ago uh, under uh, the Deputy Mayor's uh, custodianship of planning and has been completed. Uh, under Councillor Allens. Um, Mr Deputy Chair, it's worth noting uh, that the VPP for Ashgrove uh, and similarly Park Road in your ward was set out with the intent of beautifying the area, but at the same time delivering a walkable strip shop along with uh, boulevards for customers, people to go. A walking boulevard, if you will, for people passing by to, to come down and enjoy the local area. Um, to say that that uh, was the final outcome for Ashgrove is a bit of an understatement, Mr Deputy Chair. I have to admit that the VPP has, uh, for Ashgrove has been outstanding. Uh, going into this process, we had a number of uh, small shops, small spaces that were vacant. There were no businesses there. Um, there weren't any people walking in. The area was, was hot. The reflected glare off the road was blinding. And in some cases, that glare would actually stop people from dining on the footpath. Uh, now, what we see in Ashgrove and what you will see in Park Road is the reduced amount of glare, reduced amount of reflected heat from the roadway. The traffic islands in the area have been turned into plazas where there's plenty of seating wide open spaces, deep planting, large trees have been put in to shade the area. And in particular with Ashgrove, we've used Flindersia australis. I know. I'll take that interjection again, Councillor Mackay, uh, because Flindersia australis is also known as the crow's ash. Now, a little bit, little bit of history here. Ashgrove gets its name from the crow's ash. So we've actually tied the plantings that have gone into the VPP back to the heritage name of where, the Ash, where Ashgrove came from. Not only that, not only that, the Flindersia australis seed pod has a very distinctive um, shape. It's a bit like a prickly pear in, the, in, the, in its form. And when it opens up, it opens up with five fingers and then the seeds, uh, the seeds blow off into the wind much like a helicopter blade. We've actually commissioned artwork to go into the area with the separate stages of that seed pod opening. And it's actually quite stunning when you look at them. They've been uplit as well, so they provide a, a point of interest at night for, for people passing through the area, as well as <coughs> the additional lighting that's gone into the seating. So now we have plazas and areas where we have 
a lot of foot traffic coming through, uh, where people can actually sit down and enjoy the local area. We have a number of uh, cafes and restaurants. Uh, there's a couple of wine bars there now, Mr Deputy Chair, that are all benefiting from the continued support of having this VPP. It's actually opened up the whole area. The footpaths are wider than they were before, in some cases up to half a metre. Now, we heard Councillor Shree saying before that this administration is all about making roads wider, not when it comes to VPPs. We're making footpaths wider. And this has been improved the whole area. We now have areas where uh, pedestrians can walk through, cyclists can get through quite easily, and the additional seating that's gone into the place is ergonomically designed so that the customers who frequent the cafes and the restaurants can sit down and enjoy the new vistas that have been created in this area. Mr Deputy Chair, one thing that we did do through the whole VPP section and one thing that you will see with the Park Road VPP is the improvement to the footpath. Uh, large areas of footpath have been put in and supported by plantings along the way. All these plantings provide uh, shade and traffic points so that pedestrians will actually walk where they're supposed to. So one thing that we've noted uh, around schools uh, in my ward is that the kids don't cross the road where there's a garden bed. They won't actually walk through the garden bed to cross the road where they're not supposed to. So rather than using hard fixed fences or concrete block blocking bollards, I should say, uh, we put in garden beds and it greens up the whole strip and it actually channels people into walking into the right direction. The other thing uh, that we did do in that area, Mr Deputy Chair, was we assisted, I can say that, we can assist the drivers in reducing their speed. And we've done this through a number of innovations. One was introducing uh, pinch points along Waterworks Road. We couldn't change the speed of the Waterworks Road, but we could change the perception that you could drive uh, through that area at speed. So we put in a number of pinch points uh, along with line marking that gives the impression that the road has been narrowed. And as a result of that, we've noted that the drivers passing through that West Ashgrove area slow down. Now, I do note that this is one of the outcomes that we're hoping to see for Park Road. And as a cyclist, I ride through that Park Road area to get onto the river loop. And this will be of benefit in that area. And I know the officers will be looking at this as a solution for the Park Road VPP. The other thing I note with the, with, the pay, uh, with the Park Road VPP is you've got a park there already in the middle of the, the strip. Uh, and a lot of that area, Mr Deputy Chair, will be stunning. Some of the installations with respect to the seating, the lighting around the seating, just invites people into the area. And as you have one at one end of uh, Park Road, you've got the train station. In terms of Ashgrove, we've got the 385, which is a high frequency bus service. We're noting that a lot of residents are coming from outside of the Ashgrove area. They come into the precinct, they grab a glass of wine, they sit down at the cafes, they enjoy the restaurants, and then they're jumping back on the bus and heading back home. And this is actually reducing the amount of parking, parked traffic in the area. And that's, that's one thing that was also highlighted during the consultation that we did for this whole precinct. Mr Deputy Chair, I mentioned the introduction of plazas at uh, West Ashgrove. And uh, originally these plazas were large swales of concrete traffic islands that we actually dug up. And we increased them, uh, the green space on them. So we planted them out. Additionally, with this particular project, because we had to introduce some shade, we've actually put up trellises. And we're using native fauna to grow up over the trellises to provide that natural shading and give those, those uh, native climbers the, the structure that they need to work off. Mr Deputy Chair, this is actually uh, a project that I am actually very, very proud of. And I'm glad to see that it's coming uh, into Milton at Park Road. 
This project is one of the best projects, I'd have to say, I, I say that with a bit of reluctance, one of the best projects that has been done in Ashgrove, second to the Gresham Street Bridge, uh, purely from an engineering point of view, I was absolutely fascinated with Gresham Street Bridge. But to say that uh, this is a truly spectacular project in terms of visual amenity, in terms of inviting pedestrians into the area and residents into the area to enjoy the local area, uh, this has been an outstanding success. With just a few minutes left, Mr Deputy Chair, I do want to, um, I do want to thank the officers uh, for one part of the project um, was to introduce a new shelter. Now the shelter is quite unique uh, in terms that it was there to shade one of the local businesses, but the concept that the officers came up with was truly outstanding. The new shelter is very similar to the Wickham Street uh, air raid shelters. Uh, very unique structure, the up lights and everything in there are absolutely fantastic. And we've done this deliberately as a bit of a nod uh, to the service personnel at the Inogra Barracks. And we do want to tie in that Ashgrove was a jumping point for many of our service personnel in Ashgrove before they went off to both World War I and World War II. And that's the primary reason that we've put this sh shelter into place, Mr Deputy Chair. The shelter itself will also act as an outdoor Councilor dining... Councillor Toomey. Your time has expired. Such a shame, Deputy Chair. Thank you. Uh, further debate, Councillor Johnston. Thank you. I rise to speak on program four. Um, and I want to start by um, the Lord Mayor, who's been absent from the chamber for, I'd say, 90 per cent of the um, debate on uh, the budget. Uh, started this uh, budget process last Wednesday with some of the most outrageous lies that have ever been said uh, again, in this council chamber. Councillor, uh, we spoke about this before, yep. about calling councillors liars in this chamber. There is a more appropriate language to be able to use. I request that you please do so. Well, please continue. the Lord Mayor um, flat out lied about me, and there's no other way to describe it, I'm sorry to say. Um, the Lord Mayor stood up in this place and said two things that were absolutely untrue. Um, and I note that the language being used by other chairs is very significantly different to what the Lord Mayor said. The Lord Mayor said the following two things, and I'm paraphrasing here. Firstly, um, that councillors, and me specifically, uh, was named, uh, vote against houses in their own local areas. And secondly, um, that uh, councillors, uh, including myself, are to blame for the housing affordability crisis. Now, both of these statements are a lie. I actually went back and had a look at uh, my comments to um, the council town planning officers about houses in my area. Uh, and I can tell you now, in writing, there are dozens and dozens of uh, comments back to councillors where it says the following. I do not object to the house. I do have concerns about the character issues related to the design of the extension or the demolition. And then I go on to raise a number of uh, non-compliance issues with the character code. So the Lord Mayor has publicly lied about me Again, and my Councillor actions. Johnston. The Lord Mayor has publicly lied about no, me Councillor and Johnston, my no, actions. No, no, no. Councillor Johnston, I've said before, calling someone a liar is not appropriate in this place. And there are multiple different words that you could use to express your dissatisfaction or your disagreement it's with what he was said. It's what not he said. dissatisfaction or so, disagreement. So, Councillor Johnston, I'm asking you again, refrain from calling people lies. That rule applies to everyone here. I'm sorry, there is no other word to describe what the Lord Mayor did. No, there is. Uh, there is. There You're is a very a capable person, and I know that you can come up with another word, and that word is not liar. The speech was printed in advance. It was um, undertaken in front of all the journalists in Brisbane. It's been published on the Council website. And not only is it a lie, it is defamatory about me. Um, secondly, uh, the Lord Mayor has said um, that I am to blame, along with um, Labor councillors and Councillor Shree, for the housing affordability crisis. Now, obviously, this is also a lie. 
Um, no, the, again, Councillor Johnston, I keep asking you to cease calling another councillor or the Lord Mayor a liar in this chamber. It is unsuitable meeting conduct. And again, I'm asking you again, please refrain from calling him a liar use other language the Lord Mayor um, tells or ultimately lies, I will and he's need told to lies about me in this place during the budget debate that are demonstrably untrue and there you he go has, you were able to has, use another word other than no, liar. there's no other word to describe there is. it it's a and lie. Again, when someone Johnston. says something that is deliberately untrue it is a lie and that is what the Lord Mayor did no, last Councillor Johnston it is unsuitable meeting conduct. I'm asking you to refrain from using or calling another council or the Lord Mayor a liar. And if you continue to do so, then I request that you cease that conduct. What I've said is the Lord Mayor has said lies and said lies about me, and that is inappropriate. And I would have thought that, Mr Deputy Chairman, you weren't in the chair when he did it, but it was obviously a contentious issue here. The Lord Mayor has repeatedly lied, and as a civic leader of this place, Councillor Johnston. I am entitled to raise my concerns with his action in this debate, which is the portfolio in which we are discussing. And now, you are, Councillor Johnston, wait a minute, wait a minute, please. Wait. Mm -hmm. You are entitled to raise your concerns. You are entitled to speak on the issues that he spoke about. And again, I'm saying to you that calling the Lord Mayor a liar or any councillor calling another councillor in this place a liar is unsuitable meeting conduct. The Lord Mayor has lied about me and other councillors and there is no other way to describe his deliberate actions last Wednesday other than to say he stood up, he made completely false and unsubstantiated statements about them, about me. He made them deliberately because they're written and printed in the budget book uh, that was printed well in advance of his speech. That speaks to his deliberate motive, uh, his intent to lie publicly about my actions. Now, they are demonstrably false. And it is wrong that the Lord Mayor, a civic leader in this place, can stand up and say things that are untrue. And I note that his civic chair people have not repeated the same statements. And the Lord Mayor has left himself very exposed here and council. And I am still, I am still trying to correct the record, which is the first issue here, and you are trying to stop me. So just be clear. When I take this further, this is going to form part of um, what I'm going to show to those people, whether it's the OAA or the Supreme Court, that I've tried to correct the record here and you are interfering and trying to stop me from well, doing so. Councillor Johnston, to correct the record and for the purposes of whatever you choose to bring, to. then let the record clearly show that I am not stopping you yes, from you debating. What I am saying to you is that directly calling the Lord Mayor or any other councillor in this place, a liar is unsuitable meeting conduct, and that rule applies to every councillor in this chamber. And I'm not specifically fact, pointing you out. The only so, councillor Johnson, Johnson, you that's can continue been kicked on. out of this place for saying the word lie is me. Um, the only councillor. No, and, and other councillors. Councillor Shree said it earlier today, and you did nothing. No, and councillor. He did. Councillor you Johnson. You didn't hear him, and I, it did. Well, if I didn't hear him, then you he just... He said it, though, but you just let it go. But wait a minute, you just said that... I don't want to argue I... with you. This is my time. No, 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 wait a minute. If wait you're going to warn me, Councillor warn Johnston. me so I can continue my speech, then Councillor Johnston, you do what you're going to do, I but consider... I need to um, Councillor Johnston, speak stop. in this. Councillor stop. You know the rules. When I speak, you do not speak. Well, get on and, and do what sit you're going to do. Councillor Johnston, I consider that you are displaying unsuitable meeting conduct in accordance with section 21.4 of the Meetings Local Law 2001. I hereby request that you cease calling councillors in this chamber a liar and refrain from exhibiting the conduct. Councillor Johnston. Uh, Mr. Um, Mr Deputy Chair, I think you might want to amend that. I've only called the Lord Mayor a liar. I haven't called other councillors in this place a liar. And you're going to put on the record that I've called other councillors a liar, which is fundamentally no. untrue. Councillor Johnston, the Lord Mayor is also a councillor in this chamber. One, so I've called the Lord Mayor a liar, but not other councillors, which is what you've just put in the public record. No, you just admitted to that. No, so please I continue didn't admit to anything. Your... That's what you've said. I mean, we can keep going around, right, or you can continue the conversation. We will keep going because the Lord Mayor stood up in this place on Wednesday and publicly lied about me and my actions, and that is unacceptable. It should have been stopped at the time, and it was not. 
So um, I'm just going to put on the record now that the Lord Mayor should stand up, withdraw his statements that he made last week that were completely false and untrue. He should apologise to me and the other councillors in this place um, that he lied about and defamed. And he should Point of order, ask Mr. for our. He should ask. Councillor Johnston, wait a moment. Councillor Owen, order, point of order. Um, Thank you, Mr Acting Chair. You have given a clear direction and um, that is being disobeyed in the, this place and I seek your ruling. Thank you, Councillor Owen. Councillor, Councillor Johnston has been given a request to cease her conduct and I'm allowing her the opportunity to continue appropriately. Councillor Johnston. And the Lord Mayor needs to stand up and apologise and withdraw those statements now. Uh, Councillor Johnston, your microphone. The Lord Mayor needs to stand up and uh, apologise and withdraw those statements now. Um, now we weren't allowed to move dissent in the ruling last week. We weren't allowed to, uh, and Councillor Griffiths is here now too. We weren't allowed to uh, ask for those to be withdrawn last week. The chairperson stopped us deliberately from doing so, um, and this is now the opportunity that I have in this portfolio to demonstrate that the Lord Mayor was absolutely loose with the truth and absolutely lied about my conduct last week. And it is not acceptable and he needs to withdraw and apologise. Um, with regards to Future Brisbane, um, the biggest issue obviously is the LNP's um, decision to somehow, just off the back of an envelope, decide that industrial land is now going to be converted into residential land. Uh, land. There's been no discussion with the community about this. Uh, I represent suburbs now, uh, Tennyson, Yurongpilly, Yuronga and Oxley, um, that have uh, industrial lands adjoining residential lands. They are all flood prone, all of them. Um, we don't know if they are at risk. What we do know is Councillor Allen has a secret list of sites that this council has been working on over the past 12 months that they intend to rezone, and he will not share that with uh, the people of Brisbane. Um, we heard it earlier today. So he needs to stand up and say uh, what the criteria is uh, for this. He needs to say how the amenity issues are going to be dealt with because the CARS officers in this organisation know that the biggest ongoing problems we have are where residential properties adjoin industrial properties. And this council is repeatedly in court. Councillor Johnston, repeatedly in court. your time has expired. Further speakers? Lord Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. Well, I can say that there's definitely one person in this chamber who has no respect for other councillors and no respect for the rules of this place uh, and is creating a, an unhealthy workplace for all of us. And that is Councillor Johnston. Let me, uh, Councillor Johnston has asked me to um, correct the record. I will correct the record and I will remind councillors exactly what was said in my budget speech. I will read it exactly word for word. In Brisbane, we also have the perverse situation where Labor, Green and independent councillors continue to actively oppose the construction of new homes in their area. Make no mistake, this concerted opposition is only serv serving to worsen the affordability crisis and genuinely threatens to lock future generations out of the opportunity to own their own home in Brisbane. It is disingenuous and wrong to say that you care about housing affordability if you oppose virtually every new application to build new homes. Where is anything in that that is untrue? Where is anything in that that is not 100% true? Because it is. In fact, it's 110% true. Now, it doesn't take a lot to show exactly what I have said. Uh, let's have a look, for example, at the record of voting on things like neighbourhood plans. Let's have a look at the number of petitions that have been put in against development. So, now, Councillor Johnson obviously has never opposed a development in her life, according to what you would hear today, but what about the petition that she lodged to stop five-storey development in Sherwood and Corinda? Head petitioner lodged the petition, Councillor Johnston. Is stopping five-storey development in Sherwood and Corinda opposing new homes being built in your ward? Yes. There we go. It's so simple to prove that she has opposed new homes in her ward just by a simple Google search. 
one simple thing. So egg on her face here, egg on her face. But you know what, there is no, there is no laughing matter here because this is a serious matter. Councillor Johnston. Homes, 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 homes. Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, enough. I've got the speech here, it says homes. And you know what, if you want to argue about houses or homes, the reality is you are, you are opposing places where people live in your ward. Whether they be homes, apartments, townhouses, anything, you have opposed them, Councillor Johnston. Now, let's have a look at the record of Labor councillors when it comes to opposing... Oh, I will be very, very careful. I will be very, very careful. And look, I... Um, Look, I know there's a standing offer for Councillor Cumming um, to join the team, but I've just had a look at his record, and it is not flash. It is not flash. Let me have a look here. One, two, three, four, five, six different petitions opposing development in his ward. Councillor Cumming, one of the worst offenders. But Councillor, Councillor Cumming, Councillor Cumming is not the worst offender. Who, who would you imagine would be the worst offender? Well, no, look, um, Councillor Griffiths sort of makes a big song and dance about it, but his record is not as bad as one particular councillor. Any, guess, any more guesses? You're, you're guessing Councillor Cassidy? I can understand why you would see that. Um, no, it also starts with C. Councillor Cook. Councillor Cook is the worst when it comes to lodging petitions against development. Let's have a look. Number one, stop the townhouse development at Pockley Street, Morningside. Councillor Cook. Number two, uh, stop the childcare centre, Oxley, Oxley Street Roundabout. Councillor Cook. Uh, stop development at 2 Oxford Street, Belimba. Councillor Cook. Stop the development of 10 Bede Street, Balmoral. Councillor Cook. Stop Seven Hills eight-storey development, Councillor Cook. Stop townhouse development at 96, uh, 95 Barton Road and 27 Janolan Avenue, Hawthorne, Councillor Cook. Stop the overdevelopment of Camp Hill, Councillor Cook. Now, this is just one part of the picture, but it, it's a pretty damning example of just how active they are in opposing development, at development and particularly when it comes to places for people to live, in particular. But I guess what takes the cake is the extraordinary speech that we heard from the Leader of the Opposition before, where the people who have been the biggest critics and attackers and underminers of neighbourhood planning now come running to its defence. They called it the award-winning neighbourhood planning the, Councillor Cassidy said it was award-winning. Yeah, for you, sir. I got it. Do you think it's award-winning or not? But the reality well, is, you, for years and years and years, councillors on Point the other order. side, uh, especially, Lord, especially Labor councillors, claim Councilor to be Cassidy, misrepresented there. <laughs> Councillor Cassidy uh, claimed to be misrepresented, Lord Mayor. Have attacked and criticised and undermined, and not only that, they've also voted against neighbourhood plans left, right and centre. And now, now, when we are evolving our approach, they are outraged. Why might you think that would be, Councillor Murphy? Would it be, would it be for cynical political reasons, maybe? Would it be that their major political strategy for the last decade plus has been opposing development, and now suddenly they've realised, oh, crap, we've got a problem here? As I said, the other day, the chickens are coming home to roost, but it is not a thing that should be laughed at or joked about because it is a serious issue. Now, let's have a look at just some of the neighbourhood plans that Labor councillors have voted against. Turinga, Hemant Lytton, the city centre, Albion, Dutton Park Fairfield, City West, The Gap, Fernie Grove, Upper Kedron, Cooper and Districts, Newstead North, Belimba Barracks, and most recently, Sandgate, Sandgate. And so that's just a quick search of 
where they have actively opposed and voted against neighbourhood plans, but that is, I think, the tip of the iceberg. And to use Councillor Cassidy's own words, he's all tip. No iceberg. Uh, no iceberg. But in, in this case, the iceberg is the real story, which is Labor has suddenly had, had a realisation that their approach to development is not helping the provision of affordable housing for our city. That their approach to development... Councillor Johnston. I am very sorry for what Labor has done. I am very sorry for what the Greens have done. And I am very sorry for what the independent councillor has done when it comes to opposing the construction of new homes in their areas, because it does hurt people. These, these sort of campaigns, this sort of politics does have implications, and it means it is getting harder and harder for people to find affordable ways to live in our city because of this anti-development approach, which has been ongoing for years and years and years. And what is their response to this approach? Their response is, let's cut $50 million from public transport and put it into social housing. This is their response. It's extraordinary. It is extraordinary, Mr Chair. And so uh, we will continue to highlight the hypocrisy of those councillors opposite who have opposed and opposed and opposed, and then now uh, suddenly have realised there's a housing affordability challenge in our city. Yep. Now, uh, there's many levers to be pulled. The state government will be pulling on some levers. Whether they're pulling them hard enough is a matter for debate. Uh, but we will be pulling on some levers as well. And we will be pulling them very hard because we know that the livability of our city depends on us increasing the supply of housing. It is really important that we understand this simple fact. I went through the figures in the chamber the other day about the supply of new apartments in 2016. 11,000 new apartments were built in 2016. Last year, only 2,300. And so, the numbers are coming down, the supply is coming down, yet the demand is growing. We are the most quickly growing capital city in Australia, and you can see where this ends. And so we do need to increase the supply of housing. We do. And we do need to do it in a way that adds to the livability and affordability of our city, not detracts from it. And fundamentally changing low density residential areas is not the answer. It is not the answer. We have not changed zoning or planning in low density areas other than to introduce a townhouse ban yeah. in low density areas. And that is a reasonable Lord thing. Mayor, your time has oh, expired. Thank you. Further speakers? Uh, oh, sorry. And yes, claim to be misrepresented, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, please go. Sorry. Ahead. Thanks, Chair. That's extraordinary. You, um, you wouldn't think they've been in charge uh, oh. with that speech. So the Lord Mayor said that I. I you know, was extolling the virtues of neighbourhood planning. Uh, I wasn't. What I said is that the LNP said their neighbourhood planning process won an award, and I made the point that no neighbourhood plan that's been delivered by this LNP administration has ever won any awards. Further speakers? Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Mr Acting Chair, and I just rise to speak on uh, Future Brisbane Program 4. And just briefly, I want to expand a little bit on what the Lord Mayor said about neighbourhood planning, but I also want to recognise the great work that the, uh, the team within uh, Future Brisbane will be doing in conjunction with the um, future, uh, the Brisbane City Host uh, operations activities when it comes to planning for not only our growing city, but planning for our Olympic city for 2032 as well. So we now are committed through the Future Host contract in delivering one of the world's largest sporting events. And we need to create an Olympic legacy and have significant open economic benefits uh, that will last for our residents and our businesses for years to come. So the delivery of the legacy for Brisbane will ensure we can be enjoyed by residents leading up to 2032, of course during the Games in 2032 and for the 10 years beyond. And this is a part that the Urban Renewal Team will be doing excuse me, in conjunction with the uh, host city uh, operations. In particular, 
You will have, I've spoken about in my program, the City Centre Master Plan and the Inner City Framework, two very vital pieces of work to make sure that our precincts are vibrant, that they're fit for purpose. We have a 24-hour economy and a global experiences for visitors and residents, while collaborating with the Queensland Government to plan for and deliver world-class precincts surrounding our Olympic Paralympic venues. And that is what the City Centre Master Plan and Inner City Framework is focusing on, that inner 5K, which is where 54 Four per cent of the events will occur in 2032 as well. But it's not just about the actual urbanisation and the structure and the venues, it's also about our sport and healthy lifestyle pathways, it's about our human skills, our networks and innovation, our culture and creative development, our environmental benefits and targets and, of course, most importantly, the economic benefits. That is what you get out of a well-planned city. That is what you get when you have an administration that has been planning for a growing city for the 15 years nearly that I have been here. That is what we are focused on making sure that we keep our lifestyle, our livability and the economic benefits strong as we go into the opportunities of the future. And that is what neighbourhood planning is about. It actually is about locally specific plans that create better places for Brisbane. And it's about the finer grain, local communities having their say. And I said it just last week, I think maybe the week before, in council that change is difficult. Change is very difficult for communities to understand. And we've seen more change in Brisbane from 1988, Lord Mayor, you spoke about Expo the other day, from 1988 to 1998 than what we're going to see now. But it's all very much more in your face with Facebook pages and community pages and the engagement of the community. But that's a great thing for neighbourhood planning. But it is a hard thing for local councillors, as I said last week, to take that teaspoon cement, stand up and have the conversation with your community. Don't be the scaremonger. Don't be the one that stands up saying this five storeys in Corinda is a tower of terror. No, it's a home and a house for people to live. Yep. A housing diversity, a housing affordability and all of those things that all of a sudden, as the Lord Mayor just said... Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston. Councillor Johnston, Councillor Cummings. Yes. Deputy Mayor, please continue. Yes. Councillor Johnston, please stop interrupting. Councillor, uh, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair. I know she loves the sound of my voice, so I will continue. Um, with the planning for the growing city, it is all based on one thing. It is based on the South East Queensland Regional Plan. It always has been, whether that was the regional plan from 2012, where we got given 154,000 new dwellings by 2031, or the South East Queensland Regional Plan, which is now 188,000 new dwellings by 2041. That's not our numbers. That is the numbers by the Labor state government, the Palaszczuk government, has directed us to deliver by 2041. It is statutory. We have to deliver it. But apparently, according to those opposite, not in their wards. Not here, not in my backyard. But it wasn't always like that, Councillor Madigan. Sorry, Mr Acting Chair. It wasn't always like that because some of us have been here for a long time and there's been a lot of neighbourhood plans since I first came here uh, in 2008. Actually, over 30 to be precise. And I just thought I'd go back through some of the history because there was a day when the leaders of the opposition in this place recognised good planning. They recognised good planning. And we'll start just with the local councillors that did represent their local areas, like Councillor Kim Flesser, who supported the Nudgee Beach neighbourhood plan in 2009. Oh, good old Kim. And don't we miss Councillor David Hinchcliffe in the... <laughs> I never thought I'd say it as the chair and council, but Councillor Hinchcliffe too stood up and supported the city centre neighbourhood plan in 2008. Yep. Former planning chair, he got it. He knew that this needed to be done. But then, of course, we have the history of those strong leaders that have gone before... Well, I won't give the description of that iceberg that you did before. Uh, the strong leaders that have gone before, Councillor Cumming, opposition leader. December 2008, win a manly neighbourhood plan. What did he do? Tick. Oh, Thank oh, you, oh, Councillor yeah. Cumming. <laughs> 2009, 
2012 Leader of the Opposition Shane Sutton, yep. Bulimba District's Neighbourhood Plan. I remember clearly the night she supported this because she was explaining how she had bought the bottles of Verve to give to the council officers <laughs> to say thank you. That's right. I remember that. And we did say, oh, maybe you might get in trouble for that. But it was after the plan was already done. But she loved it so much. And guess what? That Leader of the Opposition said, tick. Yep. And then, of course, we had the federal member for Oxley, former councillor Milton Dick, leader extraordinaire. Just ask him. I'm sure yeah. Milton won't mind if I said that. Britain's Wake on Neighbourhood Plan. What do we think? Tick. Yeah. Yeah. So those that have gone before on that side got it, but not anymore. No. As the Lord Mayor said, now it's just oh. nasty party politics, and it's coming home to roost. Yep. What we've seen in Sandgate has been appalling. Yep. And as I said last week, I'll stand by it, disappointing in some of the outcomes we saw in that neighbourhood plan for what was stirred up by the Leader of the Opposition down there. And there are homes and houses day in and day out. And I know the Council of Cook's not here, but we have had this discussion in committee. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition will not meet with a developer, full stop, no way, Jose, at all, in her ward office. What if they want to build homes? Look, don't meet. No? Don't meet. Mind you, talking about coming home to roost, Lord Mayor, I did see on uh, social media the other day that she's suggesting everybody have their say about some uh, new homes in the uh, Balmoral area. Maybe all of a sudden she's realised, oh, I better make it look like I care what happens in my ward when it comes to housing. It is so disappointing. We on this side stand for planning a growing city to keep it livable, keep it strong, keep our lifestyle and keep our economic benefits. And we see nothing but silly party politics being negative for the sake of opposing those on this side. And I support the future Brisbane program to the chambers. Further debate. Councillor Strong. Yes, uh, briefly, uh, Acting Chair. Um, I rise to speak on, uh, on uh, future, uh, future Brisbane and uh, uh, up, up front, uh, the word future Brisbane, and the only thing that the uh, opposition, my opposition, the administration can talk about is the past, not the future. The whole debate, virtually in all the programs so far, has been about the past. What council Lord Mayor in the past did and what they've done in the past. They're not talking about the future. Anyways, I just want to make that point. And the second point I want to make is to pick up, and I wasn't going to get up and talk about this, even though I was really offended at what the Lord Mayor said in regards to housing approvals or home approvals as he uses. Right. So let's go to his speech, page 21. He reads out this paragraph, which in part is in Brisbane, there, there also has the, the, the perverse situation, I don't, I've never used that word, but I don't think, perverse situation where Labor, Greens, and independent councillors continue to actively oppose the construction of new homes in their area. This Lord Mayor is loose with the truth, and I think that is a proper term to be used because if you go three paragraphs down, which he would not read out. He doubles down on that, and I'll read it in quote. It's disingenuous and wrong to say that you care about housing affordability if you oppose virtually every, yeah. underline, yeah. every, all. Yeah. You can use all sorts of words that mean every or all, but he used the word every, new application to build new homes. All, every. I'll take the interjection. I know exactly what it means, but he doesn't know what it means if he's used it in the wrong context. He was obviously trying to reinforce what he said in the th fourth paragraph above it, but he said, and this is where I got really ticked off, because it wasn't right, because I do not oppose every application for new homes in my ward. I oppose less than 1% less than 1%, and the one, the last one I did oppose, the Brisbane City Council opposed it as well. And that was number five, the Esplanade. They were gonna build a seven-story monolith on the lake. And council spent $200,000 near enough, opposing it in the P&E court, 
with a lot of, uh, with a lot of experts, and unfortunately the PNA court didn't agree with us or the, or the residents, and we lost the case. But at least we stood up for the residents, and Brisbane City Council stood up for those residents, and we opposed that development for homes. Right. So that's all I want to say. I wish he would put the record straight and, and be more precise in his language to reflect the true situation. Thank you, Chair. Further debate? Is there any further debate? No. Uh, Councillor Allen, would you close the debate, please? Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair, and I'd like to uh, thank all councillors who contributed to the debate this afternoon. Program 4, Future Brisbane, is a key program that supports the future of our city across many important facets. As you've seen, unfortunately, but not unexpectedly, opposition councillors have again chosen to criticise planning and housing initiatives without offering any reasonable alternative options. That's right. There was a litany of criticism, but no vision of their own. They oppose, but do not have the interests of residents at heart. The Schrinner Council is committed to planning for the growth of this city and to do what we can to support housing affordability and supply in this city, even against the direct and indirect opposition of those opposite. Program 4 is much more than just housing. It captures a wide range of strategies and improvements that are designed to improve our city. It's around housing, it's around industrial land use, it's around the streets that we uh, live in. It's around the amenity of our suburbs. So it is a very broad program. And I did want to touch upon a couple of the points that uh, uh, fellow councillors have made. Um, in the context of uh, Councillor Cassidy's points uh, around the uh, supposed scrapping of neighbourhood plans, uh, the reality is we aren't scrapping neighbourhood plans. We've got four that are at various stages of completion at the moment. But we are looking to refocus our efforts around suburban renewal precincts because we believe they are a more agile and responsive solution to the challenges we are facing today as a city, uh, particularly around housing and creating better suburbs. Councillor Cassidy's comments on the Sandgate neighbourhood plan are unfortunately a deluded joke. Here is the councillor who criticised the plan right. but did not put in a submission of his own or provide any view around what he thought should happen. Councillor Cassidy, councillor Cassidy did nothing. In terms of affordable housing, we have provided and will continue to provide the planning framework for all types of housing. There is no shortage of opportunities for affordable housing should the market or the state government to choose to take advantage of these opportunities. Obviously, Council does not control all the levers that impact affordability. We don't control construction costs. We don't control labour supply or interest rates or the economic conditions. All of these have a greater influence on housing supply and affordability than the latent supply that Council supports. Councillor Cassidy, in term, Councillor Cassidy, in terms of green building design, where you denigrated what Council was achieving in this domain, well, 80 Ann Street, Suncorp's new headquarters just across the street, is the most highly rated green commercial building in Australia. And speaking to consultants who worked on that project, they advised that they could not have got this building completed in Sydney or Melbourne. But working with Brisbane City Council, they have been able to achieve a truly unique outcome. So Councillor Cassidy is wrong again. With respect to suburban re renewal precincts, I advised in the information session that we were looking to focus on this particular type of opportunity because we thought it would provide more rapid outcomes to address the challenges that we're facing as a city. In that information session, I said to him, we're at the early stages of planning in respect to this initiative. There's still a lot of analysis and assessment work to be done around the opportunities that might exist across the city. Councillor Cassidy was at that information session. He heard what I had to say. So for him to get up here this afternoon with the rhetoric 
that he put on, it's really quite inaccurate and it doesn't reflect the discussion at the information session. Councillor Johnston, who's also made a point here around suburban renewal precincts, she wasn't even there. So how she can sort of um, you know, convey what might have happened at that information session is ridiculous. And uh, Councillor Strunk, you, know, you mentioned here that the, uh, the administration wasn't particularly future looking. Well, you know, if the suburban renewal precincts initiative isn't future look looking, well, then I don't know what is. Um, Councillor Cassidy, he touched upon the industrial strategy where we have had considerable engagement with industry and other stakeholders. This doesn't ha hang on, hasn't happened in a vacuum. Um, you know, while he may have chosen not to be involved in the process, it doesn't mean it's not happening. And in fact, we've engaged with the state government and will continue to engage with them as this industrial strategy review progresses. Now, importantly, the industrial strategy review is designed to bring some more flexibility around the industrial land use, so hopefully that will please Councillor Shree, who's looking to uh, potentially see some entertainment activities in industrial zones. Um, now, Councillor Shree did make a number of points, and uh, I just wanted to set the record straight here. Um, you know, we do acknowledge his view around development on flood-prone land. But he can't have it both ways. You know, you can't oppose building on flood-prone land, you know, notwithstanding whatever engineering solutions might be available, but then oppose development. You need to be more supportive of development and density if we are to address the challenges of housing. I would also note that there have been some pretty thoughtful buildings constructed in potentially flood-prone areas, and the examples I would use are the Bunnings at Virginia and Breakfast Creek, where they've put the parking at the ground level and the warehousing and retail are above. Um, to Councillor Sri's point about the reuse of buildings, you know, this does have some merit, but the reuse of commercial buildings don't lend themselves readily to residential. There are a number of um, uh, sort of structural considerations, uh, specifically around plumbing and natural light. Um, in terms of his comments on deep planting, this amendment is being progressed, but it is a more complex amendment than he would think. But I'd also note, referencing back to the Brisbane Future Blueprint, that um, there's seven amendments that we have progressed as part of that uh, blueprint, and they all take time. You know, the amendments can take two years or more, so it's not just a, a click of the fingers. And uh, I think that, you know, at times we'll also look to aggregate uh, specific items in, in amendments rather than bring them through as standalone amendments. And uh, most recently, in the context of greening, we've obviously had our rooftop gardens amendment come through the chamber. So, uh, you know, this is you know, sort of suggestion that, you know, the Lord Mayor Graham Quirk um, you know, lied to the, the community. It, it's incorrect. You know, we. Uh, there is no intent to lie, and in fact, this uh, particular amendment will come to the chamber later this year. Um, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair, and I commend Program 4 to the chamber. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Allen. I'll now put the motion for the adoption of the future Brisbane program. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Second. Second. Uh, a division has been called by the Deputy Mayor and by Councillor Landers. Councillors, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Thank you. 
Orderly, please uh, lock the bars and Clark, please read the results. Mr Chair, the noes have, sorry, the ayes have it. The voting being 17 in favour and two against. The motion is carried. That concludes the Future Brisbane program. I now call on Councillor Howard to present the next program, Lifestyle and Community Services. Councillor Howard. Mr Deputy Chair, I move that for the Lifestyle and Community Services program, one, the program budgeted financial statement as set out on page 24 for the years 2022 to 23 through to 2025-26, and two, the annual operational plan as set out on pages 95 to 112, and three, the allocation for the operations for the service 5.5.3.1 cultural facilities management for the years 2026 to 27 and 2027 to 28 as set out on page 67 so far as they relate to program five be adopted. Second. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Landers, that for the lifestyle and community services program, one, the program budgeted financial statement as set out on pages 24 for the years 2022, 2023 through to 2025, 2026, and two, the annual operational plan as set out on pages 95 to 112, and three, the allocation for the operations for the service 5.5.3.1, cultural facilities management for the years 2026 to 2027, and 2027 to 2028 as set out on page 67 so far as they relate to program five be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Howard. Oh, thank you, Mr Deputy Chair. I rise to speak in support of the budget for program five and I'm beyond grateful to address the chamber here today, not only as the civic cabinet chair of community arts and nighttime economy, but also in my capacity as a member of the Schrinner Council a team that continues to triumph through adversity and deliver for the residents of Brisbane. As little as three years ago, no one would have been able to predict the trials and tribulations that our city would face. A global pandemic, followed by one of the most intense natural disasters our city has ever faced, has had an immeasurable impact on the city of Brisbane. It's through times like these that resilience is developed However, I'm proud to say that under the strong, disciplined economic management of the Schrinner Council, and in spite of the challenges that our city has faced, we have continued to deliver for the residents of Brisbane. And I say again today, I'm proud to be a member of the Schrinner Council, a team that has delivered to, for Brisbane 18 consecutive years of responsible, resilient and accountable economic management. Without this disciplined and measured approach to financial management, our council may not have been able to continue to invest in programs for the residents of Brisbane over the past three years. Under the strong historical management of the Schrinner Council, Program 5 is not only able to maintain our strong investment into the community, but we are in a position that means our sporting and community organisations endure, prevail and ultimately thrive in the aftermath of the 2022 severe flooding and weather event and the pandemic. Through the Program 5 budget, we have committed to ensuring that residents, community organisations and visitors alike continue to have access to modern and welcoming community facilities and local library services. Opportunities to experience Brisbane's rich culture and lifestyle through festivals, events and activities and that communities across the city continue to be supported and have the capacity to rebuild, recover and embody the spirit of Brisbane. This measured budget enables us not only to provide the services that Brisbane residents have come to love and cherish, but also provides ongoing funding and support to valued services, events and organisations across Brisbane. We know that as our city undergoes its rebuild and recovery, the residents of Brisbane want to continue to enjoy the events that really make our city so special. Now, in speaking to the achievements of this program, I want to ensure that I make time first to thank those who have made this possible. 
to all the officers responsible for delivering the work I will speak of today, your dedication to a better Brisbane is more than words in a slogan. I'd like to commend you for your commitment to our community and to the City of Brisbane. Libraries, customer service, connected communities and community facilities and venues branches. I appreciate your efforts. And I'd like to uh, thank just both my team of Victor, Athena and Kirsty, but also Tash Tobias, Kristen Booth, Nina Sprake, Ainsley Gold and Mark Dighton and all of their teams who have made this such a wonderful program and who it's been my privilege to work with uh, to ensure that we make the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today. <laughs> By supporting our city's festivals and events, the Schrinner Council is not only able to support Brisbane's creative sector, but it also enables the cultural and creative expression that really makes Brisbane such a great place to live, work and relax. Brisbane refuses to be defined by the impact of this most recent natural disaster with countless festivals, events and activities planned to activate and enliven the city in the year ahead. In this budget, we are providing funding to directly support the delivery of over 160 suburban and multicultural festivals across Brisbane. These festivals play an important role in bringing our communities together and in celebrating the local and cultural stories that make shape and define the city of Brisbane. We are also continuing our ongoing commitment towards funding the iconic Brisbane Festival, which has been turning the city pink every September for over 20 years and which saw more than 1.5 million persons experience this last year. We are all eager to see the performances and attractions that enliven and excite our city in September this year and through our ongoing support to our signature cities festivals, like Brisbane Festival, that we establish our position as a truly unique and modern global city. The budget before us today continues our significant investment to deliver Australia's largest and most diverse library service, with funding continuing for every single library service and program that Council offers. The social importance of libraries is as important now as it has ever been, with our libraries network continuing to play an integral role in Brisbane as both social and learning hubs. This became especially apparent in the wake of the 2022 floods, with our 33 strong libraries network becoming supportive hubs for Brisbane's residents at a time when they needed it most. Our commitment towards providing Brisbane residents with our accessible libraries network continues with funding for Council's mobile library service continuing, making sure that vulnerable members of our community don't have to miss out on the joy of reading. Mr Deputy Chair, the Schrinner Council understands the positive social impact that libraries have on our city and on the millions of residents and visitors who use them each year. That is why this Council delivers and will continue to deliver modern, accessible and better libraries for the residents of Brisbane. Over the past 18 years, this administration has undertaken the delivery of more than 20 new and upgraded libraries across Brisbane, which is an endorsement of our ongoing commitment to our city's libraries. Our commitment to modern and accessible libraries continues within this budget, with initial works already underway to rebuild and revitalise the Everton Park Library. This transformative project will see Council invest more than $11.5 million into the Everton Park Library, doubling the existing floor space of this facility and creating a modern, state-of-the-art library that complements its natural surrounds. In addition, this budget will see Council commit $1.4 million towards the Zilmia Library refurbishment, which will provide an upgraded and modernised facility to meet current community needs delivering improvements such as refreshed entrance and a new children's library. Again, Mr Deputy Chair, there is no greater supporter of Brisbane's libraries than the Schrinner Council, and the budget before us today is a testament to that. Mr Deputy Chair, this budget also commits more than $6.7 million to Outcome 5.3, Active and Healthy City, to continue our commitment towards ensuring Brisbane remains an active, connected and healthy city. This will see Council continue to invest in the delivery of hundreds of free or low-cost activities, giving residents the opportunity to participate in activities that improve their wellbeing. 
In addition, Council is continuing its ongoing investment into supporting community organisations with more than $5 million committed towards sport and recreation development. We have seen, as a result of the 2022 floods, the significant impact to our sporting and community groups across the city. These groups form an integral part of the social fabric of our city and our suburbs, with many still recovering from this natural disaster. They provide for foster and bring people together, both through social and sporting means, and the positive impact these groups have on our city is immeasurable, so we must do what we can to help them recover. Outcome 5.4, um, social inclusion. Supporting the community of Brisbane really is at the heart of what we do in lifestyle and community services. It continues to guide the work that we do each and every single day, which is why we will continue our strong and ongoing investment into Outcome 5.4, social inclusion, to ensure that Brisbane remains an inclusive city in which diversity is valued and Brisbane residents, regardless of ability, background or circumstance, can fully enjoy living, working or visiting this great city of ours. We will continue to build and develop ongoing relationships and connections with communities from all of Brisbane's unique and valued cultural and community groups and provide opportunities for them to engage in and shape the life of our city. The Schrinner Council recognises the importance of displaying leadership through inclusivity, as we believe that every Brisbane resident matters, no matter who you are or what your background is. In this year's budget, we see more than $1 million committed towards the implementation of Council's Reconciliation Action Plan, empowering Council to work hand in hand with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in advancing reconciliation. At this stage, our Reconciliation Action Plan is currently with Reconciliation Australia for formal endorsement, which is a condition required prior to publication. We expect that this endorsement will be completed shortly, with the publication of Council's Reconciliation Action Plan to follow soon after. Through this, we will continue facilitating sustainability through innovation and best practice in community development that helps preserve and recognise Brisbane's Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultural heritage. We will also continue to invest in our youth, with more than $1.5 million allocated to continue supporting the Valley's Visible Inc. Youth Space, Youth Week and the Lord Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee. In addition, we are committing additional funding in this year's budget towards addressing the needs of our growing and ever-changing city. The continuation of our $3 million Pathways Out of Homelessness program represents the Schrinner Council's commitment to positively responding to homelessness in Brisbane. It will ensure that resources and sector partnerships gained over the program will be sustained, giving families and people at risk of homelessness access to greater support. The importance of these partnerships between Council and our community and social housing providers has been instrumental in addressing the complex issues as they relate to homelessness. Our renewed funding towards the Pathways Out of Homelessness program will build on the relationships we have developed through our other initiatives such as the Community Housing Partnership Program and Homeless Connect events. While the state and federal governments are primarily responsible for addressing homelessness, our strategic investment in this area is getting great results. We recognise the value of supporting initiatives like these um, and what that has on the wellbeing and social fabric of our city. However, we also recognise councils need to pause some projects in order to focus on our city's recovery. In this year's budget, we have reallocated more than $2 million from the Inclusive Brisbane Plan project in 2022-23 towards flood recovery efforts over the next 12 months, before restoring the program back to full capacity with more than $5 million allocated in 2023-24. We can't begin new accessibility upgrades without first addressing the urgent work that needs to be done to help our community organisations deal with the impacts of the flood. What they want and need now is to rebuild and recover. And of course, we'll be working to make sure that Brisbane's biggest ever rebuild will be done in the most accessible way possible. Wherever we can, we will work to include accessibility improvements as part of our rebuild and recover program. 
As an integral part of, this, of the Schrinner Council's focus on the rebuild and recovery of Brisbane, we will be extending significant support to community sport, recreation and cultural facilities in the new financial year through Outcome 5.5. To understand the funding priorities of this council, it is worthwhile to reflect on the indiscriminate impact that the 2022 flooding and severe weather had across our city and suburbs. The damage included impacts to 198 buildings on community lease sites and impacts on more than 100 sports fields, impacting the home grounds of our city's valued supporting and community groups to the value of more than $150 million. To support the rebuild and recovery of our valued community assets, we are investing hundreds of millions of dollars into our community organisations over the next three years. With the support of state and federal governments, we have allocated more than $166 million towards the recovery of community assets to help the tenants of community facilities repair or rebuild their facilities, sports services and related infrastructure. In addition, we will maintain our commitment to providing funding to our community organisations through the Lord Mayor's Better Suburbs Grants, an, integrate, an innovative grants program that has so, so far supported over 100 community organisations across Brisbane. We know that this unprecedented level of funding support to enable our community's flood resilience will have a monumentally positive impact on our city, ensuring that the Brisbane of tomorrow will be even better and more resilient than the Brisbane of today. Through this budget, Mr Deputy Chair, we will also continue our ongoing support for our community facilities across our council network, giving residents access to safe and well-maintained civic and cultural spaces to explore and enjoy. We will continue to invest in our community halls and Council's 22 public pools, including the delivery of an upgraded and refurbished Newmarket swimming pool. Over the next year, Council will complete the replacement of the 50 metre pool at Newmarket and continue the design and procurement activities focused on the redevelopment. Councillor Howard, your time has expired. Further speakers? <laughs> Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Chair. I rise to speak on uh, lifestyles and community services, and uh, I'm going to focus uh, uh, in this uh, in this program um, locally in, in my ward uh, on, on a number of items. Um, but I'll, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I know uh, someone else may want to speak before we uh, conclude, which is sad that we won't be able to debate uh, either, you know, program six, seven, and eight. And I'm sure the chairs have all been prepared for that. Uh, to, to do the debate. It's a shame that we never seem to get past uh, four or five. The Enola Art Gallery um, was established more than 20 years ago, uh, and it's, and it's uh, the only Brisbane City Council-owned um, art gallery in Brisbane. Uh, and uh, it's, had a, it's had a proud, proud, a proud record of, uh, of service to the community uh, and to the wider community as well. We, we even have artists come all the way from uh, Palm Island and, uh, and some of the other outlying uh, Morton Bay Islands as well and take advantage of the, of the art gallery's uh, facility. But there's been a problem. Um, uh, over the last 18 months, we had a trader that moved in next door um, and, he, uh, and he decided that uh, uh, the window space on the side of the art gallery was his, even though it's nowhere near, it's like nowhere near his shop. He thought it was his, so he puts uh, all of his fruit and veg out there. Uh, and now he's now decided to put it in the front of the art gallery as well. Now we, we've been trying to work through the body corporate. Unfortunately, Brisbane City Council doesn't actually have a representative on the body corporate. We own the building, so I don't know why we don't have a representative. Um, we've uh, escalated it uh, from, uh, from um, facilities uh, through to uh, city, city legal. Sorry, just relevance to the program. I mean, this, well, this sounds like a general of, business from Tuesday night. Councillor Howard sort of found its way into the budget debate. I, 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 the, 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 okay, well, that's great, Councillor uh, Shreve. I'm just making a point of order. The, the gallery is a council asset, and I'm assuming that Councillor Strunk will get to the relevance to the program yeah. area shortly. And I, I just so. want to take the opportunity to talk about this, uh, which is in the program. The actual building is in part of the program, makes up part of the program, yeah. I would think. Uh, is, it's an asset uh, that's uh, governed by uh, Councillor Howard. Um, anyways, we escalated the issue um, through facilities, through to uh, City Legal, and we have not had any uh, response from City Legal through facilities. Uh, they keep saying, 
It's in with City Legal, and that's like going back almost 12 months now. And I just want to encourage uh, uh, Councillor Howard or uh, uh, to have a look into this because it's really not fair on the new management group uh, uh, that is made up of the uh, some Vietnamese uh, uh, ladies and men from the Vietnamese chapter who are trying to manage this uh, facility and are being um, being stopped from uh, really marketing the facility to its, to its fullest extent because of the uh, the incursion of the trader next door. Um, now, the Lord Mayor, um, I also want to say the Lord Mayor Senior Christmas Parties are a really popular event uh, for my residents and uh, they, they, the tickets run out pretty quick. Uh, and I just want to encourage the, uh, the Lord Mayor to actually maybe uh, increase the number of, uh, number of events uh, if possible because uh, um, there always seems to be a shortage of, uh, of tickets to go around. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, to call upon the Lord Mayor uh, to have a look at that. Um, also the, uh, the enhancement of the, uh, the enhancement of the library at, uh, at uh, Anala has uh, again continues to uh, grow uh, in numbers. Uh, I just want to uh, encourage uh, all, all, all councillors to uh, want to attract the library into their area because I'll tell you what, they're a great source of uh, community uh, interest and, uh, and, and honestly we've got people f uh, coming to the li Anala Library uh, from not just my ward but other wards as well because it's uh, truly a, uh, truly a uh, now that it's been reconstructed or re redeveloped, uh, it's, it's something to behold really quite, uh, quite frankly. The kids just love the colors, I mean that's just goes without saying. Um, also um, I want to talk about uh, movies in the park. Now there's been $220,000 uh, uh, in the Lord Mayor's deliverables for movies in the park. And I think it's really unfair for some wards to get a number of those and other wards to get none of those, right? Now, uh, I think it would only be fair that each ward should get at least one movie in the park. And I'm sure every ward has a facility uh, or, uh, or an area that can be used for that. Um, Homeless Connect, I'll just finish off with Homeless Connect. Um, we, um, we take part in that, 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 that event every, every year and contribute to that, as I'm sure most other wards do as well. Um, and, uh, but I think we need to do a lot more in this area. And, and, I, and, I, uh, and I know we've talked about uh, um, com contributing greatly to, uh, to those, those, uh, uh, those uh, NGOs that actually do that work for social housing. Um, but I think we also have to do the work um, the, the hands-on, in-face in, in um, uh, work uh, out in the field uh, with, uh, with those people that are, are experiencing homelessness. And, uh, and, the, and that does happen to a certain extent, but only from nine to five, right? So, and, uh, and of course, you don't really see the homeless until it's after five, really, or after five or after six, really. Uh, they seem to be more visible then. And, and we do have a number of uh, uh, organizations that actually do some of that work at night time. But I think really Brisbane City Council should have a look at uh, maybe um, uh, supporting those organizations that do have that work out at night time in the field. Um, whether, whether we do it with our own teams um, through Homeless Connect um, or, 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 just in, or just support those, uh, those organizations that are already doing the work. I think, I think we need to do a lot more in this area. Um, I, have, I have a number of homeless people in my ward um, and they seem to, um, well, some, some of them live in cars behind uh, petrol stations at night time just for safety purposes. Uh, there's a few that uh, sleep in the parks uh, out of harm's way, we hope. But of course, really, honestly, it's, it's I, 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 you know, I've never been homeless, so I don't really have a full understanding of what that, what that, is, what that feeling is, but uh, uh, I can only imagine. And I think the more we do in this area, uh, the more, um, well, the more that should be done in this area. And I think we, we do have the funding to support uh, at least uh, some of those uh, street vans that do that work uh, uh, for our homeless. I think I'll finish there. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Strunk. Further debate? Councillor Mackay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd like to ri oh, I'd rise to speak on program five, and I'd like to start by thanking Councillor Howard for being such an excellent, attentive and organised chair in this um, portfolio. She does an incredible job. 
And uh, I'm going to speak uh, very briefly, I guess, because we're about to be um, stopped, uh, about the Witten Barracks upgrade, which comes under Program 5. And this is an extremely important addition to the Indrapilly community. Um, Councillor Shri would attest that uh, new community facilities are very important, and we are going to be turning this one into a community arts and history um, facility. Oh, keep going? All right. And um, uh, very briefly, I grew up in the Indrapilly area, and my next door neighbour at the time was the com um, officer commanding of the uh, Queensland University Regiment, which was based at Witten Barracks back when I was in high school. And he gave me a tour when it was an operating army base. Do you want me to just sit down? Yes, please yeah. sit down. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Mackay. As the time is now five o'clock, under the provisions of section 74.6 of the meeting's local law, on the expiration of the period allowed for debate of budget programs or the extended period allowed by council resolution, I shall now put the motions to the meeting for the adoption of the following without further amendment or debate. A, every budget program not yet debated, and B, every budget program debated but not yet voted upon, and C, every budget program partially debated and voted upon. So I will now put the motion for the adoption of program number five, the Lifestyle and Community Services Program. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division. Seconded. Division moved by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Landers. Uh, eyes to the right, noes to the left. Please ring the bells. Thank you. Orderly, please lock the bars. Clerk, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour and one against. The motion is carried. <laughs> Councillors. I will now put the motion for the adoption of program number six, the City Standards Community Health and Safety Program. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division. Seconded. Division has been called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Landers. Councillors, ayes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Yes, thank you. Orderly, please lock the bars. Clerk, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 22 in favour and one against. The motion is carried.
I will now put the motion for the adoption of program number seven, the Economic Development Program. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division seconded. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and by Councillor Landers. Councillors, eyes to my right, noes to my left. Please ring the bells. Clerk, please lock the bars. Uh, oh, sorry, orderly, please lock the bars. Clerk, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour and two against. The motion is carried. Councillors, I will now put the motion for the adoption. <coughs> Councillors, Councillors, I will now, I will now put the motion for the adoption of program number eight, the city, city governance program. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Division seconded. Division is to be called by the Deputy Mayor and Councillor Landers. Councillors, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Thank you. Orderly, please lock the bars. And Clark, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour, one against and one abstention. The motion is carried. <coughs> I will now put the motion for the adoption of business and council providers. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division seconded. Division called by the Deputy Mayor and Council Landers. Councillors, ayes to the right, noes to the left. Please ring the bells. Orderly, please lock the bars. Clark, please read the results. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 21 in favour, one against and one abstention. The motion is carried. Lord Mayor. Uh, would you please move the motion for the adoption of the budget? Okay, uh, Mr Chair, I move that Council resolve to adopt all recommendations in the resolution of rates and charges 2022 to 2023, including all provisions and appendices as set out at page 136 to 232 of the annual plan and budget document. Am I reading the right one here? Yes. I am, good, yep, just checking, because it's a long one. Yes. So. <laughs> yes. 
adopt the annual, annual budget and annual operational plan contained in the 2022-23 annual plan and budget document comprising of the budget budgeted financial statements as set out on pages 11 to 19, including the summary of recommendations, the statement of income and expenditure, the statement of income and expenditure business and council providers, the statement of financial position, the statement of changes in equity, the statement of cash flows, summary of recommendations, long-term financial forecast, the statement of financial ratios, also the adoption of the budget, uh, program budgeted financial statements for programs one to eight, the, adoption, the adopted businesses and council providers budgeted financial statement and budgeted statements of income and expenditure. The revenue statement and revenue policy is set out on page 50 to 64. The adopted allocations for long-term contracts, the adopted annual operational plan for programs one to eight, and the annual performance plans for the business and council providers. The rates and charges are set out in the resolution of rates and charges 2022 to 2023. The fees and charges are specified in the document entitled Schedules of, fee of, of Fees and Charges, including all provisions and appendices. The cost recovery fees are specified in the document entitled Register of Cost Recovery Fees, including all provisions, and uh, delegate to the Chief Executive Officer all of its powers under Section 242 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010 to waive refund, discount or remit any or all fees and charges set out in the schedule of fees and charges and any fees and charges set by way of delegated power as recorded in the register of delegation on the conditions <laughs> on the conditions set out in the general condition of delegation. And uh, this must have been written by a lawyer. Uh, um, and otherwise in accordance with the notes contained with no offence to any lawyers in the room, uh, all those lawyers listening. Um, and otherwise, in accordance with the notes contained in within the schedule of fees and charges, to set any fees and charges not otherwise set out in schedule of fees and charges on the conditions set out in the general conditions of delegation. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that Council resolve to adopt all recommendations in the resolution of rates and charges 2022-23 including all provisions and appendices as set out on pages 136 to 232 of the annual plan and budget document, adopt the annual budget and annual operational plan contained in 2022-23 annual plan and budget document comprising the budgeted financial statements as set out on pages 11 to 19, including the summary of recommendations, statement of income and expenditure, statement of income and expenditure businesses and council providers, statement of financial position, statement of changes in equity, statement of cash flows, Summary of recommendations, long-term financial forecast, statement of financial ratios, the adopted program budgeted financial statements for programs one to eight, the adopted businesses and council providers budgeted financial statement and budgeted statements of income and expenditure, the revenue statement and revenue policy is set out on pages 50 to 64, the adopted allocations for long-term contracts, the adopted annual operational plan for programs one to eight and annual performance plans for the businesses and council providers. <clears throat> the rates and charges are set out in the resolution of rates and charges 2022-23. The fees and charges are specified in the document entitled schedule of fees and charges, including all provisions and appendices. The cost recovery fees as specified in the document entitled register of cost recovery fees including all provisions and appendices. Uh, delegate to the Chief Executive Officer all of its powers under Section 242 of the City of Brisbane Act 2010 to waive, refund, discount or remit any and all fees and charges set out in the schedule of fees and charges and any fees and charges set by way of delegated power as recorded in the Register of Delegations on the conditions set out in the general conditions of delegation and otherwise in accordance with the notes contained within the schedule of fees and charges to set any fees and charges not otherwise set out in the schedule of fees and charges on the conditions set out in the general conditions of delegation. Is there any debate? Lord Mayor. After that I'm talked out. Um, well look, this is obviously a general discussion about the budget as a whole. And I've said already before, um, and I have to say it again because it is very relevant, um, that it is difficult to find a more challenging circumstance in which you could put together a budget for Australia's largest council. Now, we know that there have been ongoing impacts from COVID. 
uh, those amounting to a $220 million hit over the last couple of years to Brisbane City Council's budget, $220 million hit from COVID, and then on top of that, one of the worst and most costly flood disasters that we have seen in our city's history, with another $330 million hit to our budget in just a short period of time. And so a hit, a challenge on a challenge, a hit on a hit, um, these are extraordinary circumstances that we're uh, compiling and putting together a budget. But despite all of those challenges, this is a budget which is balanced and strong. It is a budget that is responsible. It's a budget that we've done what we had to do to make the tough decisions necessary to keep the budget strong and also to do the right thing for the residents of Brisbane. Uh, we have not taken the easy way out here. We've not simply whacked it on the credit card and passed it on to future generations. We only ever borrow to build assets and infrastructure. <laughs> and that has always been the case. And even despite the challenging circumstances we are in, that will always continue to be the case while ever we are on this side of the chamber. Uh, we paused some projects. Uh, we've stopped some projects. Those are never easy decisions to make but they are the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do, and I think it's what reasonable residents would expect us to do. We know in their own household budgets, when you get unexpected things happen, the car, the car packs up, the fridge blows up or stops working, the washing machine stops working. You have to make uh, adjustments to your own household budget, and when you get challenges in a city budget, you have to make adjustments. And it's never easy, uh, but we've done the right thing. But because we've done those things that had to be done, the right and responsible things, we can now prioritise the rebuilding and recovery of our city. And that is absolutely critical. But now we can not just prioritise the rebuilding and recovery of our city, we can prioritise the suburbs, we can prioritise the basics, we can prioritise things like footpaths, parks and road resurfacing, but they're not the only things, Mr Chair, that we are prioritising. We've also prioritised public transport with record investment levels, never for, before seen. We've prioritised active transport, walking and cycling. We have prioritised sustainability and environmental initiatives so that we continue to be the benchmark city in Australia for those initiatives. And we've prioritised helping with housing supply and affordability because once again, it's the right thing to do and it's the right time to do it and the people of Brisbane would expect us to do it. And we prioritise these things fundamentally because we prioritise the people of Brisbane. Yeah. We prioritise those things because we prioritise people. And we prioritise them out in the suburbs of Brisbane, across all 190 suburbs, in this wonderful city that we live in, and we prioritise them because we care. We prioritise them because we care enough to sometimes wear a few political hits to make the right decisions. That's right. Not taking the easy road, but knowing that we've done the right thing to keep the budget strong and prioritise those things that I mentioned before. Whether it's the rebuilding or recovery, the suburbs, the investment in the basics, housing affordability and the environment and sustainability. Now we know in contrast that our opponents only prioritise politics. Not people, they prioritise politics. And above all else, they prioritise the party that they represent. They prioritise their party above people every day of the week. And we see it played out here time and time again. My team will always pursue policies that put people first and prioritise the people of Brisbane. <laughs> and sometimes that brings us into conflict with our own party or elements of our own party. Why are you smiling, Councillor Wines? <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, sometimes we have to have those difficult conversations in our own party. And we're not afraid to have those conversations because our party is a broad church. Our party is a party, our party is a party that has all types of people from all backgrounds. And that's why, that's why, unlike, unlike, unlike the Labor Party where you get sent to Siberia if you say or do the wrong thing, um, 
or you end up with concrete slippers in the bottom of the Brisbane River, maybe, um, if you do the wrong thing by the unions, uh, you will see us doing the right thing by the people of Brisbane. And so we will always continue to do that, even if it requires those challenging decisions. Uh, and this, like I said, it's hard to find a more challenging year than the one we've just had. Now, uh, last Wednesday, I spoke for 45 minutes about this budget, and you don't want to hear that same speech again, I'm sure. Um, so why don't you take this opportunity now just to thank a few people, uh, to thank all of my colleagues on this side of the chamber, every single one of you. Uh, thank you uh, for your involvement, your participation, your enthusiasm, and also your understanding that in a, in a situation like this, we can't all get everything we want as soon as we want it. Um, but good things do come to those who wait. Uh, and I want to thank my civic cabinet chairs, all of them, and in particular, Councillor Fiona Cunningham uh, for her very first budget as the Chair of Finance and City Government, Governance. I want to thank all of the council officers who have helped to put this budget together and it has very much been a team effort. Uh, the CEO, the CFO, uh, the EMT, the executive management team, the budget team, every single person who has contributed towards this uh, budget. I also want to thank the clerks uh, who have been um, very, very, very patient um, during what has been two very, very long days uh, and then um, a previous uh, debate as well. I want to thank you, Mr Chair, uh, for stepping into the breach uh, and you've done a fantastic job. Um, sometimes this can get rowdy, but um, you've, uh, you've handled this challenge in an absolutely sterling manner and kept calm in situations where not everyone would keep calm. Um, and so uh, thank you for, for everyone involved in the budget, involved in this democratic process that we're in. Um, and finally, thank you to my own team uh, from my office and my advisors and staff that have helped contribute towards this very important and challenging budget. Uh, I am proud of this budget because despite the adversity and the challenges that have been unprecedented, uh, we have delivered yet again a balanced budget. Now, that is now uh, a balanced budget after not only a flood, not only a pandemic, but a balanced budget even after many difficult situations in the past that would have led other governments or other administrations to go deep into deficit and deep into debt. Uh, we have not done that. We have not done that in the past. And because we have not done in that in the past, we have been able to once again deliver a responsible and balanced budget today. Uh, and we will continue to strive very hard to do the right thing for the people of Brisbane, and we will always put them first, Mr Chair. I commend this budget to the Chamber. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Thanks very much, Chair. I rise to speak on the budget as a whole. Um, and um, thought the Lord Mayor's um, delusions were quite interesting, yes. um, his, his remarks there, particularly about the LNP being a broad church and, and not, not sending people to Siberia uh, for having a difference of opinion. That's right, so you're in the corner for voting against a bus depot and for, for, for questioning, questioning Campbell Newman, Adrian Trinder's uh, mentor in this place. So like, don't, don't give us that rubbish, Lord Mayor, uh, about your failing party uh, here in Brisbane. That, that, is, just, that is just delusional. Uh, and the people of Brisbane know that and they'll make that. They'll, the people, people of Australia know that, particularly the people of Brisbane, uh, as a progressive city who are rejecting the Conservative LNP, particularly uh, an LNP party that is led by Peter Dutton, who just, I think two days ago, Two days ago, this is this is the LNP party leader. This is Adrian Trinner's party leader. Said, and he said on on I think it was a 7:30 report. He said, uh, the Liberal Party, the LNP, took a policy of coal to the last election, yes. and and they are sticking to that. Yes. They are sticking to that. They are not a progressive party, uh, and the people of Brisbane know that, yes. and they will make that. They will make. No, I'm sure. I'm sure none of these LNP councillors spoke up very loudly about that. Now this budget, Adrian Schrinner and the LNP's budget here today before us is the least transparent council budget in living memory here in Brisbane. And we all, and we all know why. We all know why. Residents have been hit with the biggest rates hike in over a decade and nothing to show for it. Uh, we have the highest debt levels since the 1980s and again, nothing to show for it. Now essentially what's in the budget book can be thrown out the window next week and every single project uh, could change that's been listed in the supporting information and councillors will never know. Labor councillors, the Green Council, the Independent Councillor, 
and every LNP councillor that's not an ENC yes. will never know. So under here, under the LNP in Brisbane, residents are paying more and more and getting less and less back from this LNP council. Now, the only figures in this budget that we are voting on today, in this debate right now and all those program areas we've just had, are the overall numbers from each program, plus some guesses, and this is the LNP's own words, some guesses on how much might be spent on projects, but even that isn't listed in this budget. The LNP won't list how much they're spending on footpath repairs, on drainage construction, on fixing potholes or any other suburban projects. This lets them cut services or reduce funding on projects behind closed doors. Now, on the other hand, the LNP also hasn't and won't list how much they're spending on political advertising, TV ads, brochures, market research and apps, or how much they're blowing this year on the black hole inner city project that is the Brisbane Metro. Now, this budget lets them increase their advertising and self-promotion budget, again, behind closed doors, and secretly cut service and infrastructure in our suburbs. So it's pretty simple. Under Adrian Schrinner and the LNP, the budget is the biggest rates take from residents this city has ever seen. It's the biggest spending and the biggest debt levels, and yet residents still aren't getting value for money. After 20 long years of this LNP council, from budget to budget, residents are paying more and more, and they're seeing less and less delivered out in the suburbs of Brisbane. We're seeing no real investment in housing to tackle the crisis that is facing Brisbane families. We're seeing further contracting out and further casualisation of council's workforce. We have thousands of broken footpaths where residents are waiting years and years for them to be fixed. That's just basic council work. We have council facilities being left to rot and community clubs facing funding cuts. This budget falls well short on initiatives that would take serious action on addressing climate change at a city level like FOGO. This budget falls well short to address the effects of flooding and weather events which we know are increasing in both severity and regularity here in Brisbane. The LNP is still sending jobs overseas rather than supporting local workers. And the LNP are still wasting your money, Brisbane, on advertising, political promotion, glitzy inner city projects that are yet to be delivered, but never in the suburbs. Yeah. Budgets are a reflection of leaders and their values and their priorities. And after seeing where Adrian Schrinner's priorities lie, once again this year, it's, it's clear there is a complete lack of leadership from the LNP here in City Hall. I agree with the Lord Mayor that these are extraordinary times and they called for real leadership, but the LNP have left our residents wanting severely. Now, it's no wonder that we find out today that Brisbane has slipped out of the top 10 of most livable cities in, in the world slipped from the top 10 down to 27. That's despite a war raging in Europe. Yep. And European cities are, are, are streets ahead of Brisbane now. But the common denominator in all of this, the common denominator of Brisbane becoming a less livable city, the common denominator in Brisbane residents out in the suburbs getting less but having to pay more in their rates is Adrian Schrinner and the LNP. He is the problem facing the people of Brisbane, and there's one way we can fix that. Uh, in 2024, as a city, we can get rid of him and his LNP administration. Absolutely. Now, I'd like to um, add my thanks to the staff that are working here in City Hall over these last two days, to the committee clerks, and thank you, Chair, for uh, I think perhaps the most impartial chairing I've seen for for a while. For a while, so thank you. I do appreciate that, Chair, and particularly to Alina, Melissa, Helmer, and Lucy, and Billy uh, for your support of councillors uh, throughout um, this last. A uh, couple of weeks, actually, through the delivery of the budget and information sessions and debate. Further debate, Councillor Johnston. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Chair. Sorry, I'll just get the clock to start. Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on the budget as a whole, um, and uh, I'll just start by saying that. Um, this is, without doubt, uh, one of the worst budgets that I've seen come through this chamber in the 14 years uh, that I've been uh, the, the councillor for Tennyson Ward. Um, and that's saying a fair bit, because there's been budgets where there's been literally nothing in the budget uh, for uh, my residents. I've been through two major natural disasters, um, global pandemics, and quite a lot of stuff over those uh, 14 years. And it's fair to say um, that this budget is the most shocking I have seen, and that is for a number of reasons. Um, firstly and primarily, as we've discussed over the last two days, it is the fundamental sneakiness, trickiness and secrecy 
of Adrian Schrinner and the LNP Council in fundamentally restructuring the budget to hide, hide how expenditure is undertaken in this city. Um, the lack of transparency and accountability in the decision-making process that they've undertaken with this budget fundamentally undermines good governance in this city. Worse, it was done without bothering to even mention it to councillors. And when it was raised in this place last Wednesday, I was told to sit down and be quiet. And it's only um, that myself and I know Councillor Cassidy he spoke to the Chief Legal Officer um, that we've found out a bit more about what's happening. The failure of this administration to even, even do the basic common courtesy and let our councillors know about the changes to the budget structure um, have been an absolute failure. Um, there's no way this Lord Mayor uh, can deliver a budget for the city of Brisbane when he can't even deal with seven people sitting in the same office That's as him right. in a fair and reasonable way. The second reason is the way in which the budget is actually being administered. Under the Schrinner Council, rates have blown out by up to 7 per cent, with flooded suburbs of Fairfield 5.75, Yeronga 6.7 and Oxley 6.61 copping some of the highest increases in the city. This could not come at a worse time for many households that are struggling with the impact of the flood and cost of living pressures. Historically, rates have nearly doubled under Adrian Schrinner's leadership of this council um, as finance chairman, deputy uh, mayor and lord mayor. And before that, he actually worked for Adrian Schrinner and was part of that administration between 2014 and 18. So for the past, uh, for the past, he has, oh, sorry, for, sorry, he's worked for, uh, Councillors, please, he's worked please for uh, Campbell allow. Newman. Um, and his fingerprints are all over this. He is the architect as the finance chairman, deputy mayor and mayor of doubling of rates. And it's not like residents are getting more for uh, their money, they're getting less. Because the cost blowouts from the botched Brisbane Metro project is now hurting the budget bottom line. This project has doubled in cost from uh, $944 million to $1.7 billion. Council debt has ballooned to $3 billion. In 2009, it was zero. There's many councillors here who don't know. This council had zero debt back in 2009. Today, it's $3 billion and rising, and there is no plan to pay it off. For every single person in Brisbane, there is a debt of 2,377. But this Lord Mayor stands up and skypes about, uh, oh, there's no debt, we don't have any debt, we're running a balanced budget. Meanwhile, he whacks all the, uh, all the debt on the credit card, hides it from view, and it runs up more and more and more. It is not good enough. Um, and residents in my area are getting uh, much less uh, for their uh, rates as well, despite some of the record rates. Now, I can't keep quiet about this um, any longer. Um, I've, I've publicly... Councillors, please allow Councillor Johnston to be heard in silence. I've, I've, I've publicly stated now, and it, 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 I can't in any way, shape or form endorse what this Lord Mayor is doing. Um, he is damaging the city, he is damaging the fabric of this city, uh, and his actions with this budget are hurting the residents of Brisbane. To give people some idea of the half a billion dollars in infrastructure spending uh, in this council budget, there is not a single road safety project in Tennyson Ward. Um, of the 190 suburbs in this city, 10 of which are in Tennyson Ward, there are just three traffic calming projects, um, none of which are in Tennyson Ward. There are 18 new footpaths being built across 190 suburbs, one of which is in Tennyson Ward. This is appalling. And the deputy mayor, who's not here yet again, um, stands up and says, oh, but there's plenty of money. That money is to fix the damaged footpaths, and I can tell you that's not being done properly either. People in my area are waiting years for their footpaths to be fixed. There is not enough money being spent on the basics in this city, but there's plenty of money now being spent on the Olympics, there's plenty of money being spent on marketing, and there's plenty of money being spent on cost blowouts in this city, and that's not good enough. 
Um, this budget um, also marks, I think, um, one of the starkest contrasts I've seen between the 2011 and 22 uh, uh, flood recovery process. Um, by this point, after 2011, rebuilding works had started. Yes. I, you know, we were almost back into our office. I think it was early June we went back into our office and the Fairfield Library reopened after being flooded. Meanwhile, as we now know, we don't have a single list of flood damaged roads. We don't have a list of flood damaged drains. We don't have a list of flood damaged parks. We don't know why the major landslips open. And four months, four months on, this council hasn't properly scoped the impact of the floods. The impact. That's not to say we haven't even got to starting to design and rebuild. I fear for the city of Brisbane. And do you know what has been announced? Um, eight grants to community sporting clubs. That's it. <coughs> Nothing more. South Cricket were completely destroyed. They got $5,000 to help with the cleanup. That's what this administration is doing. They have failed, fundamentally failed, on flood recovery. And yes, there's a $500 million slush fund uh, in this budget. But they can't say how it's going to be spent. We can't hold them to account for what's going to happen because four months on, they don't know. The chief financial officer was invited to stand up and tell us how he was guessing about how this budget was put together. That's what they've got. Guesses. Uh, now, I also saw the story, uh, Councillor Cassidy. Um, none of this is making Brisbane more livable, as both Councillor Allen and the Lord Mayor would have you uh, somehow argue. Um, when I stand up and try and protect uh, the character of uh, my glorious, glorious character and heritage suburbs, which is council policy, the Lord Mayor stands up and claims that I'm trying to trash livability. Oh, sorry, I'm trying to uh, trash affordability in this city. How far from the truth can you be, Lord Mayor? And it'll be very easy to tell my residents that you want to build high-rise in more of our suburbs. Uh, it is appalling. This administration has no new ideas. This administration has no new ideas. And today and yesterday, they've voted against every alternative that I've put up. The same as every single other year for the past 11 years, they've voted against every budget alternative they've put up. Footpaths, drainage, road safety, pedestrian improvements, backflow valves, flood mitigation, so many initiatives, and every single one of them has been voted down by the LNP. Every single one of them. Uh, and that is their record. They have no new ideas. They are supporting inappropriate development across this city and converting industrial properties into residential in flood-prone parts of this city and putting the amenity of residents at risk from being side by side against noisy industrial businesses is creating a recipe for disaster in this city. But worst of all is this administration's failure, uh, sorry, this administration's pork barrelling in their own wards and excluding um, wards that they don't represent from a fair allocation in this budget. Yeah. It has become the way of doing things for the LNP. Yeah. It is rejected by the rest of the Australian community and yeah. soon it will be rejected here. Uh, finally, I just uh, flag that I have an amendment. It's very clear to me um, that this Lord Mayor did not take on board the issues that I raised in this chamber a few weeks ago about supporting uh, residents. And I move the following, that this council amends the resolution of rates and charges on page 173 at paragraph 12.6, uninhabitable residents, a residents partial rebate of rates and charges as follows. After the word $1,000 once off adds up to or up to 75 per cent of the total rates payable, whichever is the higher. And at page 176, the definition of principal place of resident residence adds a new sentence after paragraph C as follows. Council may make an exception to the definition under paragraphs A, B and C on the basis of hardship. Second. It's been moved by uh, Councillor Johnston and seconded by Councillor Griffiths that the motion be amended to read. This council amends the resolution of rates and charges on page 173 at paragraph 12.6, uninhabitable residents, partial rebate of rates and charges as follows. After the words, 
$1,000 once off adds or up to 75% of the total rates payable, whichever, whichever is the higher. And at page 176, the definition of principal place of residence adds a new sentence after paragraph C as follows. Council may make an exception to the, to the definition under paragraphs A, B and C on the basis of hardship. Is there any debate? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, uh, a few weeks ago uh, I stood up in this place and wanted to change council policy and wasn't allowed to do so. Um, at that time the Lord Mayor pulled me aside and Councillor Cook stepped out with me and the Lord Mayor said to me, um, uh, we can do this already um, and uh, nothing happened. I wrote to him over a month ago, I've had no response to him about this. Um, I note in the budget last week he announced a $1,000 uh, payment for uninhabitable uh, houses which you know, clearly has been prompted by me pushing to do so here uh, in the council chamber. Is there any kind of acknowledgement perhaps that that's something that has been suggested that was a good idea by somebody other than himself? No. And I think that is a measure of the man that we are talking about, uh, that he cannot acknowledge that he was wrong when he gave me advice and Councillor Cook was standing there. Two, that he has failed to respond to my written request to him, which went before I raised it in the chamber before. And three, the measure he's brought forward in his own budget today fails to adequately address the extent of the hardship problem that flooded residents are facing. And I'm going to give a couple of examples about why I'm moving this um, amendment. Firstly, I have a resident in um, the back of Corinda. Uh, she purchased her house. She's a single mother who's uh, come out of a domestic violence situation. She's purchased her house with her two children and it was tenanted um, two weeks before the flood. Uh, the tenants couldn't move out. They had a lease and she didn't want to break the lease. She's in insecure housing at the moment. Uh, this council administration has refused to grant her the $1,000 uh, rebate. That's why I've added the uh, additional clause about an exception on the basis of hardship. Now, this is not a woman who has 10 investment properties. This is not a woman who has secure housing. This is a single mother who lost her job during COVID who's trying to provide a suitable roof over her head for her family. I do not know what is going to happen to her. I've had Major General Jake Elwood out to look at her house. Um, I know that she is considering buyback and this part of um, the back of Corinda is certainly somewhere that should be looked at for buyback. But, but this lady is desperately trying to put gyp rock up onto wet walls and to move back in because she does not have a suitable place for her and her children to live. And we've been told by this council in writing that she does not qualify for the $1,000 payment. Now, that would not cover her rates for a whole year. That would cover her rates for two months. Oh, sorry, for two quarters. For two quarters. Um, so the $1,000 is not enough. And it's people like this who are not wealthy, who are struggling, who are desperate, that need help. We need to have a hardship provision included in this so that those residents uh, can be supported. Secondly, I've added the words up to 75 per cent of the total rates payable. The, in the other part of my ward, because it is a very diverse ward, I have residents who have been impacted by major landslips and their house, houses, more than one, houses are uninhabitable. The houses have split in half, they have major cracks through them and I have been approached by those residents to ask for a weights waiver. Again, this council has said no. They have made a $250 payment and that is it. The residents, one of the residents in this um, uh, in this area that's experienced the landslip pays rates of over $4,000 a year. Now, the $1,000 that the Lord Mayor is proposing would only cover one quarter, not even a whole quarter, of their rates. That's not enough. We need to do more to support these residents whose lives have been turned upside down by the floods, and we need to make sure that there is provision in here that is reasonable 
and that reflects their circumstances. Um, that is why I've added the 75 per cent of total rates payable, because we must help these people. Um, it is, is just horrific that they will be— that I don't, these homes are going to have to be demolished. They're not going to be able to be saved. It will be months before Council finishes its geotechnical investigations. There is no hope for these people, even within 12 months of this policy. And I hope we're back here in 12 months' time um, renewing this, because it will not have resolved all of the financial hardship problems that we have. Now, if the Lord Mayor says to me, well, it's going to hurt our budget, no, it won't, because you haven't actually allocated money in your budget for most of the things that we're talking about here today. And if you're not sure about where the cuts can come from, I can help you with this. But we need to help those residents in Corinda that are struggling, that are absolutely in financial distress and without council's support could end up in really diabolical circumstances. And two, we need to support the residents in other suburbs in Brisbane who pay extraordinary rates. I mean, they pay some of the highest rates in this city, um, and this is probably not even the highest in my area, it's probably about halfway to the highest. Um, they pay extraordinary rates, and they have paid them without complaint year after year after year after year. It is time that this council recognises the complete destruction that has happened to their homes and supports them. So I encourage all residents today to support the amendments that I've put forward to increase um, the option of $1,000 or 75 per cent of total rates payable and includes a hardship provision um, so that we can make some exceptions where there are unusual circumstances like the resident in Corinda. Um, and we have to make sure that we take the residents of Brisbane with us when we recover because there are so much hardship going on out there. And I, I, I don't know that the chairs really understand the extent and the impact of flooding. I know Councillor Griffiths does, because he goes up and down streets with no one in them. He sees the houses that still haven't been properly cleaned out. I'm still seeing um, residents cleaning out their homes now. They've either been told they're insured or they're not insured, and they're trying desperately to manage the impact of the floods. Our council needs to do more to help them. These are two small measures that would help us do that, and I encourage all councillors to uh, support the amendment. Further debate? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. I rise to speak on the amendment, and I do see some merit in the proposal. I, um, I was surprised at the, when the uh, initial announcement came through that it was a sort of flat $1,000 once-off rebate, which doesn't have any regard to the value of the property that someone might be living in. Um, it seems like a bit of a one-size-fits-all and kind of a rough-around-the-edges approach. Um, obviously, different properties have different values and thus quite different rates, liabilities. And um, I did wonder how, how this might have differential impacts and, and benefits across the city as a whole. Um, I haven't had enough time to consider the motion in detail or um, consult deeply on whether this is an appropriate figure. Um, it's, again, as I said earlier, it's, it's a shame we don't have more time and more <laughs> access to detailed information so we can make better informed decisions about exactly what the financial impacts of uh, rate different um, levels of rate rebate or rate discount would, would be um, viable and how much of an impact that would have on the finances of the city. Uh, so I'll probably be abstaining for this one, from this one, but I, I think Councillor Johnston is on the right track to highlight that um, the level of support that Council has given to some uh, flood-affected home owners and residents is just nowhere near sufficient. The, um, and I, I think having, having some flexibility for, or some greater flexibility for general hardship um, discounts is probably a wise move as well. I realise that that can introduce a high level of discretion and uncertainty into these systems, and I advocate that with some caution, but I think there is a case to be made that, because there will always be odd cases and um, somewhat unique situations where people are experiencing severe hardship, but they won't be el eligible for the general one-size-fits-all um, rebates or, or, or discounts or what have you. Um, so. I thank Councillor Johnson for bringing forward the amendment, and I'm, yeah, just disappointed that we don't have more time and more discursive space to actually 
talk seriously about this sort of stuff. It seems like a lot of these decisions are made behind closed doors uh, without any inclusion of non-administration councillors. And I suspect even a lot of the backbench LNP councillors aren't really involved in discussions about how much the rebate should be or whether it should be a percentage or whether it should be a fixed fee. Or, um, yeah, it, it seems like the, uh, these very big decisions that affect hundreds of thousands of people across the city are being made by a very small number of people. And I think whenever that happens, there's a risk that that over-centralisation of decision-making power will overlook certain needs and leave um, certain people out inadvertently. And, and for that reason, I think it's a shame that we don't have more time to discuss these um, motions and amendments in, in greater detail and, and, like I said, with more information available to us. So thanks for provoking the discussion, Councillor Johnston. Hopefully in future years we'll be able to have more meaningful and deliberative conversations about this sort of stuff. Further debate? Lord Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Madam, uh, Mr Chair, and um, uh, thank you, Councillor Johnston, for uh, proposing this amendment. Look, um, there's a really simple reason why we won't support this amendment, because uh, it's one of equity. It's one of social equity. Uh, because Councillor Shree sort of touched on it, um, but I think he was coming from a different angle, but he raises a good point. Um, if you have a flat payment, you actually proportionally benefit um, properties that are lower in value to a higher degree. And so what this amendment does is gives a much be a bigger um, chunk of support to the wealthier properties, to the properties with a higher average rateable value. Whereas we believe that there's, there's some social equity in making sure that uh, we give a flat fee, it's very simple, but by giving a flat fee, it's those properties with a lower ARV that benefit the most. And that's a fairness issue in my view. Um, so I can understand why Councillor Johnston is putting this up, but I don't support the premise of it because we uh, deliberately point brought order, in a Chair. flat fee for a uh, fairness reason. Lord Mayor, reason. just one moment, please. Councillor Shree, point of order. Will the Mayor take a quick question? Lord Mayor? No. no. Sorry, Councillor Shree. Lord Mayor. And so let me give you uh, an example. Um, for an owner-occupied residential property on the minimum general rate of $818, this $1,000 payment will mean that the property owners do not pay rates for over 12 months. That's over 12 months of support for someone on the minimum with a lower ARV, uh, whereas um, for owner-occupier residents based on higher rates um, obviously, for example, those that might have a uh, general rate of $1,319, uh, $1, which is the average general rate, um, this would provide around nine months of support um, or $989.53. But the $1,000 payment has been selected for a very specific reason, and it is, is that one that I mentioned. Um, and so we have actually thought this through. But I also did want to point out that this is far from the only support that is available. And um, what can already happen and what already has been happening is that the council rate department is empowered to talk to individual property owners about specific circumstances and how they can be uh, assisted. And so what already happens right now is if someone's property is uninhabitable, we can immediately switch off some of the charges that apply to that property. Now, as you know, there's the general rate that is paid, but then there's other charges that are paid as well. And so, for example, there's a waste collection charge for collecting the rubbish. We immediately switch that off. And if that charge is switched off for a year, that's a $450 saving in itself. And so $250 rate rebate, which was provided this financial year, you can potentially get up to $450 for a year of the waste charge being switched off, and then they can also get another $1,000 through the rebate that we're proposing now. There are also some circumstances where um, if a property is uninhabitable to the point where it would be demolished, as Councillor Johnson has said, we can redesignate the rating category on that property to vacant land, and the rating comes down significantly. So there's various things that we can do on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, but we've also put in this um, uh, policy for the $1,000 rebate, and we've done it deliberately out of fairness, 
because it, it proportionally benefits the properties with the lower ARV more than it does with a higher ARV. And so, yes, Councillor Johnston may disagree with that logic, but that is the logic that we used and that is why we propose. Point of order, Chair. Uh, Lord, just for a moment. Um, Councillor Shreve. I find this quite persuasive from the Mayor. I wonder if we would just take a quick question. Just to, Lord uh, Mayor. Just to clarify something. Lord Mayor, will you okay. take a question? Okay, I'll take the question. <laughs> Councillor Shree? Well, well, I just did wonder what you would have had to say to, because Councillor Johnson gave that example of uh, a fairly low income person who owns a property that's currently rented out who's not eligible for the um, existing $1,000 rebate. How, how would you address those sorts of situations and what mechanisms are available in, in that kind of context where they're not currently the owner occupier, but it's the only property they own and they were about to move into it, for example? Yep. Well, certainly, um, you look, I, I, I'm not aware of that specific circumstance, and that, and that is something that I'd have to investigate. Um, but as I said, we, we do empower our rates department to have a look at each individual circumstance and, and come up with arrangements that, that can involve multiple different things that we can do to help. Uh, and that is the clear instruction that I gave right from day one, um, when you know, it was quite clear about the, the extent of the impact. Um, we pressed the button straight away and saying that everything that we did in 2011 to support the community, we want to do at least that, but we also want to be even more generous than that. And so, for example, in 2011, the rebate for flood affected properties was $100 back then. This time it's $250. Uh, all of the things that we did in 2011 that we learned from experience, such as uninhabitable properties, we're doing again this time. And we're trying to be even more generous with people because we understand the devastating impacts. But there has been a specific reason why we chose the thousand. Um, like I said, I, I expect that Councillor Johnson won't agree with that, but that is the reason that we have done that, and that is why we'll, we won't be supporting the amendment. Um, any further speakers? No, Councillor Johnson. Yes, uh, thank you very much. At least the Lord Mayor stood up and uh, spoke to the motion today, which is a, a fair advance on uh, the rest of the budget debate. And thank you, Councillor Shree, for participating as well. Um, it is, however, incredibly disappointing that uh, the LNP are just going to vote against um, this because the situation that many residents in my area and I know other parts of this city have found themselves in is incredibly difficult. Um, and they literally aren't sure what to do. I'm speaking to these people on a daily basis, as is, I know, Councillor Griffith and, and I'm sure many other councillors. Um, their insurance may not cover them. There's no money from the state. Uh, they don't have any money necessarily themselves to do their rebuild. And meanwhile, the bills are still coming in. And one of the biggest bills they face is the council rates bill. And the Lord Mayor um, very helpfully told us that the average rates bill is about $1,300 uh, a year. And, and, and certainly in Corinda, um, where there is a, what I would describe as a hardship case, that's, that's really what we need to do here, um, her bill is more than that. Um, it's not a fancy house, I can tell you that. It, 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 it's not. It's, it's three bedroom, brick veneer, uh, right near Oxley Creek. Uh, and um, you know, I've, I've got the letter here from the rates team. All they're going to do is monitor her account in case she can make some payments, and they'll contact her in August, no doubt, to start to demand payment. I don't know that she'll be in any position to pay her rates. Um, so the problem we've got here is council has not built the flexibility into this system to help the people who need it the most, um, and that is residents in Corinda. Um, the, the situation in the other example that I gave is, is slightly different, and I did, I did think seriously about whether or not um, you know, uh, people who are more financially capable um, you know, should be able to uh, manage this themselves. But I can tell you now, if you've spent your life savings buying a property that's worth $2 million in my ward um, and it is now uninhabitable, it is devastating. It is devastating. And for this council to say, well, here's $250 when you're paying $4,200 a year in rates, um, or here's $1,000, that'll pay for one quarter. Um, and it is, is just not enough. And I 
I, we're referring people to the rates department. We're doing all of these things, but the announcements in the budget today to help people have not gone far enough. And I don't think it is unreasonable. Am I the only one here? I'm an ex-liberal, but I'm still a liberal underneath. Am I the only one here that thinks that people who pay the highest rates shouldn't get some sort of relief when it's in absolute desperate times? Um, and I think they should. And I think that this Lord Mayor needs to reconsider. He's got a couple more minutes while I'm speaking. Um, that this. Uh, there needs to be a hardship exception. Even if he decides to, or someone stands up and decides to amend this, um, there has to be a hardship provision in here so we can help those people who, through no fault of their own, simply for a matter of a couple of weeks, um, now find their homes destroyed, their financial security is gone, um, and they're going to be living um, in insecure housing for I don't know how long. <laughs> Uh, and it is just not acceptable that our council um, won't help them. It won't help them. Um, we already have a homelessness crisis uh, in this city, and it's been exacerbated by what's happened during the floods. People have had nowhere to go. They're, it, they're staying with their friends, their family. Um, they've taken housing so far away from where they live in their community. Um, it, and there are people living in their cars. There are absolutely people living in their cars. The lady, at, um, you know, Corinda, uh, that I met during the floods, who's living in her car. This is a different lady to this one, but the, you know, even in areas where you think this is a this is a reasonably well-to-do place, there are people experiencing extreme hardship. And if Krista Adams and the Lord Mayor can go off on junkets to the Olympics, uh, go to Greece. Uh, if they can go and do these things, then they can find a little bit more money in this budget to help people who are in absolute financial distress. Council needs a hardship clause to be built into this um, needs a hardship clause to be built into this provision uh, so that it can have some care and compassion for those people who have been impacted. Uh, beyond what we might expect uh, in a blanket type arrangement like the Lord Mayor has, uh, has put down. Uh, your time has expired. I will now put the amendment. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The noes have it. Division. Division. A division has been called by Councillor Johnston and Councillor, uh, and Councillor Cassidy. Councillors, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Clerks, please ring the bells. Thank you. Orderly, please lock the bars. Clark, please read the results. Mr Chair, the noes have it. The voting being five in favour and 18 against. The motion is lost. We will now return to the debate, the substantive debate. Uh, are there any further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, I rise to speak on the budget. And I, I guess for anyone who's watching at home or, or reading this transcript later on, it's probably quite apparent by this point that this whole so-called debate is really just political theatre. There's no substantive decisions being made on the floor of this chamber. And, um, it's probably not probably not inaccurate. Yeah, certainly, Councillor Johnson, you're trying, um, and and some of us are trying to have uh, rational, evidence-based discussions. But 
Um, I don't think it would be stretching things to describe this whole process as a farce. The decisions have already been made behind closed doors, and we've spent the last two days rubber stamping something when the administration had no real, real in, in, intention of changing any of it. Um, and I think I heard Councillor Murphy just validate that. <laughs> He's right. He understands it. This, um, the, the decisions aren't being made here on the floor of this chamber. Um, they've already been made, and they've been made in a manner which I don't think is democratic. And I was struck by the mayor's commentary that sort of uh, alluding to or call into this idea of oh, the noble tradition of democracy where um, we put things to a vote after um, a prolonged de deliberation and discussion. Um, I don't really feel like that's what's happened here. I feel like over the cu last couple of days I've seen people take turns making speeches without really listening to each other and certainly without any genuine intention or openness to shifting their position. And I think that's unfortunate because uh, I think if we were to all work together a bit more constructively, we'd probably get better outcomes for the city. And it's a shame that the current political landscape doesn't facilitate that. Um, I've pro probably got a, a lot of the same critiques of this budget that I have most years, and I'll, I'll try not to dwell on, on them for too long. But the fundamental problem I continually identify with this council is that we're spending a heck of a lot of money on road infrastructure, primarily to carry higher volumes of car traffic. and not enough money on the many other areas of the budget that really deserve more funding. And I did take Councillor Murphy's point earlier that certainly there are some road infrastructure projects that also deliver uh, an active transport benefit or improvements to public transport accessibility, and I'm not dogmatic about that stuff. But when you look at the projects as a whole, there certainly is a disproportionate amount of money being spent in this budget on um, infrastructure projects that could I think fairly be described as primarily being about road widening or intersection expansions to carry more cars, even if they do have some incidental benefits on the side for other modes of transport. Um, similarly, I think this budget overlooks some really good opportunities to reduce council costs in terms of waste management and to improve sustainability and sustainable management of waste at the same time. There are big gaps and, and failings on that front. Um, and, and as a general principle, the, the failure to, to spend the money we need to spend now in order to save us money later, I think, stands out as quite short-sighted. That's a, a general problem across the budget and the various programs, but particularly in terms of how we plan for parks and, and some of those sustainability initiatives, uh, but also in terms of our community facilities planning. And I'm quite disappointed uh, to see that, again, there's no money in the budget for the West End Library expansion, even though that's sitting there in the LGIP and the council has committed to doing, doing that at some point. Uh, for my ward, I'm, I'm very disappointed that there's no money for some of the new public transport facilities I've been advocating for for many years, such as a new ferry terminal for the western side of West End, um, such as safe pedestrian crossings and new bike lane projects, and of course, the West End to Wong Bridge. I, I take the administration's point that the recent floods have caused a, a big hit to um, the council and that there's, there, there are repairs that have to be p made and paid for. But that doesn't change the fact that it, we, we need to be investing in the future as well. And if we spend the next two years simply repairing damaged infrastructure and then there's another flood and then we spend another two or three years repairing more damaged infrastructure, we're never going to catch up on the significant infrastructure backlog that this city is already facing. Which brings me to the, uh, the deeper problem I highlighted earlier, which is just that this City Council, um, there's a lot more stuff that this City Council needs to be paying for than, than there is revenue coming in. And I think the LNP understand that to some extent. They perhaps aren't talking openly enough about it. And I think even the Labor Opposition Councils recognise it. There's a, a real shortfall in terms of revenue coming into this Council. And I don't see either of the major parties offering any serious suggestions on how we correct that. Certainly, I think there are some savings that can be made in terms of how projects and um, particularly larger infrastructure projects are managed. I see a lot of uh, waste in, in the fact that often the political decision about whether to proceed with an actual project and allocate funding to it isn't made until after a lot of money has already been expended on complex concept designs and detailed designs and business cases, etc. So we spend if you add it up across the budget, we're spending millions and millions of dollars a year designing stuff 
and then once we get to a certain point in the design stage, then a political decision is made, oh, we don't want to proceed with this project because it'll take away too many car parks, or we don't want to proceed with this project because actually we don't have enough money after all. Um, I obviously appreciate that we have to do some design work to work out how much stuff is actually going to cost, and I'm not critical of that. But I am critical of the fact that often the council is making decisions to cancel projects or not proceed with projects that could have been made much earlier in the process if the council had done a better job of enabling proper consultation and participatory decision making. Um, another example of that that stands out, which we'll, we'll no doubt deal with over the coming years, is the dogmatic insistence on, on wanting to demolish the East Brisbane Bowls Club building and, and waste a lot of money knocking down a perfectly structurally sound building. I know at some point the council is going to back away from that. Um, it, stands, it seems obvious to me that, uh, that, that they won't be able to proceed with this, that project and it won't make sense for them to proceed with that project. But in the meantime, they're wasting all this money asking public servants to design it and um, proceed with different elements of that, that Mowbray Park vision when there's actually a lot of community opposition to the vision as a whole. So, I mean, that just stands out as one particular example to me, but this happens across the city and across the budget programs. In terms of other, apart from cutting some of that waste, which I think is ultimately a, a function of overly centralised, undemocratic decision making, I think there's also uh, an opportunity to gen generate a little bit more revenue for the council through uh, a more aggressive rating system that targets the big end of town more directly. Um, I don't know if we'd necessarily call Airbnb investors the big end of town, but um, it was good to see the administration int introduce that new ratings category for trans transitory accommodation, and I applaud the mayor and the administration for that, but I'm equally very, very critical of how piss weak and small the increase is. Um, uh, an increase of only 50%, uh, that, that's nothing. And I think the mayor knows it's nothing. I don't know why you would, it, even for the LNP, it's weird that you would burn all the political capital and incur the pushback from the property industry and from the REIQ, et cetera, et cetera, um, just, just to charge Airbnb investors a few extra hundred bucks a year, which I think we can, most of us could see is not likely to shift decision making and, and behaviour among those investors in a big way. It would be far better to have a much larger rates increase, and I said to journalists that an increase of 500 per cent on those, that class of property would be much more appropriate. And then, if investors are faced with paying thousands of dollars extra in rates per year, then they might make the decision to switch that Airbnb property back into a, a normal residential rental home. Um, and I think, similarly, there's a lot of untapped revenue potential in terms of higher rates for unoccupied land uh, and or land that's been left vacant long term for no good reason and homes and shops that have been left vacant long term for no good reason. There's also, I think, gr significant opportunities to increase rates on some classes of larger retail warehouses. And for example, I, I've looking through some of the numbers, I'm shocked at how low the rates bill is, for example, for a major Bunnings store or, or a major IKEA or what ha have you. These large businesses generate a huge volume of vehicle traffic, and both in terms of customer cars, but also really large delivery trucks. That has a really significant uh, maintenance burden on our road network. So council is effectively subsidising these large businesses by repairing the roads that their trucks are continually churning up. And they're not actually paying very much in rates for the size of the land that they're taking up and for the the volume of commerce that they're, they're doing. They're, they've got a lot of turnover, they're making a lot of money from people, but they're not uh, paying their fair share back into the city. And obviously the same goes for developers in general, and the Mayor is right to be critical of the ongoing the infrastructure charge caps, but the Council could also be increasing some of the other fees that it charges to developers uh, in terms of the assessment processes and enforcement processes to at least squeeze a little bit more money out of the property industry, which quite frankly is making a killing but isn't contributing their fair share towards the cost of infrastructure and services. So I, I think a lot of missed opportunities in this budget, and, and I hope in future years we can do a little bit better. Further debate? No further debate? Lord Mayor, do you wish to close the debate? I will now put the motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it.
councillors, as that concludes the presentation and consideration of the 20. My apology. <laughs> Eyes have it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I missed the most important bit. Um, in closing, councillors, can I also take this opportunity to thank the clerks for saving me like they just did now? They've done a tremendous job. And to Billy and the whole team for looking after us so well as they always do. Now, councillors, as that concludes the presentation and consideration of the 2022-23 annual plan and budget, I declare the meeting closed. <laughs>